Have you ever wondered who powers the tech world with those cool apps, websites and automation tools? They are Python developers. A Python developer is someone who uses the Python programming language to build software applications, websites and scripts. They are the creative minds behind the scenes using Python versatile language to bring ideas to life. Skilled in Python's core concepts, they often work across different platforms, industries, web development, data science and automation, collaborating with teams to create efficient and effective solutions for various projects. On that note, hello everyone and welcome to this video on Python Developer Full Course by Edureka. Before we get started, let's take a moment to outline the agenda for today's session. Let's begin by covering the fundamentals of Python including operators, set and dictionaries. Well, we'll then explore the loops, functions and arrays and enhance our programming skills. Moving on, we'll dive into the advanced Python topics such as exception handling, regular expression for efficient error management and text manipulation. Following this, we'll discuss databases. Additionally, we'll explore essential Python modules like NumPy, Panda and Matplotlib which expand the capabilities of Python program. In the later stages, we'll learn how to create the games in Python and provide a complete Python programming roadmap for comprehensive understanding. To conclude the course, we'll address frequently asked Python interview questions to assist you with your journey on becoming a proficient Python developer. But before we begin, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to stay updated on the latest tech content from Edureka. Also visit the Edureka website for the Python Developers Master Program, the link to which is given in the description box below. Python has been ranked the number one programming language in TOB Index and has been used by some of the largest companies in the tech industry like Pinterest, Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, etc. So you looking to learn Python might just be the best decision you've ever made. What is Python? Python is an easy to learn, powerful programming language. It has efficient high level data structures and a simple but effective approach to object oriented programming. Python's elegant syntax and dynamic typing together with its interpreted nature make it an ideal language for scripting and rapid application development in many areas on most platforms. And with that, we can see why we use Python, right? The number one point would be the applications. Python is a very versatile programming language, ranging from application development to web design, game design, UI UX development, data science, machine learning, automation, etc. There's also the point of simplified syntax. If you usually work with languages like Java, C++, etc., you'll get me. Python is one of the simplest languages you can learn. And this fact doesn't impact any of the features. It is just as good as all the other options that you have. And the only thing is, it's a lot simpler. The third point is well-built packages. Now don't worry if you don't know what packages are. I'll cover that later. The only thing that you need to know right now is that Packages have the ability to replace hundreds of lines of code with just a single line of code. I'll show you how to do that later in this video. And the fourth point that I want to stress on is the highly supportive community. Look, I get it. Programming is not always easy and you get stuck sometimes. But with Python's community, you get a lot of support for the issues that you face and I'm telling you, it's one of the most engaging and interactive communities that I've ever come across. Now, I think it's about time that we get started. I do want you to know that this video will be a hands-on session and I want you to keep your computer ready and follow along with this tutorial. To get started with Python, you will need two things. The first thing is Python itself, which is an application that you install in your computer so that your computer knows how to interact and understand Python. The second thing you will need is a code editor or an IDE. There are a lot of code editors that you can come across, like Vim, VS Code, Sublime Text, Eclipse, Spider, PyCharm, etc. In this video, we will be working with the Anaconda distribution. Now, I have chosen this because it's the easiest one with which you can set up your Python ecosystem. To install Anaconda distribution, all you need to do is open up your browser and then type download Anaconda. Now once you are here, just follow the first link. 
If you are not able to find this link, then just follow the URL given above anaconda.com slash products slash distribution. The installation procedure doesn't really change for any operating system. You can follow the same procedure for Windows, Mac, Linux, etc. So once you're here, just click download and save. Now once downloaded, just click on the file and open it up. Now once you're here, just follow the steps given by the application itself. You don't really need to do any other settings. Just follow what's given in the application. I recommend that you install Anaconda to the path provided by the software itself because this makes it easier for the files to interact with each other. You can just follow along the steps and just make sure that this checkbox is always checked. Register Anaconda 3 as my default Python 3.9. What this does is that when you install any other code editors or IDEs, they will be able to recognize the Python that is installed by Anaconda in your system. After all this, you just need to click install and then it will start installing Anaconda to your system. Now the installation might take some time, but once this is done, just finish this up and then open up the start menu and type Anaconda Navigator. Once you have it, open it up and there you have it. Anaconda Navigator for Windows. Over here, you can see the collection of IDEs and code editors that you get with Anaconda Navigator. You also have your environments where you can manage your packages, your educational videos, and also a community to support your growth. In this video, we will be using Jupyter Notebook. And to use that, all you need to do is click Launch over here. Now you can think of this view as a file directory where you can create files, navigate through files and even delete files. So right now what I'm doing is going to the desktop folder and then I'm clicking on new and Python 3. So what this does is that it creates a new file in my desktop folder to run my Python code. After that, I just want you to do a simple program. It's just one line, all right? Simply type print all in small letters and then open brackets, round brackets and then single or double quotes and then type some message. I'm typing hello world and then we can run it by clicking on this button over here or we can do shift plus enter and it will show you your message. If you've gotten till here, then congratulations because you just created your first Python project. In this section, we will see what variables and data types are in Python. Variables are nothing but values that are temporarily stored in your computer's memory. Let me show you how to do this. To begin with a variable, you first type the variable's name, like for example, say age. And then what you do is, you assign it a value, like 40. So in this statement, what you're doing is you are assigning the value 40 to a variable name called age. Now, if you run this again with the run button or shift plus enter, then you can see in the left hand side that this statement has been executed. And now if you want to access the value of age anywhere in your code in the future, you can just type age and it will give you the result. Now, while you have declared a value for your variable, you should also remember that this value can be updated in the future. For example, say now I say age equal to 50 and I execute the statement. Then if I come back to our second statement, just age, you can see that the execution gives me the result 50. This means that age has been updated. So it's a good idea to always keep track of all the updated variables in your code. Let us continue by declaring a few more variables. Let's say temperature equal to 35.8. In Python, you can declare floating point variables, which is nothing but numbers with a decimal point and also whole numbers. You can also type something like name equal to Edureka. And you can see over here that I have surrounded it with quotes. The reason why I do this is because whenever you write string values or sequence of characters, Python requires you to surround it with quotes, either double or single. This will help Python recognize the entire sequence of characters as a single entity. You also have some other kinds of data types 
like boolean values. Now boolean values are nothing but, for example, you can say is offline equal to false. Now one thing that you should know is that Python is case sensitive. Notice what happens if I replace the capital F with a small. See, it is not being highlighted anymore. This is because Python doesn't recognize this as a keyword anymore. It thinks of this as a name. So always remember to be aware of the case sensitive keywords while coding in Python. You might also notice that I have used an underscore while declaring the keyword. This is just to make the code more readable. Notice what happens if I take off this underscore. It's not that readable, right? So whenever you code in Python, always make sure that you enhance readability for anyone else who might access your code. Now, there are three types of values in Python. You have numbers, you have strings, and you have boolean. Now, there are times where you will need to convert one type of data to another. Let me show you how. So you can see from our previous declarations, we have age equal to 50, which is a whole number. We have temp equal to 35.8, which is a decimal point number. You have a string, which is a collection of characters. And then you have a Boolean value over here. If you want to check the data type of all these variables, what you will need to do is say type, open brackets, and then type the variable name. If you execute this statement, then you will see that age is an integer data type. You can do the same for temp, and you can see that it returns float, which is a floating point variable. This just means that there is a decimal point in that number. You can also type name, which returns string. Now, string is represented as str or str in Python. And then you have your final variable, which is, is offline, which is a Boolean data type. Let's just get this out of the way now and try a few things. What if I want to convert age into a floating point variable? Doing this is very simple. What you need to do is type the name of the data type you want to convert it into, and then you open brackets, and then you type the variable name. So now you have converted age into a floating point value. You can see the decimal point over here. This concept is helpful in many situations. For example, if I want to say print age of XYZ is plus age and execute the statement, you will see a type error can only concatenate str, not int to str. What this means is the data type string can be only concatenated or connected to another string. Python doesn't understand how to connect numbers with strings. Solving this is super easy. All you need to do is go over here and then say str of age. This will convert age into string and will allow Python to connect these two strings. Now, if we execute this statement, you can see that it is successfully executed. Now with this, I have an exercise for you. I want you to collect the birth year of a particular individual and using that information, I want you to find out his age. You can pause the video over here, take a few minutes and then come back and see what the solution is. Now you must have gotten stuck while receiving input, right? Doing this is super easy in Python. What you need to do is type input and then open brackets. And inside those brackets, you can give any message to your user. For example, enter your birth year. Now, obviously you will need to store this in a variable, right? So let's just save it under birth year. Now, if we run the statement, Python will ask you to enter the input for your birth year variable. Now, I was born in 1998, so let me just type that, and then I'll press enter. After this, we will need to subtract the current year with the birth year, right? Now, the current year is 2023 minus the birth year. Now, let's just execute this, and oops, we've got a type error. Unsupported operand types for int and str. Now, let's try to break down this error. Let's check the data type of birth year. Type birth year. You can see over here that birth year has been declared as a string, right? That's what's causing the problem. You're trying to subtract 
integer with strings. Now we can currently understand that birth year is a number, but Python isn't able to do that. So what you need to do is tell Python that this is an integer. And then if you execute this and type in the same values again, you will be able to get your answer. Now let's try to make this a bit more readable. First thing we need to do is assign this to a variable. So let's just say age equal to this expression and we'll execute this again. And after that, we can say print age of XYZ plus H. Now if we execute this statement, we again get an error. This is again a type error and can concatenate strings with strings, not int with strings, right? So again, we will need to convert this into a string data type so Python is able to correctly read the data. So let's execute this and then you can see age of XYZ is 25. In this tutorial, I will teach you how to do some cool operations using strings in Python. To do this, the first thing we will need to do is declare a string variable called title equal to Python for beginners. Now, after executing the statement, I want you to remember a few things. The first thing is that when you declare a string in Python, it is treated as an object. You can think of objects like real world objects. Think of a car. A car is an object and this object has a few functionalities to it, right? It can go forward, it can go backward, it can go sideways, it can honk, it can turn on the lights, etc. Strings are also the same. If you type title dot and press your tab button, you can see a list of functions. These functions are similar to like print, input, etc. The only difference is that print, input, etc. are general purpose functions meaning that they don't belong to a particular object. And these functions belong to the object called string. Now, calling them functions isn't really the right terminology. When a function belongs to a particular object, you refer to them as methods. So all these methods that are listed over here belong to the object string. Now let us just pick an option called is lower over here. And if you execute this, you can see that it returns false. This means that our string is not completely in the lower case. So you have another method to do that. You can type title dot lower. And if you execute this now, you can see that all the characters, all the individual characters have been converted to the smaller case letters. Now, if you type dot is lower continuing this, then you can see that it returns true. You also have other methods like title dot upper, which returns all of the characters in uppercase letters. You also have other interesting methods for strings in Python, like title dot find, which will help you find a particular character or a sequence of characters in your string. Like say, if I say y, in quotes, then it will return the value 1. You see, 1 over here is the index of the first occurrence of this character. Now, the way indexing works in Python is simple. You start from 0 and then you continue with the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, etc. So when I say find the first occurrence of y, what it means is that the index that is returned is number 1. Now, you can also find the index for a sequence of characters like say for and you can see that it has returned 7 over here. If you go back over here, you can see the f character starts at 7 and that is where the sequence of characters start from. There's also some other interesting methods that you can use over here. For example, you can try replace to replace one word for another like say for example for with 4 and then you can see that the string has changed right now. Python for beginners. You should remember that these statements don't really make any changes to your original string. So if you go ahead and type title again, then the result of it 
would be your original string. If you want to save your modifications, then you will need to save your edits into a new variable. Now for the find expression that we talked about earlier, there is another replacement for it. For example, you can type print for in title. And this will show you the boolean value of your result. Like this sequence of characters does not exist in your variable. But if I change this to the small case, and now if I change it into something that is in the variable, then obviously it will return true. This kind of result is desirable in a lot of cases. Now, in this tutorial, we will be seeing the arithmetic operators in Python. Now, these are the same arithmetic operators that you find in math. For example, you can add numbers, subtract them, multiply them, and so on. So, let's just quickly do 10 plus 3, and you can see that the result is 13. This operator over here is called the addition operator, which adds two numbers. You also have the subtraction, which subtracts 3 from 10. You have the multiply, which is an asterisk, which multiplies 10 by 3, 30. And then you have the division. And technically, there's two types of division. One is a single slash, and the other one is a double slash. Notice what happens. When we did the single slash, we got a floating point value, right? But if you try a double slash, it will give you a whole number. After that, we have the modulus operator, which gives you the remainder of 10 divided by 3, which is 1. So we also have the option to make powers of something. For example, if you want to say 10 to the power 3, then you can put in two asterisks, and then if you execute it, you will get the result of 10 to the power 3. Now, for all these operators that you saw, we also have something called as augmented assignment. Let me show you what that means. So up until now, if you had to do something with arithmetic operators, you would have done something like this, right? x equal to 10, x equal to x plus 3, and then you would type print x. Now, there's nothing wrong with you executing your code like this, but you are taking a bit more memory when you do it like this. Because in this statement over here, you are loading x two times, right? So a simpler way to do this would be to say x equal to plus equal to 3. Now, this new statement is exactly the same as the old statement. Only difference is, it's a lot simpler to write and it's faster. All right, now let me ask you a question. Suppose I set x equal to 10 plus pi into 2. What is the answer? Unfortunately, a lot of people get this wrong. The answer to this is 20. The reason for this is because mathematics has something called as operator precedence, where operators like multiplication and division has a higher priority than addition or subtraction. So when you evaluate this statement, you will first evaluate 5 into 2, which is 10, and then you will say 10 plus 10, which is 20. Let's execute to verify this. Now, operator precedence in Python also works the same way as it does in math. The only thing is that you can change this using brackets. So for example, if you want to execute 10 plus 5 first, you can just put this in brackets, and then 10 plus 5 will be executed first, after which it will be multiplied by 2. So let's just verify this again, and you can see that it has been done. Now, you've already learned what arithmetic operators are in Python. Up next, we have another set of operators called as comparison operators. Let us see what it does. Suppose I write 3 greater than 2. If I execute this, it will produce a Boolean result, which means it will tell you whether 3 is greater than 2 or not. This operator that we have over here is called the greater than operator, and this belongs to a set of operators called as comparison operators. You also have 
greater than or equal to you have less than or equal to you have equals now don't compare this with the assignment operator all right this thing is checking for equality it is checking if 3 is equal to 2 or not so if i execute this it will tell you it is false now one more operator that we have over here is the not equal to this will check if something is not equal to something now 3 is not equal to 2 and that is why this will return the boolean value true so to summarize we have the greater than we have greater than or equal to we have less than we have less than or equal to we have quality and not equal these operators combined make up the comparison operators Now that we are done with comparison operators, we have another set of operators called as logical operators. Now to demonstrate this, let me first declare a variable, age equal to 25. Now let's apply some logical operators to it. We'll first say age greater than 10 and age less than 30. Make note that the AND word over here is the logical operator. So now we have age 25 must be greater than 10 and age must be less than 30. So if you execute this, you will get this as true. The thing with AND operator is that both the left side of the operator and the right side of the operator must be satisfied. Another thing we have is the OR operator. Now for this operator, either the left side of the operator or the right side of the operator or the entire equation must be true. Let us demonstrate this. We can have age equal to 5 and then if we say this and then if we come to the equation you have age greater than 10 which is false or you have age less than 30. Now age is definitely less than 30 right so this equation must be true. There we go. The last thing is the NOT operator. Let's just put it like this. If you use the NOT operator it will give you the inverse of the result that you were going to get. So let's just say this age equal to 5 and age is greater than 10. So this is false, right? But if you use the not operator over here, the result will still be true. Now you can obviously inverse this and test the result again. So to summarize this, you first have the AND operator where both sides must be true. Then you have the OR operator where at least one side must be true and then you have the NOT operator which will give you the inverse of your result. Now let's look at if statements. We use if statements whenever we want to make a decision in our program. For example, if we have something like say temperature Based on the value of that temperature, we can make certain actions. Let me show you. Let us first declare a variable called temperature equal to say 40. Now, based on this value, I can take certain actions. For this, I will start with writing if, which is a keyword, and then you write temperature greater than 30, and then a colon, and then you type enter. If you see over here, if you observe what you have done, you have first written an if statement and then used a conditional statement to check if the temperature is above 30. Now, a colon in Python is used to segment a block of code. If you see our text cursor over here, you can see that there are a few spaces behind it, right? This is what we call an indentation. In Python, if you indent a particular piece of code, it will belong to the previous statement. This is similar to using curly brackets in languages like C, Java, etc. So be very careful as to not put unnecessary indents in your code. Now, for our condition, let us say if temperature is greater than 30, we'll print, say, it's a hot day. You can see that I have written this string in double quotes. This is because I have a single quote in the word it's. 
So if I put single quotes over here also, then Python will think that you are just making a mistake while writing. So double quotes over here and let's continue. As I told you before, since you put a colon over here, everything below that colon is treated as a block of code. So as long as this indent remains, this block of code will be executed only if this condition is true. Let's add another statement over here. Let's say print, it's time for cola. After this, we can come out and if we execute this statement, you can see that it's hot day and it's time for cola. Now, know that you can add as many conditions as you want to. Now, what if this value was less than 30? Let's say 29. What would happen then? Nothing happened, right? This is because the condition was proved false and that is why these statements didn't get executed. Remember that you can add as many conditions as you want and all you have to do to do that is type elif and then you can come up with another statement. Say if temperature is less than 30, then print it's nice day. You can also go ahead and write if temperature is less than 10, then print that it's a cold day. You can also add a statement saying print done over here. You should remember that this statement doesn't belong to any condition. So it will be executed no matter what happens. So if you execute it now, you can say it's a nice day and done. Great, right? Now let me ask you a question. What if I asked you to print the numbers 1 to 5? How would you go about by doing that? Obviously, you'd say print 1 and then print 2, print 3, print 4 and then print 5. But I'm telling you that this approach is wrong. The reason is because I asked you to just print from 1 to 5. But what if I asked you to print from 1 to 100 or 1 to 1000? million, billion perhaps, would you go about the same way writing it down individually? Obviously not, right? That's a very time consuming task. So to handle that, we have something called as loops. And the first kind of loop that I want to talk about is the while loop. Let me show you how you can start using it. The first thing that you do is start with a variable and assign it the initial value of the sequence that you have. For example, I have given i equal to 1. After that, I will type the while keyword and then I have my conditional statement. While i is less than or equal to 5 and then colon after which I get a block. Over here the first thing is I have to print the number, right? So print i and then we will need to start increasing the value of i by 1. So let's say i plus equal to 1. This will start incrementing the value of i by 1 every iteration. If you don't put the statement, then it will print the initial number until your computer runs out of memory. So now let's just run this and you can see that your output has been printed over here. Now, you can also change this into say 1 to 100 or even 1000. Remember that if you want to increase readability of your numbers, you can always separate it by an underscore. So this is like 1 comma 0 0 0. So now we have the output 1 to 1000. You can also print interesting patterns using this. Let me show you. If you type the same thing and then say I multiplied by a string. You can give it any value that you want. And then if you execute this, you can get patterns. You can see that you've got a triangle over here. What this is, is a string operation. Basically, you can multiply strings in Python. So if you say i equal to string and then i has the value 1, then this will be printed once. And if i equal to 2, it will be printed twice. i equal to 3, then it will be printed thrice and so on.
Earlier in the video, I introduced you to the date types in Python. This included numbers like integers, floating point variables, strings, and boolean. Now these data types are something that we call as basic data types in Python. There are also some complex data types, and one of them is called lists. A list is nothing but a group of objects. Let me show you how you can do this. First, you will start with the variable name. Let's just say we are doing a collection of names. So our variable name is names, and then equal to, and then we have square brackets. These square brackets represent a list. And now inside this list, you can write down a bunch of names. So let's say Elton, and then you have Sam, Bob, and Emma. You can use either single quotes or double quotes. It doesn't really matter. Now, if you execute the statement and then you call out the variable, you can get a list of all those objects. The interesting thing happens from now. While you call out the variable, you can also call out individual variables. Like say you want the name of the second index. So you have 0, 1, and 2, right? So second index, and you can get Bob directly. You can also give a negative value. Now, what do you think happens if I give a negative one? So this is zero, and then a negative value would be the last element of your list. So if you execute this, you must get Emma. And if you do a negative two, then it will be the second last element. Now, this is not it. You can also go ahead and get a range of values, say from zero to what this means is that you will start from zero and you will print all the elements until you reach two. Remember that if you execute this, the last value, like the ending parameter, won't be printed. So for example, over here, I have zero, one, and this two won't be printed. See, there you go. Now this is what we mean by list operations. You should also remember that a list doesn't really need to be just a single data type. You can also include numbers like integers, floating point variables, and even boolean. And if you execute that, you will still get the same result. Early in this video, I told you how to use string methods, right? This was because strings was an object and objects have methods. Well, the thing is, list is also an object and list also has many methods associated with it. The functionalities of this include adding an element, removing an element, or modifying an element, etc. Let us see how to do this. Let me first um, declare a list of numbers. Say numbers equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. Now we have a list called numbers. Let's see what methods this numbers list has. So we'll type numbers dot and tab, and you can see over here, append, clear, copy, count, extend, index, etc. So let us start with say append. Now, append is a method that is used to add numbers to the end of the list. So if I say append 6, then my list would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Now, if you type down numbers again, and check its values, you can see that you have six at the end. See, there you go. We also have another method called as insert. Now, the problem with append is that you can only add numbers at the end, right? But with insert, you can add it anywhere in the list. To use this method, you need to give two values. First thing is the index. Second thing is the value of the element itself. So say I want to add a value at index zero and the value would be zero. Then if I execute the statement and execute it, you can see that zero has been added. We have zero, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Now sometimes there will be situations where you would like to know whether a certain element exists in a given list or not. So to do that, you can use the in operator. For say, you can write one in, numbers and then if you execute the statement you can see it gives you a boolean value of true you also have 
other methods like numbers dot clear and this will clear the entire numbers list for you so if you want to know more about list methods or anything in general then you can head over to the description given below and i have pasted a blog link over there this blog lists down all the keywords methods syntax errors etc and it can give you an approach as to how you can learn python Now I want to cover another looping method called as for loops. You see sometimes in python you will come across situations where you would like to iterate over a list of numbers individually. This is where for loops come into picture. Let me show you. Suppose we have a list of numbers 1 2 3 4 5. Now what if you want to print them out? You would obviously write print and then numbers, right? That will give you the entire result. But now, what if I asked you to print each of these out separately? This is where you can use for loops. What you will do is start by writing the for keyword and then you will mention the iterator. The iterator is just another variable name. You can keep it anything. I will keep it as items. In and now the variable name. Numbers and then colon. And after this, you have a separate code block. And over here, you can see print items. Now, if you execute this, you will have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all in separate rows. You can also do this with while loops, but it will just be a bit longer. Let me show you. You'll start with i equal to 0 because that's your initial iterator. After which, you'll say while i is less than len of numbers and then cool. Now, if you're wondering what len of numbers is, len is just a method that will give you the length of your list. After this, you can say print numbers and then give the index. You will also need to increase the value of your iterator for every iteration. You can get the same results, but compare and see which one is more simpler. This is why most files use for loops for iterations. Now, in this section of the video, we will see at a function called range. So, range is a function that will give you a range of values. Let me show you. you type range and then you pass a value to it. Now, if you execute this, you will see range 0, 5, which means that this range function contains the values 0 to 5. You won't get the actual values itself because this is the default representation of the range function but you can iterate through this function by using a loop. For example, say for number in range 5 print number. And if you execute this, you will get the number 0 to 4. Note that the index starts from 0, so you won't get the written value over here, but the written value minus 1. Now we can also give two values over here, say 5 to 10. This will return a value from 5 to 10. 10 excluded. So it will be 5 to 9. There you go. You have the values 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. You can also add a third value over here, like say 2. This is the number of steps it will take per iteration. The default over here is 1. That is why you can get a difference of 1 over here, right? But if you say 2, then it will go from 5 to 7 to 9. If I execute this, there you go 5, 7, and 9. In this section of the video, we will be looking at tuples. Now, tuples are kind of like lists, but tuples are immutable. What this means is that once you declare a tuple, it can't be changed. Let us see how to do that. You'll first start with the variable name as always. Let's say numbers equal to one, two, and three. Now, till now, you've been using lists, right? And when you do lists, you use a square bracket. But with tuples, you will use round brackets. And once you execute this, you can check for the methods. And you won't find anything like append, remove, etc. You have count and you have index. Now, 
what count does is suppose you have uh, two elements of some sort and you say numbers dot count three now you can see that numbers dot count has given you an output of two what this means is that three occurs twice in your tuple the other method is the index the index will just return you the first occurrence of a particular element that you ask for. Now, why do you need tuples? Well, I agree that we will be working with lists most of the time, but there are certain situations where you wouldn't want someone or yourself to accidentally change the data in your list, right? That is where you will use tuples. What are comments? No, they are not something there just to increase the size of your code. But guys, they are indeed very meaningful. Comments are programmer coherent statements that describe what a block of code means. And they get very useful, especially when you're writing large blocks of code. Say, for example, you've developed some software previously. And now you're working on something that's new and completely different. At this point of time, you find that your previous software is throwing some error. You would have completely forgotten what you did and how. So this is where comments come into picture. A good code actually consists of relevant comments. These comments actually increase the readability of the program, not just to the programmer, but to the others as well. Now that you know what are comments, let's move on and see when to use them. The best practice is to write comments as and how you proceed with your code. Comments are very useful, but only if they are implemented wisely. Just keep the following points in mind when you're commenting your code. Make sure your comments are very precise and clear and preferably short as well. They need to be as specific as possible to the block of code they are included with. Please make sure you use decent language guys and do not repeat your comments as they become redundant. Now that you know what are comments and their importance, let's see how to write them in Python. Comments in Python are preceded by a hash character. As you can see on the screen over here, I have a small example with some two lines of code. My first line is a comment and my second line is a print statement. Now let's move on towards a Jupyter notebook and see how this works. Now let's move on towards a Jupyter notebook and write some comments. All I'm going to do over here is I'll open a new Python notebook and I will rename this notebook. To rename your notebook guys, all you have to do is click on the title, give whatever title you want and use rename. Like I've told you before, comments start with a hash character in Python. So here I'm going to write a comment preceded by a hash. As you can see my output, there is nothing related to the comment line and whatever I have printed in the print statement has been returned as my output. Now this is how comments work. They do not show up in your output. Now let's get back to our presentation and see how they are interpreted, which is exactly what is our next topic. Whenever the interpreter encounters a hash symbol, it omits whatever is present after that. The hash character actually tells the interpreter to stop reading whatever is present after that until the end of that line. So when you're writing comments, whatever is present after your hash character is going to be omitted by your interpreter. Now what if the hash character was present inside a string? Let's go to our Jupyter notebook and see what happens. I'm including a hash character within a string and I will run this. As you can see, when I run this, the string is returned, which means a hash inside a string means a hash itself and nothing else. So you cannot write comments within a string. Okay, so I hope you've understood how to write comments. Now let us move ahead and see what are the types of comments. Comments can either be single line or multi line. Single line comments can either appear individually or in line with some other code. Multi line comments have to be preceded by a hash character in every line they appear. Now let's see a small example of single line comments. Like I've told you before, single line comments can appear either in an individual line or in line with some other code. Now let's move on towards a Jupyter notebook and write some single line comments. I'll just create a heading over here to create a heading. All you have to do is go to code select heading. Give whatever heading you want as your heading and prefix it by a hash. 
A single hash tells that it's H1 level heading. Two hashes tell that it's H2 and so on. You can use the heading level of your choice. Here, I prefixed my heading by a single hash, which means it's of level H1. Now let's write some single line comments. As you can see over here, my first line of code is a comment line. I've prefixed this line by a hash character. And in my last line, I have an inline comment. This inline comment is present with some part of the code. As you can see in the output, none of the comments have been returned. Now let's get back to our presentation and see how multi line comments work. Like I've already told you, multi line comments can appear anywhere in your code, but each line needs to be prefixed by a hash character. For example, as you can see on your screens, I have a hash character present in the first two lines of my code. After that, I have some code followed by it. You can see in the output that none of these lines have been returned. Now let's go to our Jupyter Notebook and write some multi-line comments. As you can see over here, I have three initial comment lines and all three have been prefixed by a hash. After that, I have some code and you can see in the output that none of the comment lines have been returned and whatever code is present after that, an output is returned based on this code. Now, typing a hash everywhere might be a problem and many of us would not like to do so. Let's look at some shortcut methods of how to comment multiple lines at once. All you have to do is type your multi-line comments first. Hold the control key and left click wherever you want to insert a hash character. Just like how I'm showing you all. And then type it once and it appears wherever I have inserted the cursor as you can see on the screens. Now, in case you want to remove multiple hash characters all at once, do the same thing, hold the control key, click on wherever you want to remove the hash character from and press the backspace key. As you can see, from two lines, I removed a hash character in a single go. So these are some shortcut methods to comment multiple lines. Many of us think that comments and doc strings are same. Now let's move ahead and see what are doc strings and whether they are actually comments or not. Doc strings are not actually comments, but they are documentation strings. These strings are written within triple quotes. They are not assigned to any variable and many a times they are used as comments as well. Now you'd be thinking what is the difference between doc strings and comments? Doc strings are not omitted by the interpreter. Unlike comments, comments are omitted by your interpreter and nothing present after the hash character is going to be read by it. On the other hand, Doc strings are strings that describe something about the code. Doc strings actually tell what some function is going to do, whereas the comments will tell how it is going to do. So this is the difference between doc strings and comments. Now let's go to our Jupyter Notebook and see their functionality. Like I've told you before, doc strings are written within triple quotes. As you can see in the output, when I execute this, it returns the string itself. Whereas in case of a comment, when I execute a comment, it does not return anything. Which means the interpreter does not omit doc strings, whereas it omits the comment. Now these doc strings are efficiently used when you want to describe something about a class or a function or something else. Now these doc strings can either appear in your output or they can be omitted based on where you're going to place them. Let's try to place a doc string initially before the code starts.
as you can see in my output the doc string has not been returned whereas when i use the doc string individually without any code and i executed it you could see that it had returned the string itself but when i include the doc string before the code and after that i've included some code lines and i run this you can see that only the output for my code is present and nothing related to the doc string has been returned as my output now let's try to include a doc string after some code as you can see over here when i included the doc string after the code it has returned the output for the code as well as the string itself so when you're making use of doc strings just be specific of whether you want it to be returned in your output or not many a times these strings are called rather than writing it again and again so i hope you've understood what are comments and doc strings as well so let's try to understand what exactly is an operator an operator is used to perform operations between two values or variables now we can call the operators as constructs or special symbols that are used to manipulate the values of the operands now you must be wondering what is an operand so the value that we use in an operation are known as operands these operands can be variables or any data type that we have in python so let's take an example here so we have two operands operand 1 and operand 2 now when i add an operator between them we can get the result according to the type of operator that we are using here so before moving on to the types of operator that we have in python let's briefly discuss variables and data types in python the purpose of discussing variables and data types is to get an idea of what exactly is variable and data types because while explaining the different types of operators we are going to use these variables and data types as well so variables are nothing but the memory locations where we store a value and these values we may or may not change in the future according to the properties they possess there are six data types in python namely numbers string list dictionary tuple and a set now let's take it up to jupyter notebook to understand these data types briefly talking about numbers or numerical data types they mainly hold the numerical values for example a variable let's say x is going to hold the value that is 10 so this is going to be a number or a numerical data type now in numerical data types also we have four types of data types first of all we have integer which is going to hold the whole numbers then we have float data type which is used for declaring decimal point values and then we have complex numbers which are used to declare imaginary part values for example we use the j as imaginary part over here and then we have a boolean data type which is used for categorical output that is true or false so when i print the boolean number over here it is going to give me the value as true or false so this was all about numbers talking about strings now strings are used to represent the characters or alphabets we can use the single or double quotes to declare a string in python also strings are immutable in nature which means you cannot change a string once you have declared and to access a value in a string you can use the index values over here so when i use the index number 2 it is going to give me the value at the index number 2 here so this was all about strings guys talking about list list is a sequence which is ordered and changeable which means you can change values in a list to declare a list you have to give a name for your list and we use the square brackets to declare a list in python list is also indexed just like a string so we can use the indexes to access the values from a list and we can store different values in a list as well for example i can use numbers over here give duplicate values as well and i can use strings over here as well so when i print my list it is going to give me the value like this now talking about dictionary dictionary is a sequence just like a list but we use the key value pair in a dictionary i'll show you guys to declare a dictionary we use the curly brackets now i'm going to give the key value pairs over here so let's say this is my key 1 i'll give a semicolon now i'll give the value over here i'll give one more key value let's say key number 2 so when i print my dictionary over here i'll get the values like this now since it has a key value pair it is not indexed which is why we can use the unique key values as an index to access the values in a dictionary so what i'm going to do is i'm going to write the index number as my key value and it is going to fetch me the value at that particular key so let's talk about set guys 
A set is also a sequence which is unordered and not indexed, which means you cannot access the values using the index number. So I'll just write a few values over here, some duplicate values as well. So when I print my set over here, it is going to give me the values like I have mentioned over here, and it is not going to hold any duplicate values in a set. Also, we use the curly brackets to declare a set. Now, talking about tuple, tuple is immutable in nature, which means you cannot change a value in a tuple once you have declared. And we use the round brackets to declare a tuple in Python. So I can give as many values as I want over here, even the duplicate values as well. So when I print my tuple over here, I'm going to get these values that I have declared in the tuple. So the difference between a tuple and a set is not indexed and it does not contain any duplicate values, but a tuple can contain duplicate values and it is indexed as well. So we can declare duplicate values in tuples, but not in the set. So this was a brief discussion about variables and data types guys. If you want a detailed discussion about variables and data types, you can check a video on Edureka platform where we have discussed variables and data types in detail, where we have also discussed various operations that you can perform on a data type. Moving on to the different types of operators that we have in Python. So here is a list of all the operators that we have in Python. So first of all, we have arithmetic operators. Then we have assignment operators, comparison operators, logical operators. Then we have membership operators, identity operators and bitwise operators. So we will be discussing all of these operators in detail. So let's talk about arithmetic operators. Arithmetic operators are nothing but the operators that are used to perform arithmetic operations between variables or two values. So these are the arithmetic operator symbols that we use in Python. So we have addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, modulus, exponentiation and floor division. So let's take it up to Jupyter Notebook to understand the concept of arithmetic operators. So let's say I have two variables x. I'm going to give this value as 10 and then I have one more variable. Let's say y. I'll give it a value. Let's say 20. Now to understand the concept of arithmetic operators, what I'm going to do is. First of all, I'll try to perform addition between these two variables. So I'll just write plus over here and when I execute this, I'm going to get the addition as my output. Now to perform subtraction, I'm going to use the subtraction operator and it is going to give me the value as the subtraction over here. Similarly, I can perform multiplication. Then I can also perform exponentiation. So I'll use two asterisks instead of one for exponentiation. It is that easy in Python guys. Now we will perform division over here. So it is going to give me the value of the division. Now when I do the floor division, I'm going to get the value over here as well. One more operator is left. That is the modulus. So I'll try to perform modulus as well. So it is going to give me the value that is the remainder. So this was all about arithmetic operators guys. So these are all the symbols that we can use for various purposes like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc. I hope you are clear with the concept of arithmetic operators. Now let's try to understand the next operator that we have which is assignment operator. So you can imagine what an assignment operator is by the name itself that is assignment. So we use the assignment operators to assign values to a variable or any value that we have in Python, right? So we have assignment operators like is equal to then we have plus is equal to. So all these symbols we have. Let's try to understand what all these are used for. For example, let's say we have a variable X which has a value 100. Now when I write this X plus is equal to 10, it is going to mean the same as X is equal to X plus 10. Similarly, we can write x minus is equal to multiplication is equal to division is equal to or exponentiation is equal to. Now let's try to understand these operators or the assignment operators in Jupyter Notebook. So first of all, we have is equal to as our first assignment operator. So I'll have one. Let's say I have x. So I have not assigned any value to this. Let's say what happens. Okay, let's try one more variable. I'll write this. So it is showing me a name error which is saying name a is not defined because I have not assigned a value to it. So in Python until you assign a value to a variable, it is not going to be declared in Python. So now when I give the value to this variable, let's say I'll write five over here. It is not showing any error, which means I have assigned a value to this variable. Now let's try to understand other assignment operators. Let's see. So what does plus is equal to mean in Python? So when I write this, what should be the output guys? So let's try to understand this. 
so when I print a I get the value as 10 so why I'm getting this value because I have assigned the value 5 over here then I write one more assignment operator that is plus is equal to 5 so what is going to happen over here is it is going to be same as a is equal to a plus 5 so we have 5 over here and we have added 5 more to this statement which means we are getting the result as 10 over here now let's try to understand other assignment operators as well so let's say exponentiation is equal to 5 so let's see what the output will be so when I print this I'm getting the exponentiation to the value of 5 since a is equal to 10 and we are doing the exponentiation until 5 digits so we are getting the output as 100,000 so this was all about assignment operators similarly we can do the division is equal to then we have minus is equal to so these are all the assignment operators that we have in Python now let's talk about the next operator that we have which is comparison operator so comparison operators are nothing but the operators that we are using to compare two values or objects right so we have comparison operators like equal not equal greater than less than greater than or equal to and then we have less than or equal to as well so let's try to take an example over here so when I use the equal operator I am going to write the statement as just I have written over here x is equal to y so when I'm using the comparison operator I'm actually using double equal to so this is the basic difference between assignment operator and comparison operator so let's take it up to Jupyter notebook to understand these comparison operators guys so let's say I have two variables value is equal to 10 and number is equal to 20 so to understand the comparison operators let me take one more variable I'll say this will be our boolean variable so what I'm going to do is I'll write val is equal to number one what I'm checking is or comparing these two values so what exactly I'm doing is comparing these two variables or values that we have that is val and number one so when I print this compare variable what I'm going to get is either true or false so it is going to be false because value is not equal to number so I can do the similar thing I can check whether it is greater than or I can check if it is less than so when I write 10 over here so I can similarly check if it is greater than or equal to I can check if it is less than or equal to so these are the comparison operators that we have in Python which we can use to compare two values or two objects now let's try to understand the next operator that we have which is the logical operators so logical operators are used to combine conditional statements so what are the conditional statements that we have in Python so let's briefly talk about conditional statement guys so mainly we have three conditional statements in Python we have an is if statement then we have an else if statement and we have an else statement so I'll give you an example for better understanding so for these two variables only I'll write if well is equal to number one print equal else if well is greater than number one print greater else print smaller so what happened here is guys first of all the execution will go to the if statement it will check this condition if this statement is true it is going to print this value if this is false it is going to move to the next statement that is the else if statement that we have over here it is going to check this condition if it is true it is going to print this statement or if this condition is false it is going to jump to the next statement that is the else statement and I'll give one more condition so if all of these conditions are false it is going to jump to this statement and it is going to print not there over here if all of these conditions are false it is going to jump to the next statement that we are going to have in the program but I have not written any other statements so it is going to end the execution over here only so this is a basic example using the conditional statements now that we are done discussing conditional statements let's talk about logical operators so I have told you logical operators are used to combine conditional statements so what exactly are the logical operators so we have a logical and we have logical or or we have a logical not as well by looking at the example let's say we have two conditions over here we have x is greater than 5 and then we have x is greater than 10 so let's try to understand these logical operators in Jupyter notebook now let's say I have two statements I'll write x is equal to 10 and what I'm going to do is I'm going to check if x is greater than 10 I'll write and which is my logical and operator 
and I'll write x is greater than 5 So what is going to happen if I use the logical and operator if both of these statements are true? It is going to give the result as true But if one of these statements is false it is going to give me the value or the output as false So let's see what happens if I execute this statement I'm getting false because one of these statements is false now when I write instead of 10 if I write 8 over here Let's see what happens since both of these statements are true It is going to give me the output as true now instead of and operator if I use the logical or operator Let's see what is going to happen It is showing me that it is true because when we are using the logical or operator only one of these statements has to be true The output will be true, but what happens if both of these statements are false? It is showing me the value that is false, but let's see what happens if both of these statements are true I'm getting true as well So one of the statements has to be true when we are using the or operator now talking about logical not operator What I'm going to do is I'll write not in the beginning now. I'll specify the condition. Let's say x is greater than 10 and x is greater than 5 this is the same statement that we have used before and for this we have got the output as false So let's see when we use the logical not operator. What is going to be the output? I'm getting true as the output here because this statement is negated over here using the not operator and We are getting the opposite value that we should be getting for this statement So this is the purpose which fulfills by using the not operator or the logical not operator that we have in Python so now that we are done with logical operators as well, let's try to understand what are identity operators So identity operators are used to compare objects now you must be wondering what are objects here So everything in Python is actually an object so we can use the data types as objects as well So let's try to understand what are the identity operators in Python So we have is and we have is not so these are the identity operators So what is does is it returns true if both the variables are same object for example, let's try to do this in Jupyter notebook So what I'll do is I'll take let's say a List I'll give it of some values. Let's say 10 20 and 30 I'll take one more list Give it the same values. Let's say 10 20 and 30 And I'll write X is equal to list 1 so when I use the identity operators Let's say if I write x is list 1. Let's see what is the output that I'm going to get. I'm getting true because x is actually the same object as list 1. Now let's try to write list 1 is list 2. Even though when we have used the same values in list 1 and list 2, let's see what the output will be. It is false because these are the not the same objects, right? Similarly, I can use list 1 is not list so here I'm going to get the output as true because list 1 is not exactly list 2 Even though we have the same values. It is not going to be the same object So this is the concept about the identity operators now Let's talk about the next one that we have is membership operators in Python So membership operators are used to check if a sequence is present in an object or not now to understand the difference between an identity and a membership operator Okay, let's first understand. What are the operators in membership operator? We have in and then we have not in so it is going to return true if a sequence with the specified value is present in the object And it will return true if the sequence is not present. So let's do this in Jupyter notebook We have already specified these objects. So let's try to do if X in list one Let's see what happens. It is going to show me that it is false because we have no values in X So when I do the same thing with list one in list two now you see we have the same values over here. Let's see what the output will be. It is false again. Okay, let me do one thing Now to check a particular value or a particular sequence what I'm going to write is I'll check if 10 in List one so it is going to check if this is going to be present over here or not It is showing me that it is true. So what if I write like this? 10 20 30 in list 2 it is false so this is the basic difference between is that is then identity operator and membership operators So when I write let's say It is going to check if this is present in the sequence or not It is showing false because it is not there, but what if I add this value over here, let's say 
now when I execute the same statement I'm getting true because this sequence is actually present in the object now to understand the difference between is equal to and the identity operator let's see what is going to happen what if I write list 1 is equal to list 2 it is showing false I have made a change over here so I'll do this once again so when I print this it is showing that it is true but instead of is equal to if I write is over here it is going to show me false because these are two different objects so this is the basic concept of identity and membership operators guys now let's understand bitwise operators so bitwise operators are used to compare binary values or binary numbers so this is a rather difficult concept guys so I'll be telling you about what are binary numbers first and then we'll be moving on to the bitwise operators that we have in Python so these are the bitwise operators like bitwise and bitwise or so these are the symbols used for these operators guys so this is actually what happens when we are using these operators so let's try to understand bitwise and operator first in Jupyter notebook so what I'm going to do is I'll just write 10 and 12 so what is going to happen over here let's say it is showing me the output as 8 but it is not clear why we are getting this output right so let's understand what 10 is in binary numbers so when I write 10 in binary numbers it is going to be 1010 0, 0. and similarly for 12 it is going to be 1100 0, 0. now when I use the logical AND operator what it's going to do is if both the bits are 1 it is going to be 1 so in this case only first bit is 1 over here so the output will be 1000 0, 0. and if we convert this to decimal it is going to be the number 8 so this is the concept between the binary numbers guys similarly I can use 10 or 12 so what is happening here is I have these values let's say 1010 for 10 and 1100 for 12 now looking at first bits here that is 00 it is going to be 1 so all of these bits in the output will be 1111 which is exactly is equal to 14 so this is the concept of using the bitwise operators where we are using the values as binary numbers we are comparing the binary numbers now let's talk about left shift and right shift guys so this is what I, I write for doing the right shift so 10 in binary numbers is 1010 0, 1, 0. so when I right shift these two bits I'm going to be left with 1 0 and when I convert this to binary I'm going to get the value as 2 so this is the concept of right shift guys now let's try to understand left shift so when I write this I'm going to get the value as 40 now let's try to understand how I am getting this value so 10 if I write it in binary is going to be 1010 0, 0. so when I do the left shift what is going to happen is it is going to shift two values and I'm going to get the value as 1010000 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. so what is happening here if I convert this binary number to decimal I'm going to get the value as 40 so this is why I'm getting the value 40 over here so this is the concept of bitwise operators guys I hope you are clear with the concept of bitwise operators it is a bit complicated because we are using the binary numbers even though I'm telling you these binary numbers you need not mention them while using the operators for example for these bitwise operators all these are written over here let's say if you are using the bitwise and operator it will set each bit to 1 if both bits are 1 as I've shown you and then before bitwise or operator it is going to be 1 if one of the bits is 1 so similarly for XOR it will set each bit to 1 if only one of the bits is 1 and then we have bitwise not operator which is going to invert all bits let's say if we have all bits that is 1 it is going to convert all those bits to 0 and then I have told you about left shift and right shift as well so this is about operators in Python guys Let's understand what exactly is a tuple in Python. A tuple is an immutable data type in Python and it is almost similar to a list in Python in terms of indexing which means we can access the elements of a tuple using indexes and they can also have duplicate members just like a list as well. And it is a collection data type that stores Python objects separated by commas and let me show you an example which will explain how we can create or declare a tuple in Python. So let's take it up to Jupyter Notebook guys. As you can see now we are in the Jupyter notebook and I have a file named tuple in Python over here so I'll just show you how you can declare a tuple in Python so I'll just take a variable here and inside this let me get a few values inside round brackets so I'll just go with one two three four and five because this is a very basic example guys 
and when I print a over here this is my tuple guys which is separated by commas and inside the round brackets but there is one more approach to this where you can actually declare a tuple like this so you simply have to mention some values separated by commas and when I print a again I'm getting the same value as I was getting before so I can follow both of these approaches to actually declare a tuple in Python. So this is how we can create a tuple in Python. Let's take a look at the next topic that we have, which is accessing elements in a tuple. So accessing items in a tuple works similar to a list and we can access elements in a list using indexes and we can specify the index value and it will return the item that is stored at the particular index value. Now talking about indexing, it is a data structure technique to effectively retrieve the information from a data structure and in Python several data types support indexing like list a string etc. So what happens is let's see for example we have a tuple with five natural numbers that have one two three four and five. So the indexing will start at the value zero where one will be stored and it will go until the end of the tuple that is the number five and the index value at number five will be four. So in Python we can use the negative indexing as well to access elements in a tuple or any other data type that supports indexing. So let me take it up to Jupyter Notebook guys and I'll show you how you can use the index values to access elements in a tuple. So we have a over here. So inside the square brackets I'll just specify the index number. Let's say four over here because we have five elements. So it should ideally you know give me the value number five. Okay I have an index error which says index out of range because we have only three values over here. So I'll be getting to this also like reassigning the values to a tuple. So I'll just write two. Now I'm getting the value 30 over here because in my tuple that is the variable a we have values 10 20 and 30. So the index number at 10 will be zero. So similarly at the element number 30 we'll have the index value as two. So we're getting this output. Now talking about negative indexing. So if I write minus one over here what will be the value I should be getting? I'm getting the same value as 30. So when we talk about negative indexing, it will start with 30. So the negative index minus one will be at 30 and for 20 it will be minus two and similarly minus three. So this is all about negative indexing. Now let me talk about slicing guys. So slicing is basically a technique in which we use the slicing operator which is colon and it is used to get a range of elements from a tuple or any other data type that supports indexing for accessing elements. So let me just show you an example. This time I want the variable to be distinct and I'll just specify the numbers as let's say okay these numbers from 1 to 9. So when I print this I have a tuple which has values ranging from 1 to 9. Now talking about slicing it works similar to indexing only. It's just that we'll have to add that slicing operator. So I'll start at the index number okay zero and then I want to go until the end of the tuple. So when I print this I'm getting all the values inside the tuple. So in this tuple the ending index is basically eight. So I'll just write eight over here and we are getting the values until the index number eight. So you can see that number nine is not included here. So when you are doing a slicing operation the index number that you write after the slicing operator will not be included in the output. Similarly, we can use the negative indexes as well. I'm getting the same values and I can use values like these also. So I'll just write minus eight. The output is the same. So this is all about slicing guys. Now let's take a look at the next topic that we have which is changing a tuple. So even though tuples are immutable in nature, but a nested object in a tuple can be changed or in general a tuple in Python can be reassigned with a different value. So I'll just show you the example how we can do that. So talking about the Python nested objects, let's say I have a tuple which has values 10, 20, 30, and inside this I have a list as well which has values 40, 50, and 60. So this is my tuple. When I print A, my tuple looks like this. So the first three elements in the tuple are 10, 20, and 30. And then the fourth element is basically an object which is a list. Now what I'll do is I'll try to reassign the values inside the tuple. So I'll go to the third index which is the list and inside the list I want to change the value that is 50 to let's say 55. So I'll just specify one over here and I'll write 55. And now when I print this 
as you can see I have actually changed the value inside the list guys now let me try to do this uh, with other elements so let's try to change 30 to 35 let's say so I'll specify the index number 2 let's say I'll write 35 I'm getting a type error which says tuple object does not support item assignment so it's basically a way around this error that we will get like the type error if you are trying to change a item inside a tuple but for these objects the nested Python objects you can actually reassign the values very easily now let's take a look at the next topic that we have which is concatenating two tuples so it might sound a little overwhelming but joining two tuples is a very easy task so you just have to assign the addition of the two tuples to another variable and it will return the concatenated tuple with the values of both tuples so let's say you have a tuple with a variable a and then you have another variable b with another tuple so what you'll do is you will just uh, assign one more variable let's just say c and inside this you can do the addition of both a and b and you'll get the resultant as a concatenated tuple so i'll take it up to jupyter notebook and i'll show you how you can do this okay we already have a and b so I'll just take one C variable and inside this I'll just do a plus B no errors and I'll try to print C now as you can see I have both a and B inside one tuple so I have actually concatenated both the tuples inside one tuple so this is how concatenation works with tuples guys so now let's take a look at the next topic that we have which is deleting a tuple so being an immutable data type a tuple in Python does not allow any changes and you cannot even remove an element from tuple after the declaration but there is a keyword which is del and which will delete the whole tuple altogether so I'll just show you guys so we have a tuple C over here which is the concatenated tuple so I'll try to delete this I'll just write del C no errors now when I try to print C over here it's not there because we have deleted the whole tuple over here so this is how deletion works with the tuple guys you cannot delete just one element from a tuple instead you can delete the whole tuple altogether so let's just go to the next topic which is tuple methods so there are not many methods like list or you know other data types that we have in python there are basically a count method and an index method so count basically returns the count of the items and index will return the index of the item specified so let me show you this with an example so let's just say I have a tuple named a and inside this I have values let's just say one 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 I have written five ones over here because we can have duplicate items inside the tuple and let's just say two three four and five no errors now when I print my eight here I have this tuple now to show you how you can use these methods you just write a dot count and inside this I'll just write one and it will return the number of times one has been written inside the tuple which is six similarly the next method that we have is index so to check the index value at a particular element I'll just write five over here and it will return the value of the index at that particular element but what if there is a duplicate member so I'll just write a or index I already know that one is written multiple times inside the tuple I'll just write one over here so it's going to return zero because it will return the index value of the first item that is being encountered even though we have the count as 6 for the element 1 it will give the index value as 0 only so this is all about the tuple methods let's take a look at the next topic that we have which is list versus tuple so I'll give you a few different points so first of all a list is used for homogeneous data types and a tuple is generally used for heterogeneous data types a list is mutable in nature and tuple is actually immutable in nature which helps in faster iteration as well so tuple is basically faster when it comes to iteration like you're working on for loops or any other loops for iteration statements so if you're using any iteration statements tuple is much faster than a list and a list does not have any immutable elements but immutable elements can be used as a key for a dictionary while we are using a tuple last but not the least we have no guarantee that the data is right protected inside a list but if you are using a tuple implementing a tuple with data that does not change guarantees that it is right protected so these are a few basic differences between list and tuple so let's take a look at the next topic that we have which is the tuple constructor it is possible to create a tuple using a tuple constructor as well I have shown you the two different approaches you can follow to create a tuple but there is a tuple constructor which we can use to actually create a tuple 
So let's take it up to Jupyter Notebook again. I'll show you how you can use the tuple in constructor. Okay, let's just say we have a list, guys. And I have these values one, two, three. So this is my list. And when I print my list over here, I have the values one, two, and three. So using this tuple constructor, I can actually change the list into a tuple, guys. So when I run this, no errors. Now when I print B over here, it will have all the elements inside the list, but this time it's a tuple. So we can actually use a tuple constructor to change a data type for typecasting and it can be used to create a tuple as well. So this is all about tuple constructor. Let's take a look at the next topic, which is a few other examples. So I'll be showing you two examples, which is iterating through a tuple and a membership test on a tuple. So let's take it up to Jupyter Notebook. First of all, I'll iterate through a tuple. So let's just say I have a tuple, guys, with a value until 9. And let's say for i in a print i. So this is how you can iterate through a tuple using a for loop, or you can use any other loop as well. And this is a very basic example. Let's take a look at the next uh, example, which is a membership test. So for the membership test, you can use the membership operator, which is in and in Python, we can check whether an element is present in a tuple or not. So the following example is going to show you how you can check if an element is present in a tuple or not. So we'll use this uh, a only. So let me just try to print this a. Okay, we have the same tuple. I'll just print it basically. So I'll check nine in a which is true and I'll just try to check if 10 in a which is false and I'll check if a string in a and I forgot to tell you guys it's not necessary that you have to use the integers only you can use the string or any other data type inside a tuple like we have used the list data type as well what is a set a set is basically a data structure guys which is a collection of unordered elements all elements in a set are unique, which means every element is present just once. Now these values can be of any data type, but they are not indexed. And because of this, you cannot perform indexing operations such as slicing on sets. So now that you know what are sets, let's move on and see when to use sets in Python. Sets can be used when the order of data actually does not matter, but the only concern is your data elements need to be unique. So now let's move on to see how to create sets in Python. To create sets in Python, you can use two methods. The first method is to use the curly braces and the second is to use the set constructor. I have a small example where I've created a set A using curly braces and a set B using the set constructor. Now let's move on towards our Jupyter Notebook and create some sets in Python. The first thing I'm going to do over here is change the name of my notebook. You can give any name of your choice and rename it like I've already told you you can create sets in two ways the first to use curly braces and the second to use the set constructor let's just create some sets using both these methods I've created a set A using curly braces and then I've specified some random values to it. You can also notice that all these values are of different data types. After that, I've created a set B using the set constructor. This set constructor has converted a list of values into a set. Hope you're clear with how to create sets. Now let me just show y'all how to create an empty set using the set constructor. All you have to do is give some name to your set, say for example C and use the set constructor without passing any values to it and hit run. Now when you print this set, you can see that the set is empty. It has returned an output which is an empty set. So I hope you're clear with how to create sets in Python. Now let me just show y'all what are all the methods you can use along with sets. To do so, you can use the dir method and supply the name of the set as a parameter to it. When I used dir and passed a as a parameter, 
which is a set that I've already created. It has returned a number of methods as its output. So all these are the methods you can use along with sets. Now let's get back to our presentation and see what are the operations we are going to perform in this session today. First of all, we will be finding the length of a set and accessing its elements. After that, we will be adding or updating elements of a set and then removing and deleting elements from it. Following that, we will perform the mathematical operations that are union, intersection and difference of sets. Now let's move on towards the first operation of this session, which is finding the length of a set. To find the length of a set, you can use the len method. The length of a set is the number of elements that are actually present in that set. And this len function will return an integer value which is equal to the number of elements present in the set. I have a small example where I've created some random set with the name my set and I've passed some values to it. After that, I've used the len function and passed the name of the set as a parameter. Now let's go to our Jupyter notebook and see what happens when I do this. I've already created set A, B and C. I'll just reprint my set A over here so that it's easy for us to refer to it. Now let's find the length of A. When I used len of A, it has returned 7 as the output, which is equal to the number of elements present in my set A. Now let's get back to our presentation and see how to access elements of a set. Since set contain unordered elements, you cannot use index values to access its elements, but you can loop through it to access the elements of a set. I'll just jump onto my Jupyter notebook and show you all how to access set elements. I'll reprint my sets A and B over here. I've used the for loop to access the elements of set A. All I've done is for every element present in A, print that element. And as you can see in the output, all the elements present in A have been returned one after the other. Now let's get back to our presentation and see how to add elements to a set. To add elements to a set, you can use either the add method or the update method. Now this add method will allow you to add a single element to your set. But the update method will allow you to add a list of values to your set. I'm going to be showing you all how to use both these methods in this session. So here is my Jupyter notebook. When I use the update method, I've passed a list of values to be added to the set C. But here I've passed three again and three has been added just once and it's not been repeated again. This is because sets contain unique elements and there is no second copy of one element present in a set. So I hope you've understood how to add elements to a set. Now let's move on to understand how you can remove elements from a set. To remove elements from a set, you can make use of the remove, discard or the pop methods. The remove method takes one parameter which is the element to be removed from your set. Now in case that element is not present in the set, this method is going to throw an error. The question is, what if you're not sure if some element is present in your set or not? But you want to make sure that this element is not present and your program does not throw an error. In this case, you can use the discard method. The discard method takes one parameter which is the element to be removed and in case that element is not present in the set, this method will not throw any error. Now moving on towards the pop function. The pop method removes a random element from your set. Now let's get back to our Jupyter notebook and use these methods. I'll reprint all the three sets over here. First, I will use the remove method. I've used the remove method and I've specified 2.4 to be removed from the set A. When I print the set A, 2.4 is no more present in my set. Now let me try to pass some value that is not present in the set A. When I use a.remove6 which is not present in the set A, it has thrown an key error. 
and it specified that 6 is the key which is not present in the set A. So I hope you've understood how to use the remove method. Now let's use the discard method and see what happens. When I used B dot discard 3, it has removed 3 from the set B. Now let's try to give some parameter to the discard method which is not present in set B. When I used B dot discard 90, it has executed but it has not thrown any error. So I hope you're clear with both these methods. Now let's try to use the pop method. When I used A dot pop, it has popped some random value from the set A and it has returned it as the output of here. One is no more present in the set A. So I hope you're clear with how to add and remove elements from a set. Now let's move on to our presentation and see how you can find the union of sets. Union of sets refers to the concatenation of two or more sets into a single set. But in case you have any common values in these sets, the resulting set will contain just one copy of the common element. You can perform the union operation in two ways. One is using the pipeline symbol and the second is using the union method. I have a small example where I've created a set A and B and then I've used the pipeline symbol and the union method to find the union of these two sets. Let's go to our Jupyter notebook and see how this works. I'll reprint my sets A, B, C over here. I've used the pipeline symbol to find the union of A and B. All the elements that are present in A and B has been returned as a new set which is the union of A and B. But the common element are just printed once. Now let's see how to use the union method to perform this operation. I've used the union method to find the union of A and B. Now let's try to find the union of three sets using both these methods. As you can see in the output, I've used the pipeline symbol to find the union of three sets and then I've used the union method to find the union of A, B and C. So I hope you're clear with this. Now let's get back and see what is intersection of sets. The intersection of two or more sets is the formation of a new set consisting only of the common elements that are present in all these sets. You can perform this operation in two ways. One is using the ampersand symbol and the second is to use the intersection function. I'll be showing you all how exactly to do this on our Jupyter Notebook. I've used the ampersand symbol to find the union of A and B. And you can see over here the elements that are common between the set A and B are 4 and ABC. Hence the output. Now let's try to use the intersection function. I've determined the intersection of A, B and C using the intersection function and the resultant is a string which is present in all these sets. So I hope you're clear with both these methods. Now let's get back to our presentation and see what is the difference of sets. The difference of sets produces a new set which contains all the elements that are present in one set except the common elements. To make you all understand this concept clearly, let me jump on to my Jupyter Notebook. To find the difference of set, you can use either the minus symbol or the difference method. First over here, I'll be using the minus symbol. When I found the difference of A minus B, I've got all the elements that are present in A, but not the common elements of A and B. When I used B minus A, a set has been returned which contains all the elements of B except the common elements of B and A. So I hope you're clear with what is the difference of sets. Now let's use the difference method to do the same. I've used the difference method to find A minus C. And as you can see, all the elements present in A but not the common elements of A and C have been returned as my output. You can use the difference method to find the difference of three sets as well. 
when I found the difference of a minus b minus c using the difference method only one element has been returned which is present in a and not present in b and c hope you're clear with this now let's move on towards our final topic of this session which is the concept of a frozen set a frozen set is a set whose values cannot be modified which means when you freeze a set it becomes immutable to create frozen sets in python you can use the frozen set method as you all know i've created a set a just make a note guys that you cannot add or remove values from a frozen set as you all know i've created a set a which is a normal set and i've been using it to add and remove values from it now let's freeze this set i've created a new set d which is a frozen set and i've supplied the values of a as a parameter to this frozen set constructor now let's see what happens if i try to add some values to this frozen set when i used d dot add 3 it has returned an attribute error which says frozen set object has no attribute add therefore frozen sets are immutable and you cannot change the values present in a frozen set frozen set helps to serve as a key in a dictionary So what is a dictionary in Python? It is a collection data type just like a set or a list, but there are certain features that makes dictionary unique. So let's take a look at the features of Python dictionary guys. First of all, it is unordered and we can change values in a dictionary as well since it is mutable. Also, it has key value pairs which is like a map that we have in other programming languages and it is indexed as well since the keys are distinct and can be used as indexes to access or change any values in the dictionary. A dictionary does not have any duplicate members as well. Now that we know what dictionary in Python is, let's talk about why we use a dictionary in Python. First of all, the reason would be it is unordered and stores data like a map. So it is one unique feature that Python dictionary has and it also contains the key value pairs unlike any other data type or object in Python. It is almost similar to a real life dictionary where we have distinct values and corresponding to these values there are respective definitions. In case of the dictionary even though there are no duplicate members we can mention duplicate members in the values but the keys has to be unique in order to access these members since there are no indexes also we use the keys as indexes when accessing these elements now that we have learned about why we use a dictionary let's understand how it is different from a list in python so i've listed down these differences between a list and a dictionary So first of all list is ordered but the dictionary is not dictionary is actually unordered guys the next one is list has indexes but in order to access elements in a dictionary we use the keys as indexes the next one would be the list is collection of elements but in dictionary we have the key value pairs as elements which is unlike any other data type or object in python the next one is list is often preferred for ordered data but dictionary is preferred when the data has unique key values So this actually differentiates a list from a dictionary guys and the next one is list have duplicate elements as well but in dictionary we do not have any duplicate elements when we are declaring the keys although we can have duplicate members when we are specifying the values for each key so these are the differences between a dictionary and a list guys i hope you are clear with the difference between those two now that we have understood what a dictionary is in python and why we use it and how it is different from a list Let's try to understand how we implement a dictionary in Python. So first of all, to declare a dictionary in Python, we have to use the curly brackets, just like you can see in the example here. I have the dictionary with the name my dictionary and inside those I have the key value pairs inside the curly brackets. So let's take it up to PyCharm guys to understand how we implement a dictionary in Python. Let's enter the presentation mode guys. So we will try to implement a dictionary here. Let's take the name of the dictionary as a. So inside the curly brackets, I can give the key value pairs. So I'll give one as my first key. So when I am specifying the key value pairs, I have to use the colon to separate the key from the value. Now I'll give one value over here. Now when we are declaring a dictionary, we have to separate these key value pairs with a comma. Now I'll give another key, give it a value, let's say data science. I'll give one more key and give it a value, let's say python. So this is my dictionary guys this is how you actually implement a dictionary i have declared a dictionary over here now let's try to understand how i'm going to access these elements 
so I'll just write a inside the square brackets. I'll specify the key value. So I'll put it inside a print statement guys now as you can see when I run this I will get the value that is specified in the first key value which is Eddie Raker. Now I can simply just print all of my dictionary guys. So this is how I'm going to get the output as when I print the dictionary that I've just specified now to access these elements. I can also use the get function and inside the get function. I'll just specify the key value and when I run this I will get the same output and as I was getting using the square brackets guys. So this is how you access elements inside the dictionary. Now I can also replace values inside the dictionary guys since it is mutable. So instead of data science, let's say I want machine learning. So what I'll do is I'll just specify the key value and I'll specify the value that I want to replace it with. Now when I print this. You will see the replaced value inside the dictionary. As you can see here, I have replaced the value inside the dictionary guys. Now if I want to add one more value inside a dictionary what I'm going to do is I'll just specify the key value that is let's say four because we don't have four over here. So instead of machine learning I'll add the value data science that I have just replaced. Now when I print my dictionary here let's see what all values I will get. I will get one more value that I have just added which is data science. So this is how you actually implement a dictionary guys and uh, to access these values you can either use the square brackets and inside those square brackets you can specify the key value or you can just use the get function and inside the get function and inside the get function you have to specify the key value as well. So now that we have understood how we can implement a dictionary in Python let's try to take a look at the operations that we have in Python dictionary guys. So as I have told already told you how you can actually add an element to your dictionary. Just like this I have specified a key value and given it a value and then there is a replacing element which I have already shown you guys. So these are all the operations that we have in Python dictionaries. So we will look at them one by one guys. So let's take it up to PyCharm and understand these operations guys. So we'll once again enter the presentation mode. So we have a dictionary over here guys. So first of all let's talk about clear. So when I use the clear what it's going to do is it is going to remove all the elements from the dictionary. So when I run this. So I have a dictionary guys that I've already specified. So let's try to print the dictionary first. So you will understand what all these operations are going to do. So I have this dictionary which has these values. All right. So I'll do one thing. I'll use the first operation that is clear. Let's see what it does to our dictionary guys when I run this. Okay. So now when I print my dictionary. Let's see what all values I'll get. It is saying that it is empty because the clear function has actually deleted or removed all the elements from the dictionary. So this is what clear does guys. Now let's take a look at the another one which we have. Also I would want to declare this dictionary once again and when I print this I should be getting all these values again. Uh, yes I'm getting these values. So it would be fine if I do one more thing. So I'll just use the copy over here. So what copy does is it returns a copy of the dictionary guys. So let's say when I print B over here what is going to happen. It is going to show me the copy of this dictionary that I've just specified over here using the copy function. So let's take a look at the next one we have which is the values. So when we are using the values function what it's going to do is it is going to return all the values inside the dictionary guys. So when I run this it will print all the dictionary values inside a list which is Edureka, data science and Python. So we'll look at the next one we have which is the update function. So what does update function do update function actually updates the values of the dictionary with the specified key value pairs. So let's say if I use update just like this what will happen. We have no updates which is it is showing that we haven't updated anything. So this is what update does guys. If we have made any updates it will update the changes into the dictionary. So we'll look at the next function that we have which is actually get function. I've shown you how to use the get function. We will just use the get function to get the values and inside this I just specify the key value and it will return the value with the specified key which is actually Edureka. So this is how you actually access the elements using the get function. Next one is the items function guys. So I'll just use items over here and inside this I will get the list for a tuple of each key value pair guys. So let's run this. 
so when I run this I'm getting tuple of each key value pair as you can see over here I have two then I have the value then I have one more key so this is a tuple of each key value pair which we can get using the items function now coming back to the next one that we have which is the keys function so what it will do is it will actually return all the keys inside the dictionary that we have which is one two three guys so this is all about keys function guys so let's talk about the pop function guys so when I use the pop function what it will do is it will actually pop the value with the specified key so I'll just pop this from the dictionary with the value 3 so as you can see I'm getting that value over here guys now let's take a look at the next function that we have or the operation which is pop items guys so when I'm using the pop item function I can actually remove the last inserted key value pair so I don't have to specify any values over here as you can see I'm getting the tuple of the last key value pair I have specified inside the dictionary so this is what pop item does now the next function that we have is set default guys so what set default does is it returns the value of the specified key if the key does not exist we can insert the key with the specified value so I'll specify the value over here let's say one now when I print this I'm getting Edureka as well so when I specify the next key it is showing me okay it's a syntax error I'm getting the next value so this is what set default is used for which returns the value of the specified key guys so this is all about the operations that we have in a dictionary guys there is one more thing to discuss about the dictionary guys which is the dictionary constructor so the dictionary constructor is actually used to declare a dictionary guys so let's take it up to PyCharm again so I'll show you what a dictionary constructor does so I'll use a I'll use okay I'll use my dictionary as my variable dictionary name and I'll use the dictionary constructor over here I'll specify the values so what I'm going to do is I'll just specify the values I will use the keys as let's say key one only and then I'll give it a value let's say and Eureka now I can give another key value let's say two and I'll give it a value let's say Python now let's see if I can get a dictionary from this so using the dictionary constructor let's see if we have actually implemented a dictionary over here so as you can see I have declared a dictionary using the dictionary constructor guys so when I run this I should be getting a dictionary here so as you can see I have declared a dictionary using the dictionary constructor also one more thing I have missed over here when I was explaining the operations guys so which is the from keys operation so I'll declare one more dictionary over here give it a value let's say one two I'm giving it a random values guys don't be alarmed now when I'm using the from keys keyword what I do is I'll just say a dot from okay we don't have a over here so I'll write a from keys I'll specify my dictionary over here so let's see what happens guys okay I'll so I'll just use the print statement and inside this I will use the from keys and inside this I'll specify my dictionary let's see what happens when I run this so I'm getting a dictionary with the specified keys and values so as we don't have any key one key two inside this so we're not we are getting the none value over here so this is what from keys does inside a dictionary guys so now that we have actually learned what is a dictionary and how we can implement it in Python and all sorts of operations that we can perform on a dictionary let's try to understand what are nested dictionary guys so for this I have a problem statement guys so now that we know that ICC Cricket World Cup is just around the corner guys so what we'll do is we will implement a dictionary with the stats of the 15 members from the Indian cricket squad for the World Cup 2019 and we will use the concept of nested dictionary in the use case so what we'll do is we'll implement a dictionary first and then we will make the unique keys to access those values when we are actually getting the elements from the dictionary and then we will store the data inside the dictionary and we will also import a pandas package and convert those data into a data frame for better display statistics so let's take it up to PyCharm guys so okay let's exit the presentation mode so over here I have the value or the dictionary that I've implemented so let's take it up to presentation mode again so as you can see I have this uh, module that I have actually imported from pandas and I have given it an alias as PD so we'll talk about this later so this is my dictionary guys in which I have made uh, four more dictionaries guys which is actually our nested dictionaries so first key is batsman inside the batsman key I have all those batsmen 
like Rohit Sharma, Sikhar Dhawan and Virat Kohli and inside those values I have one more dictionary in which we have the statistics for all those matches, runs, average, highest score. So actually inside this batsman key I have two more dictionary guys. So this is the concept of nested dictionary. So similarly I have made it for all rounder and we have wicket keepers and bowlers as well. So this is my dictionary guys that I have actually stored all the data using the dictionary or as you can say nested dictionary and then I have all these statements that I have written in which I have converted the data inside the dictionary into a data frame guys. So I have this print statement. So first of all let me print the batsman squad in which we will get the values for all the batsmen that we have inside the World Cup squad. So as you can see I'm getting a data frame over here. So I have these values. We have Rohit Sharma, Shikhar Dhawan and Virat Kohli. So as you can see we have average highest score matches and runs over here. So for Virat Kohli we have more than 10,000 runs. Shikhar Dhawan has 5,000 runs and Rohit Sharma has around 8,000 runs guys. So let's try to understand more from the dictionary that I have just mentioned over here. We have got all the batsmen now. We will try to get all the bowlers. So I'll just print this statement. And it will show me all the bowler statistics, which is Kuldeep Yadav, Mohammad Shami, Bhuvneshwar Kumar, Yuzvendu Chahal. So we have all these statistics in which we have average, we have best figures, then we have matches and wickets as well. So as you can see, we have Bhuvneshwar Kumar with the most wickets, which is 118 wickets, guys. So this is what you can actually do using the nested dictionaries, guys. As you can see, this is an unordered data, but we have key value pairs, which actually helps in retrieving the data very easily, guys. So let's say inside bowler I want Jaspeet Brumra or for all rounder I want Hardik Pandya. All these statements I can use it for getting all those values inside a data frame. Why we need loops. Now let us understand this with an example that is there in front of your screen. Suppose you are a software developer and you are required to create a software module for payroll processing of all the employees in your office. Now what are the things you need? You need the salary of those employees, the bonus and the total amount that they'll get after the end of the month, right? So all these things for each employee you need to print. So for each of the employees you need to print all these three details. Now there are two ways of executing this task. So let us see what are those two ways. So the one way is you can actually write a logic to calculate the total salary of each of the employees that includes all the fields like salary, bonus and total and you are going to write that logic for all the employees that are there in your office. There might be hundreds of employees that are there in your office so you need to write the logic or you need to write the code for all of those employees. So this process is actually pretty hectic. You need to repeat the same logic for total amount of employees that are there in the office. I'm just giving you an example of three employees but what if you have like hundreds of employees. So at that time this particular process will not work. This will not only increase the size of the code it will make it more complex and less efficient. Now another way of approaching this task would be you write the logic to calculate the salary. You keep on iterating that logic for the total number of employees that are there. So when this loop runs once it will print the salary of first employee. When the loop runs for the second time it will print the salary of the second employee. Similarly it will keep on repeating. So if you have 100 employees it will repeat for 100 times. Now what advantage we get here? The major advantage that we get here is we don't need to write the logic for each employee in order to calculate the salary. We can write one logic and keep on repeating it for all the employees. So this way the size of the code gets reduced. The length of the code is reduced. At the same time it reduces the complexity, makes it more efficient and even increases the speed of execution. So this is just one example in order to show you why we need loops. So there are hundreds and thousands of examples that you can think of why we need loops, right? So this is just one simple example that I've shown you in order to make you understand why we need loops. So let us move forward and see what exactly are loops. Let me explain you this with the help of the flowchart that is there in front of your screen. Now what are loops? Loops basically allows us to execute a statement or a group of statement multiple times. Let me explain you this with the help of an example that is present in front of your screen. Now over here what happens, the control comes here and checks the condition. So if this condition is true, it will go on and execute the conditional code that is here. This is nothing but the statements that are present inside the loop. So it will execute that 
and again it will go back and check the condition. So if the condition is still true, then again it will execute the conditional code or the statements present inside the loop. And it will keep on repeating until this condition becomes false. And the moment this condition becomes false, the control will move out of the loop and it will execute the statements that are present after that loop. Now one thing to notice here guys is that there can be two kinds of loops. One is finite. This is actually the flowchart for the finite loops and another can be infinite. Now in infinite loops what happen, the condition will never be false. So at that time the control will never come out of the loop. So it will keep on repeating and it will never stop. That is what infinite loops are. So basically the condition will never be false and due to that the loop will be executed infinite number of times. Now there is one more way in order to categorize loops. That is called post-test and pre-test. In post-test loops what happens, the control will first enter the loop and then in the end it will actually check the condition. But in pre-test loops the control will enter the loop only when the condition is true. So the condition is checked in the beginning of the loop in pre-test loops but in post-test loop the condition is checked at the end of the loop. Now in Python there are no post-test loops present. There are only pre-test loops. So we'll focus on pre-test loops in today's session. So we'll move forward and we'll see various type of loops that are present in Python. So Python basically supports three kinds of loops. One is while, for and nested. We'll look at all these loops one by one and I'll explain you with examples as well. So first we'll have a look at while loop. So while loop is basically used when you don't know how many iterations are required. So let me explain you this with the help of the flowchart that is there in front of your screen. Now over here what happens, the control will move inside the loop only when this while condition is true. And when it is true, it will execute the body of the loop. And then again it will go back and see whether the condition is still true or not. If it is still true, then again it will execute the body of the loop and it will keep on doing that until the condition becomes false. And the moment the condition becomes false, it will come out of the loop and execute the statements that are present after the loop. Now this is the syntax for while loop. First you need to write while then you write the expression or the condition, then you give a colon and the statements or the body of the loop. Now why we use while loop? Basically I've told you earlier as well, while loop is used when you don't know how many iterations are required. So you don't know how many times you need to execute the statements that are present inside your loop. So that is the reason why we use while loops. Now let me show you that with the help of an example. I'll open my PyCharm and I'll give you a very basic example of using while loop and after that I'm going to increase the complexity of the code. So first we'll see a very small introductory example of while loop in which I'm going to print the integer values between 0 to 9. That won't include 9 so it'll print 0, 1, 2, 3 till 9 but it won't include 9. So let me open my PyCharm and show you how to do that. Now this is my PyCharm guys. So over here as I've told you earlier as well, I'm going to print the integer values between 0 to 9 but that won't include 9. So for that what I need to do is I need to first define a variable, let me name it as count and I'm going to initialize a value to it that is 0. Now after that I'm going to use a while loop and I'll write while and then I'm going to give a condition which says that when count becomes greater than 9 it should come out of the loop. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just type in print let it be number colon comma print count right. Now I'm going to increment the value of count count equal to count plus one. Yep. Now when I come out of the loop I want to print say goodbye. Yeah looks fine. Now let me tell you what I've done here. I've defined a variable and I've initialized the value 0 to it. After that I have used a while loop in which I've given a condition that says that count should always be less than 9 because I want to print values between 0 till 9 which won't include 9. Let me tell you that. So my condition says that the loop should be executed only when the count value is less than 9. The moment it becomes greater than 9 then the control should come out of the loop. After that it's just a general syntax I have given a colon and then I have written a print statement that will print the count value and after that I have increased the value of my count by 1 and finally when the control comes out of the loop I want to print goodbye. So let us see whether it works or not. I'm going to run it and as you can see that it works. So we have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8 and finally when the control went out of the loop it has printed goodbye. This is just a very small example guys.
Now let me go back to my slides. Now the example that we just saw was a very simple example. So I'll increase the complexity a bit and I'll give you one more example. So let us move forward with that. So over here what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to code a little guessing game. All right. So what happens in this guessing game? So there will be a random number that will be generated between uh, say 0 to 20 and you need to guess that number. So the number that you have guessed is less than that random number then it will print number is too small. If you have guessed the number that is greater than the random number then it will print that number is too large and the moment you guess the right answer you will exit the while loop and you have won the game basically. So it's just a pretty simple example. But this is a perfect example in order to show you why we use while loop. Because if you notice here, I don't know how many iterations are required in order to guess the correct answer. So at that time, while loop is a perfect solution to this problem. So without wasting any time, I'll actually open my PyCharm and show you how to execute this. So this is the code here, guys. Let me explain you each and every line that is present here. Now what happens first I need to import a module that is called random in order to generate a random number. Now over here I have defined a variable n and I have given a value to it that is 20. Because I want the random number that is to be generated should be between the range 0 to 20. Now I have taken one more variable and I have named it as to be guessed. And over here it should be an integer type so I have written int and this logic will generate the random number that I am talking about. And this will be generated between the range 0 to 20. So how it will be generated? It will be generated with the help of random module that we have imported. So it will be n random dot random plus 1. This will actually generate a random number between 0 to 20. So after that what happens? I have defined one more variable guess and I have assigned a value to it or initialized the value to it 0. Alright. So now comes the while loop. Now in while loop I have given a condition which says that the number that I have guessed, if it is not equal to the random number, then enter the loop. Now once you enter the loop, you need to input the new number, the number that you want to guess again. Now if that guessed number or the number that you are guessing is greater than 0, then again there will be one more if condition which says that the number that you have guessed is greater than the number that has been generated or the random number that has been generated, then print number is too large. And if the number that you have guessed is actually smaller than the random number generated, then print number is too small. Now there is one more condition that is else, which means that when the number that you have guessed is less than or equal to 0, then that means you are giving up. So it will break, it will come out of the loop and it will print, sorry that you are giving up. That's when your game gets over and you have lost it. Finally, if you have guessed the correct number, then it will print, congratulations, you have made it. So I hope you have understood the code that I was explaining here. So let us go ahead and execute this and see what happens. Alright, so it asks me for a new number. So it has to be between 0 to 20. So yep, I'll type 10 and let's see what happens. So it says number is too small. That means it is between 10 to 20. How about 13? Alright, so I've guessed the correct number and it says congratulations, you have made it. Now over here as you can see that it took only two iterations for me in order to guess the correct number. But what if it would have taken more iterations? I mean I'm pretty unclear how many iterations it will take for me. So that is the reason why we use while loop because we don't know how many iterations are required. Now we can run this program again and I can show it to you once more. Ask a new number so I'll just type in say 14. It says number is too large, so I'll type in 11. Again, the number is too large. That means it is between 0 to 11. So how about 8, guys? Number is too small. So now, now as you can see that already three iterations have occurred. And uh, for the fourth iteration, definitely the random number will be somewhere between 8 and 11. So how about 10? So congratulations, you have made it. And the control came out of the while loop and it has printed congratulations you made it. So we'll move forward and see for loops in Python. So for loop is basically used when you know the number of iterations that are required. Unlike while loop where you are not sure about the number of iterations that are required in for loop you know how many times the statements that are present inside the loops need to be executed. 
So for loop provides you with a syntax that will include three fields basically or you can say three informations. So first will be the boolean condition, then comes the initial value of the counting variable and then the incrementation of the counting variable. So as you can see it from the syntax as well, first you write for name of the variable in the range. Then you specify the range in which that variable should be or and then you specify the range that means from which point till which point it should be executed. So you know the number of iterations required then only you use for loop. Now over here as you can see from the flow diagram itself the control comes to this and it will see the item from the sequence. It will execute the statement go back again and then from the range it will pick up the next item. Again it will execute the statement again go back and then from the range it will pick up the third item and it will keep on executing until the range becomes over or that is the last item from the sequence. So when there are no items in the sequence it will go on and execute the statements that are present after the for loop. So this is how for loop works guys. Now let me just give you a very small example of how for loop works. I'll open my PyCharm again and I'll start with a very small example and then I'm going to increase the complexity of our code like I've done that in while loop. Now over here what I'm going to do is I'm going to first define a list and I'm going to name it as fruits. So what all fruits you like guys? I'll first type in mango, then I like grapes and finally I'm going to write and say apple. Yep. So this is my list which contains uh, three fruits, mango, grapes and apple. Now I'm going to define a for loop and over here what I'll write, I'll define a variable say fruit for fruit in fruits, give a colon, print current fruit and type in fruit. Now when you come out of the loop, just print again goodbye. So I have declared a list and the name of that list is fruits. Now that fruits list contains elements which are mango, grapes and apple. Now after that I have defined a for loop which says that for a variable named fruit in fruits. So this will give me the range, fruits will give me the range. As you know that in the fruits list there are only three fruits. So I know it will iterate only thrice, first for mango, then for grapes, then for apple. So this is the difference between the while and for loop. In for loop I know that it will take only three iterations. After that print the current fruit, that's all and when the control moves out of the loop print goodbye. It's pretty easy guys. So go on, execute this and see what happens. So yep, the current fruit first is mango, then comes grapes, then comes apple and then finally print goodbye. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to increase the complexity now as I've done that in while loop as well. So I'll show you an example. First let me go back to my slides. So what I'm going to do in this example, I'm going to calculate the factorial. Now one thing to notice here guys, again in factorial also I know how many iterations are required. Because if you see if I'm calculating the factorial of 5, and I know that I need multiplication five times. First I need to multiply five with four, then four with three, then three with two and then two with one. So this way I require only four iterations. So I know the number of iterations required. So it's a very good example in order to show you where we should use while loop and where we should use for loop. So let me go back to my PyCharm and execute this practically. So this is the code in order to find the factorial of a number. So over here what happens? First I need to input the number that I want to calculate the factorial of. After that I've defined a variable factorial and I've initialized the value to it which is 1. Now I have defined a condition if the number that I've entered is less than 0 then print the number must be positive because I can't calculate the factorial for negative numbers right. And again I have given one more condition which says that if number is equal to equal to 0 then factorial is equal to 1. And then else condition says that when number is greater than 0 then I've used a for loop which says that for I've defined a variable i in range 1 to num plus 1. When I write num plus 1 the range will be between 1 to num plus 1 but it won't include num plus 1 so it will only be including 1 till num. Alright so after that what I've written factorial is equal to factorial into i. So factorial was 1 earlier 
then it will multiply by i i will also be one in the beginning and then again it will go back and it will become two similarly it will keep on increasing until it becomes num so till that time it will keep on executing the loop and the moment it becomes equal to num it will come out of the loop and it will print the factorial value so let me go ahead and execute this and show you if it works or not so i need to enter the number so let's say i want to calculate the factorial of three which is six so if i want to enter one more number so what i can do is i can start it once more so what i'll type i can type again four so it prints 24 which is absolutely correct so we'll move forward and we'll see what are nested loops in python so python basically allows us to use a loop inside and another loop for example you can use a for loop inside a for loop or you can use a while loop inside a while loop and at the same time you can use a while loop inside a for loop as well and a for loop inside a while loop as well so that is basically what is called nested loops now we'll have a look at the example of nested loops as well don't worry so let us move forward and see one example of nested loops now over here what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a code in order to simulate a bank ATM. Alright, so for that I'm going to use nested while loop. And what will happen first you need to enter the four digit pin. And then uh, you can uh, perform the following functions. You can check the balance, you can make a withdrawal, you can deposit some money and you can even, if you don't want to do anything you can tell the machine to return your card as well. So let me show you how it is done. I'll open my PyCharm once more. So this is the code that I've written in order to simulate a bank ATM. I'll explain you each and every line, so don't worry about that. So the first line is nothing but a print statement that says, Welcome to Iron Bank of Browers ATM. All right. And then I have defined a variable restart and I've assigned a value to it, that is Y. Similarly, chances I've assigned a value, that is 3. And this is the balance that I'm going to initialize, that is 67.14. Notice you over here, you won't get more than 3 chances in order to write the correct password. Now comes the while loop, which says that when chances are greater than or equal to zero, at that time, what it'll do, you need to enter the pin. So you need to input the four digit pin that you have. And if that pin is one, two, three, four, then it'll print that you have entered the correct pin. Now comes one more while loop, which says that while restart should not be in this particular tuple, that is the value of restart should not be n capital n o small n o or capital n so it should not lie within this particular sequence that is n capital n o no and n but we know that the restart value is y so it will enter the while loop now over here what will happen it will give you four options first option is in order to check your balance for that you need to press one to make a withdrawal you need to press two in order to pay in some cash or you need to deposit something, you need to press 3 or you want your card back, you need to press 4. So these are the four options that will be given to you. So when you choose option 1, it will print the account balance. So over here as you can see that your account balance is and the balance that is there in your account. After that, it will ask you for restart. So you need to input that value. So that will say, would you like to go back? And if your restart value lies in this particular tuple, then it will break and it will print a thank you statement. But if you want to continue or you want to go back, then you can press anything else apart from small n, n o or this no or capital N. So if you press any other button apart from these, it will actually go back. And in the while statement, as you can see, it says that it is not present here. So it will give you all these four options once more. Now after that, what if you choose the another option in which you need to make a withdrawal? So for that, what will happen? You need to enter the amount that you would write to withdraw, which can be a float number. It cannot be an integer number. So that's why I've used float here. So you need to enter that value. And once you enter that value, it will check whether it is in this particular list or not. That is 10, 20, 40, 60, 80 or 100. Now by default, it will give a restart Y because you need to enter the amount once more. So again, it will go back and it will give you all four options. So you can choose that withdrawal option again and you can choose a number which is present in this particular list. Now when you choose withdrawal equal to equal to 1, at that time it will again ask you please enter the desired amount. So this is for option 2. Now when we talk about option 3, it is pretty much similar to the couple of options that we have discussed before. So it is pretty much similar to that. Over here again, whatever the amount that you want to pay in, 
how much amount that you would like to pay and balance plus the amount that you are depositing so it will print the balance that will be equal to balance plus the amount that you are depositing again it will ask you for restart if you press anything apart from this particular tuple then it will go back to the while statement and it will give you all these four options similarly for option four as well now what happens when you enter the incorrect pin so there's one more condition in the end which says that if the pin that you have entered is not equal to 1234 then it will print that incorrect password and it will decrease the chances by one so earlier you had three chances if you press the incorrect pin once it will decrease your chance and it will make it as two again if you write the incorrect password then again it will make it as chances equals to chances minus one which will become one and if the third time also you do the same thing then the chances will become zero and the moment it becomes zero then it will print no more tries break it will come out of the loop that's all guys so let us go ahead and execute this and see what happens so please enter your four digit pin so i'll just write one two three four and it'll give me four options which is one for balance two for withdrawal three for pain four to return a card so if I want to check my balance, I'll put in one. So it has printed my balance, which is 67.14. And then the restart value that I was talking about, it is asking for that. Let me just make it big for you. Yeah. Would you like to go back? So if I press N here, it will come out of the loop and it will break. And if I press anything apart from small N, capital N, small N or capital N, it will actually go back and ask, give me all the four options that were there. So if I press Y, it will again give me all the four options that are there. You can see that press one. So again, if I want to make a withdrawal, I'll press two. How much amount that I would like to withdraw? Say I want to withdraw 10. So my balance has reduced from 67.14 to 57.14. So would you like to go back? So I'll again press Y and it will give me all four options. If I want to pay in something, that is I want to deposit something, I'll press three. How much amount that I would like to deposit? I'll say 10. So my balance became again 67.14. Again, it is asking me, would you like to go back? No, I don't want to go back. So I can type in N. So, yep. So it says, thank you. And again, asking me for four digit pin. So let me show you what happens if I write the incorrect pin. Say if I write one, 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 incorrect pin. If I write that pin again, again, incorrect, again, incorrect. So we have no more tries. It'll come out since I've exceeded the chances that I was given. So I was given three chances. I couldn't write the correct pin in those three chances. So it'll come out of the loop and it'll stop. So this is an example of nested while. Now let me go back to my presentation and I'll show you an example of for loop as well. So this is an example of nested for loop. So over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a code in order to print the Pythagorean number between a particular range. So what happens is suppose if I want to enter the number 20 that means I want the Pythagorean numbers between 1 to 20 so Pythagorean numbers are nothing but the integers which satisfy a square plus b square is equals to c square so at that time it will print all the Pythagorean numbers that are possible between 1 to 20 3 4 5 you can see that 3 square 4 square is equals to 5 square 9 plus 16 is equals to 25 similarly it goes for 5, 12, 13, 6, 8, 10, 8, 15, 17, 9, 12, 15, similarly for 12, 16 and 20. Don't worry guys, I'll go back to my pie charm and I'll explain you how you can do that. So this is the example of uh, nested for. So first over here, I need to import certain modules in order to use the square root function. So from math module, I'm going to import the square root function. After that, last me for the number. In the example, if you can remember in the slides where I've written 20, so it has printed the Pythagorean numbers between 1 to 20, that same number it will ask me and it will print the Pythagorean numbers between 1 to n. So whatever the number n that I'm going to put in or give an input. After that, it will run a for loop and it will say that for a, which is a variable in range 1 to n plus 1, that means 1 to n, that means 1 to n plus 1, but don't include n plus 1. After that, there's one more variable b, which is in the range a comma n. That will not include n. It will only include till n minus 1. So the square root c square, I've defined one more variable c square, is equal to a exponent 2 or a to the power of 2. Similarly, b raised to the power of 2. All right. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to calculate the square root. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to define one more variable c. And it will be an integer that will be the square root of c square. 
So if that c square is minus c square is equal to equal to 0, then print a, b, c. It's pretty simple logic, guys. Okay, I'll explain it once more, Neil. So this is an example of nested for. So over here, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to first import the square root function from the math module. After that, I'm going to input a number. So if you can remember in the slides, I've given it as 20. So it will print the Pythagorean numbers between 1 to 20. Over here also, it will print the Pythagorean numbers between 1 to n. So whatever the value of n you input, that will be depending upon it. So the Pythagorean numbers will be depending upon the values that you input. So it will be printing the Pythagorean numbers present between 1 to n. After that, I'll run a for loop which says that for a should be in the range 1 to n plus 1. That will not include n plus 1, guys. It will only include n. So 1 till n plus 1, but don't include n plus 1. After that, I've defined one more for loop which says that for b in range a comma n, it won't include n, it will be till only n minus 1. I've defined one more variable here which is equal to c underscore square. That is equal to a square plus b square. Now, after that, I've defined one more variable c and this will be actually the integer of the square root of the c underscore square. All right. So whatever value that you will get here, the square root of that value will be converted to an integer value and will be assigned to C. Now one if condition I'll be using here which says that if C underscore square minus C square is equal to equal to 0 then print ABC. That means that will be a Pythagorean number. So this is a pretty simple logic guys. If you have understood it just give me a thumbs up or you can ask me any questions that you have in your mind. Alright, so I hope you have understood the code that I've explained to you here. Now let us go ahead and execute this and see what happens. Yeah, so the first number that I'm going to type in say 5 and it will give me all the Pythagorean numbers present between 1 to 5. So we have only one Pythagorean number that is 3, 4, 5 in that range. Now I'll execute this once more and I'll type in 10 here. So we have two Pythagorean numbers that are 3, 4, 5 and 6, 8, 10. Similarly, if I execute it once more and I type in a big number say 25 yeah so we have these many Pythagorean pre numbers present between 1 to 25 we'll again go back to our slides and we'll have a look at one more example now in this example I'll actually be using a for loop inside a while loop so what is this example I want the bulk reservation of train tickets so I have like group of people who are traveling somewhere and I want to give their details such as name age and sex I want that to happen in bulk. I don't want to give it one by one. I just want it to happen in bulk. So for that, what I'm going to use is, I'm going to use a for loop inside a while loop. As I've told you earlier as well, you can even use a while loop inside a for loop. But for now, I'll use a for loop inside a while loop and see what happens. So let me go back to my PyCharm. So this is the code in which I'll be using a for loop inside a while loop. So first, I have defined a variable traveling so in which you need to input whether yes or no. So if you're traveling, you'll say yes, obviously. And then we'll have a while loop, which says that while the condition is traveling equal to equal to yes, that means if you're willing to travel, enter the number of people who are traveling. So you need to enter the number of passengers that are traveling and that will be assigned to a variable num. Now there'll be a for loop, which says that for num in range, 1 to num plus 1, but it won't include num plus 1. Enter the name, enter age, and finally whether the person is male or a female. And then print all those values. Now one more thing here is, again it will ask you whether you have missed someone or not. So you need to input that. Oops, forgot someone. So at that time you can write in yes if you have forgotten someone. Then again it will execute the loop. Again it will ask you the number of people traveling and all these details. If you type in anything apart from yes, that means you have not forgotten anyone and it will come out of the loop. So it is a very small example, but a very good example to understand how a for loop can be used inside a while loop. So let me go ahead and execute this. Whether you're traveling, I would say yes, I am traveling. Number of people traveling, I would say three. Name is Saurabh, age is 78, male. All right, so again, it has asked me for one more name. So I'll say Neil, age is 90, male or female, male, 
Yep. So one more name I need to type in, say I would type in Jagriti, age is 98, male or female, female, and yep, it will print all those details for me. So now it is asking, have you forgotten someone? So if I type in and say yes, then it will again ask me the number of people traveling. That means it is again executing the while loop. So if I would say the number of people traveling is 1 and I would type in the name of the person that was traveling so I would just say Siddharth whose age is 77 and he's a male. Yep. Again it has asked me so if I type in anything apart from yes say if I type n so yep it will come out of the loop and this is how you can actually use a for loop inside a while loop. why we actually require functions. So guys, here I have for you a really simple use case. Consider this program, right? So let's say you actually write a program in which you input a Celsius number, let's say a temperature of course, and this must be converted into Fahrenheit multiple number of times. What would you do? We first obviously start with the logic, right? So Fahrenheit is equal to 9 by 5 into the particular Celsius number plus 32. So this is the logic to calculate for Fahrenheit. Well, here's the program to calculate for the Fahrenheit, right? So we collect the input from the user, we enter the Celsius value, again the value in Fahrenheit has been converted and it has been printed. Well, it is really good, right? So this has been done once. But what if you actually want to do it multiple number of times? Well, let's say you have one Celsius value, then definitely it is really easy, right? So let's say you have 3000, 5000, let's say you have 1 lakh values that needs conversion in real time as well. So when this happens, you wouldn't want to repeat the same lines of code, right? Well, this is the number one cause of inefficiency and ambiguity, guys. Well, I'm sure you already would have guessed it, right? So Python functions definitely solves this. Let us check out how it can be done. Well, just before that, let me give you another instance. We have something called as dry. Well, dry is don't repeat yourself. In the sense, when you're actually writing your own functions or when you're writing any methods, make sure that the reusability of it is really high. Functions not only reduce the code in your main program, but they also tend to make your code run faster and better. So what does this do? This actually increases the readability of your code and then makes it very easy for debugging and documentation as well. Consider this easy example, right? So every time you turn on or turn off your television, there are certain functions built in, right? So as soon as you flip the channels or say adjust the volume, there isn't anyone in the back end writing a code at every point of time to actually adjust the volume or flip the channels for you. There is a particular code which repeats itself and doesn't create any new instances when you actually adjust the volume or flip the channels, correct? So this is again very good efficiency. So as soon as you change the channel, there is a function which runs which says that the user has changed the channel. So let me do these certain set of codes. Again, similarly for the volume as well. So if you have increased the volume or decreased the volume, the function gets an input of what you're actually doing. And then this function actually works on your input and then decides an action. In this case, it's volume. Pretty simple, right? Well, now that we know why we need functions, right? So let us check out what functions actually are. So what are functions, guys? I'm pretty sure every one of us has an idea at this point of time. So head to the comment section below and let me know what you think of it. I'd love to interact with you guys there. So coming back, what are functions? Guys, functions are actually a way to break problems or processes down into smaller and independent blocks of code. Straightforward, right? So it's basically a block of organized reusable code that is used to perform some similar task. In our last case, in television, it was either adjust the volume or change the channel. Well, coming back to Python, it can be called by its name when its task need execution. You can also pass the values to it and have return results to you. Do not worry, I'll be walking you through a range of functions so you'll have a better clarity at this point of time. Well, at this time, all I want you guys to do is to know about the def keyword. Guys, def stands for define. And this keyword is actually used before the name of the function. And its name is followed by the parenthesis before a colon. Well, this defines an entire function. Check out this particular example code I have for you. So we have def function underscore name. And this function does nothing and pass. Definitely, right? So we haven't passed anything there for the function to do anything. Well, def is the keyword here. Function underscore name can be anything. It can be my name, Anirudh. It can be Edureka. It can be anything that you like, right? It's as simple as that. So let me quickly introduce you to another concept called as docstring. So guys, what is docstring? 
it's actually called as a documentation string. So it's basically the first string after the function header is called, right? So this particular thing is called as the doc string. Again, as I mentioned, it is short for documentation string. Check this particular example out, right? So we have print greet dot underscore underscore doc underscore underscore. What does this do? Well, this function greets to the person passed into the name parameter. So if there's a name parameter in the documentation, the function actually greets the person which is passed by the name. Simple. Now check out this important flow I have on the left side for you guys. Again, we're going to come back to this, but right now you need to know this. We actually first define a function followed by the function name. We have a certain set of code right in the function or away from the function or anything. Well, good. We actually wrote the code until now. Well, later when we actually need to use it, we actually call the function by its name. As you can see, define function name will actually define that particular function and what that function actually should do. To call the function and by calling the function, I mean to actually make use of the function. We just use the name of the function. So here instead of def function name in the second line of code, we have function name. So this is where we'll actually be using the code. So this sort of flow is actually important and I want you guys to note this at this point. So now that we're good with the basics next up, I want you guys to check out the different types of functions available in Python. So guys, there are two main types of functions in Python. First one is built in functions and the second is user defined functions. Well, as you might have already guessed that built in functions are, are already available with Python natively and user defined functions are something which are defined by the users, right? So there are n number of built in functions for almost all the users guys. So for the sake of simplicity in this tutorial, I have considered the built in functions which are actually part of the native Python package. Well with Python, as you already know, there are n number of libraries. So each library has multiple functions on its own. So as soon as you go into the depth of one single library, you'll get access to all of their functions as well. And in user defined functions again, as the name suggests, you can define whatever you want. So basically, let me give you a quick simple example, right? So consider the example of a calculator. So let's say three plus five is equal to eight, right? So let's say a plus b equal to c. You have written a function. You're going to pass the values a plus b and then you have a function which automatically gives you the value of c and you don't have to write a plus b equal to c all the time. So we are basically trying to reduce the amount of effort put in by the user and increase the readability as well. So there is absolutely nothing to lose when you make use of functions and its advantages from the start to the end and it's all advantages from start to the end. So let me quickly walk you through some of the major built in functions which are available in Python. So guys, the first function I have for you is the absolute function. I am sure many of you can guess what the absolute function already is, but let me walk you through this function, right? So first I have the definition for you. So basically the absolute function returns the absolute value of a specified number. Well, that's confusing. What do we mean by absolute value? Consider this particular syntax and example. Well, the syntax is ABS of n here. ABS is the keyword and n is the parameter passed. So n can be anything, right? So it can be zero. It can be hundred. It can be anything. It has to be an integer here guys. That is really important to note. So here all we're trying to do is we're trying to return the absolute value of a number. So consider the example, right? So we have a complex number here. X is equal to absolute of three plus five J. Well, what does this do? So this basically calculates a number for us, which is actually a complex number in this particular case and then provides the absolute value for it. So let's say instead of a complex number, we had absolute of minus seven. What do you think was going to be the answer, right? So it's going to be seven, obviously. So in this case, it was minus 5.83. And since it's absolute minus has been removed and it's here. So what does the answer to X is equal to absolute of minus 10.5? Can you guys take a guess? Well, definitely it is 10.5, right? So there is no negative in terms of absolute simple and straightforward. Here the parameter which is n it is actually a number. So make sure you don't put any string inputs such that you can avoid all the errors. So the first function is done. So let's quickly move on to the second one. So guys, the second function I have for you is the all function. Well, the definition actually says this the all function returns true if all of the items in an iterable are true. Otherwise it returns false. But what are the iterable items that we're talking about, right? So it can be lists, it can be tuples and it can be dictionaries as well, right? But you need to note one thing about the all function. So if the iterable object is actually empty, then the all function will still return true. So let's quickly take a look at the syntax and the example and the output as well. So syntax all of iterable. You already know that the all here is actually a keyword. Check out the example. We have a list here, right? So my list is equal to true, true, true and X is equal to all of my list. 
Well, it's basically telling us that all of the elements present inside our list is actually true and it matches. So as soon as you check out the output, it says true. Why? Because everything is true. This is the same case for lists, tuples and dictionaries as I mentioned. So make sure you note that as well. Pretty simple, right? So we already covered two functions in such a short amount of time. Let us quickly jump into the third one. So this third function is a very interesting function, guys. So it is ASCII. I am pretty sure many of you actually know what ASCII is, right? So ASCII actually stands for American Standard Code for uh, Information Interchange. And all it does is it is a character encoding standard, guys. So it is basically used by computers to actually understand. So we understand A to Z and 1 to 1000 or 1 to million, right? So how can computers make sense of this information in their low level language is exactly through ASCII. So what does the ASCII function do in Python? Well, the ASCII function actually returns a readable version of any of the objects. Here objects are strings, tuples and list or anything, right? And the ASCII function will actually replace any non ASCII characters with escape characters. So if it's an ASCII character, well and good. If there is no ASCII character, it will actually escape that particular character, guys. So here's the syntax. Check it out. We have ASCII of object again, ASCII being the keyword and object being the parameter. So what is the object parameter here, right? So it's a string. It can be a list. It can be a tuple. It can be a dictionary and anything you want in your particular instance. Check out this simple particular example here. So we have an X equal to ASCII and my name is Tale. The A here is spelled very differently and it does not have an ASCII value mapped to it, right? So if it was just stale, then you would actually get the ASCII output. Well, since here it is not a valid ASCII character, Python actually puts an escape sequence there and it actually escapes that particular thing and prints out the rest of the thing. Simple, right? Well, I'm going to assure that all of the functions are actually as easy as this and then it would make your life easier to know what each of these functions and at the end of the day, it will make your life really easy knowing what all of these functions do. So on that note, let me quickly move to the next function. So the next function I have for you guys is bool. Well, bool actually stands for boolean. Can you quickly take a guess again? Cool. I am sure you would have guessed it by now. The bool function actually returns the boolean value of a specified object. Well, it will actually return true unless it meets empty parentheses or empty brackets or if the object is false, if the object is zero and if the object is none as well. So all these cases are when it can be false, but any other time it will actually return true. So let me quickly walk you through the syntax bool of object bool being the keyword object being the parameter. So what is the object in this particular case? It can actually be string. It can actually be list. It can actually be number or anything, right? So check out this particular example x is equal to bool of one. So as soon as that happens, since it doesn't match with any of our false criteria, we got it as true. Simple, right? And now that we are actually done with the bool function, let us quickly check out our next function. Next function is enumerate and this is definitely interesting guys. So the short form of enumerate actually stands for enum. But in Python, we actually use enumerate. So in case you're coming into learning Python from an other different language, say C, C++ or Java or something, you would realize that enumerate here is the same as enum there. Again, let me quickly show you the definition of it. So the enumerate function actually takes a collection. Again, a tuple is a collection, right? And it takes this as input and returns it as an enumerate object. The enumerate function adds a counter as the key of the enumerate object. Let me give you some better clarity on this. Check out the syntax, right? So enumerate and it has two parameters instead of one. So one is iterable and the other one is start. What is iterable? So we already checked out what iterable objects are and then you have something called a start. Well, start is actually a number. We're trying to define the start number of the enumerate object. Well, if you don't put anything, it will be zero. Well, check out this particular example right in front of you, right? So we have X is equal to apple, banana, cherry and Y is equal to enumerate of X. So again, the default value is zero. So Python already counts from zero instead of one, right? So obviously apple becomes zero, banana becomes one and cherry becomes two. And you can actually play with all of these key mapping values and then operate on them later as well. But at this point of time, all you need to know is this Python starts from zero and the first object there, first iterable object there actually starts from zero. So apple maps to zero and so on from there guys. Simple, right? And now that we are actually done with the enumerate function, let us quickly check out the format function. So what does the format function actually do? So guys, the format function actually formats a specified value into another specified value. Well, that was a bit complex, right? So let me quickly simplify that for you guys. So check out the syntax. We have format and we have two parameters value and format. Well, a value can be a value of any format guys. 
and then we have something called as format guys i'm talking about the parameter here and not the keyword so basically we have multiple parameters guys so we have lesser than so lesser than basically left aligns the result and then we have right align and this actually aligns the space then we have is equal to so this basically places the sign to the leftmost position and we have minus so this is actually used for a negative value as you already know it then we have b b actually converts it to binary c converts it to unicode d to decimal f to a fixed point number g to general point and so on guys and if you want more it is basically o for octal lower case x for hex upper case x for upper case hex format n for number format percent for percentage format but in this particular case check out this example we have x is equal to format of 0.5 and percentage right so 0.5 in percentage is what so it is basically 50% right so it is basically half so 50% is your answer another function done so what is the next function i have for you guys guys the next function is actually get attributes so basically it is shortly called as get attr again a keyword so what does this function do guys the get attr function actually returns the value of the specified attribute from a specified object again looking at the syntax we have get attr we have the object attribute and the default parameter the object is compulsorily required because we need to know what we are working on right so so this is a compulsion and then next we have the name of the attribute right so basically it is the name of the attribute from which you want to get the value from and next we have default guys default is optional here so what does it do basically it is the value to return if the attribute does not exist so in case there isn't any particular attribute to return to it returns to this default value check out this really simple example i have for you guys so we have a class called person name equal to john age equal to 36 country equal to norway x is equal to get attribute of person and age so at this point of time what we are trying to do is move into the class person find me the age of this particular instance so in this particular case john's age is 36 and that is exactly what we see in the output pretty easy right and now that we are done with the get attribute function let's see what's next so this is an interesting function guys so i have the identity function for you guys So guys this is an interesting one the identity function also for short it's called as the id function so what is the definition of this function guys the id function actually returns a unique identifier for any specified object so all the object in python has its own unique identification right so the id is actually the object's memory address and it will be different for each time you run the program check out the syntax and the example guys so id of object as you can already tell id is the keyword object is the parameter here the object can be anything guys it can be a literal object it can be a string it can be a number it can be a list it can be a class or anything as such check out the example x is equal to apple banana cherry y is equal to id of x well this particular object created has the identification as this so when you actually perform operations on this particular object on x and then python basically tracks it in the background using this particular identification guys so every object in python is actually mapped to a particular unique identifier it may not be the same every time but what is important to know that it actually has a unique identifier so if i probably ran this program twice and then showed you the same output it would actually not be the same because another identification number would have been provided so identification function is as simple as that guys so let us quickly move on to the next function So the next function I have for you guys is the length function and it is shortly called as len. So guys the length function basically returns the number of items in an object. So consider this right so when an object is a string the length function actually returns the number of characters in that particular string. Check out the syntax. So we have len of object right again object is definitely a mandate here because we need to know what we are trying to find the length of right. So either it must be a sentence it must be a string or it must be a generic object or it can be a sequence or even a collection as well so check out the easy example i have keyed for you right so my list equal to hello so we have one word here right so it consists of five letters so as soon as you print x equal to len of my list it realizes that this is a string and it prints the number of characters in hello there are five characters and as you can see the output is 5 well length function done guys the next function i have for you guys is the map function Can you quickly take a guess on what the map function actually does? So guys, the map function basically executes a specified function for each item in an iterable sequence. So this basically tells us that the item is sent to the function as a parameter, right? So we need to know what we are actually doing here. 
So check out the syntax. Map is the keyword and we have two parameters which is function and iterable guys. So function is definitely required because we need the function to execute for each particular item, right? And then we have iterable. Well, in this particular function, again, iterable is also a compulsory requirement because we need to know, right? We need a sequence or we need a collection or an iterator object or something to work on. So you can basically send as many iterables as you can and just make sure that the function has only one parameter for each iterable. Quickly check out the example and the code and I'm pretty sure you guys will figure it out on your own. So basically we have defined my function of n again defining the function name name of the function is my function my func and then the parameter is n. What we are actually going to do is we are actually going to return the length of our input parameter. Check out the next line x equal to map of my func and then we are passing it three values apple banana and cherry right. So what do you think is the length of this? So each individual object can be iterable, right? So apple has five characters, hence five banana and cherry has six each. So six characters each again, pretty simple and widely used guys. So this function actually helps you a lot when you're actually trying to map something to a key or when you're practically trying to make use of this. So now that that's done, let me quickly walk you through the next function. So guys, the next function I have for you is the min function min or minimum, right? So this function basically returns the value with the lowest value or it returns as an item with the lowest value in a particular iterable. So if the values are strings, then alphabetic comparison is actually done. Let us quickly check out the particular syntax here. So we have min of n1, n2, n3, right? so it can be any number of numbers. And then we can have another syntax actually, right? So what do we do if it's an iterable? So instead of n1, n2, and n3 or so on, we're gonna have min of iterable guys, as simple as that. But check out the example here for simplicity's sake. We have x is equal to min of 5 and 10. So it's as simply as saying what is the minimum of 5 and 10. So which value is minimum here? 5, right? So if I had to give you another example, what is the minimum of 1000 and 10,000? So whatever is the minimum number is output, right? So in that case, it was actually 1000. So it is as simple as that, right? So I don't think I need to explain more about this. And you guys got a pretty good idea about it already. So moving on next I have for you guys is the POW function POW stands for power. So it's basically exponentiation here guys. So the function actually returns the value of X to the power of Y. Well in this particular case X raised to the power of Y guys. So there are two parameters present, right? So what is the base and what is the power? So if there is a third parameter, then it returns the X to the power of Y and the modulus of Z. Quickly check out the syntax and the example guys. So we have three parameters in this case, right? So it is pretty simple to pick up two parameters. So let's say what is 2 power 3? The answer is 8, correct? So what is 4 power 3 again? It is 64. If you actually require the modulus of this answer, then that would become our Z parameter in this particular case. Since we haven't done it, 4 power 3 remains to be 64 and that is the exact output that we get. Simple, right? It is as simple and as easy as that guys. So next up I have for you is the print function. This is probably the first thing that you would learn as soon as you start Python and this is definitely not the last thing. And this is definitely not as easy as it sounds. So it basically prints the specified message to the screen or any other standard output device. Well, most of the time it is the screen, but you can actually do it to other devices as well. So print. So print we have objects, then we have separators and we have files and we have flush and we have so much around here, right? So let me quickly walk you through all of these in a simple way. So objects basically refers to any object, right? You can have any number of objects you want. All of these will be converted to a string before it is printed. And then we have separator guys. Guys, separator is actually an optional parameter and you specify how to separate the objects. If there is more than one object present, the default separator is actually double quotes. And then we have end. Well, again, another optional parameter. So we use this to basically specify what to print at the end. The default is actually slash n because again, we're going to move to the next line as soon as something is printed. And then we have file. All of these are optional guys. So basically file and flush, everything is optional here as well. So file is basically an object with the right method. That's it. But what if there isn't anything? Well, the default of the file. Well, the default parameter of the file object is actually sys.std out. So it is the system standard out guys. And lastly, we have flush. Well, again, flush is another optional parameter as I told you. And this is basically a boolean specifying if the output is true or false. Well, here is a computer science term for you guys. If the output is true, we call it to be flushed or if the output is false, we call it to be buffered. What is the default output? It is buffered. So what is buffered? Buffered is false. So the default output is false guys. 
again probably the most widely used example ever i have for you guys is printing hello world so print our separator is the double quotes and we're printing hello world again i hope no more explanation is needed for this particular function guys so moving on we have the set attribute function guys so this function basically sets the value of the specified attribute of a specified object again object here is required because we need to know what we're working on the attribute is required because we need to know what attribute we have to set and the value right so we need to know what value to what attribute we set so if you already remember we actually did the get attr right so we actually outputted a function and now we are going to basically set it so check out the simple code i have for you guys we have class person and the name equal to john age equal to 36 country equal to norway same as the previous example right so here we're using another syntax set attr of person age and 40 all we're trying to do is instead of john having his age to be 36 change the age of john to 40 so go into the class person look for age so whatever it is there change it to 40 as simple as that again this is a fairly straightforward function guys and next up i have for you is the sorted function what does this do well the sorted function actually returns a sorted list of the specified iterable objects you can actually specify the ascending or the descending order as per your requirement the strings are actually sorted alphabetically and the numbers are sorted numerically as simple as that but you need to know that you cannot actually sort a list that contains both string values and numeric values so you either can do it for numeric values alone or string values alone got it right so check out the syntax so we have something called a sorted and we have three parameters right so iterable key and the reverse iterable is definitely required because we need to know what sequence we need to sort either if it's a list dictionary or a tuple key is optional guys key and reverse are actually optional here the key is basically a function which is used to decide the order well what if you don't give any order default is actually none and then we have reverse so what is a reverse guys again it is an optional function as i told you and it definitely is a boolean function so false will actually sort it to be ascending and true will actually sort it to be descending default is false so default is actually sorting via ascending method so check out this particular case i have for you right so we have a set of values for a we have b g a d f c h e whatever right so x as soon as we print sorted of a the default value is false so in this particular case what happens is that so it actually orders it for us in the ascending order so the values actually went from being gibberish to be neatly sorted as shown here again another easy function done so this brings me to the last built-in function for the session so i have the type function for you guys so the type function basically returns the type of a specified object so again check out the syntax we have type which is the keyword we have object basis and dictionary right so the first one is required we need the object here because we need to know what we're trying to find out the basis and the dictionary are actually optional so basis actually specifies the base class and the dictionary actually specifies the namespace with the definition of that particular class well it is not that you need to worry about this right now but then definitely this particular and definitely this particular parameter which is dict is actually useful later but for now since i'm introducing functions to you let's stick to the basics so check out this particular example i have a equal to apple banana and cherry b equal to hello world and c equal to 33 so as soon as you try to find out the type of a b and c you can realize right so the first one as soon as you look at it it's a tuple second one as soon as you look at it it's hello world and third one is definitely an integer right so a b c respectively so again as easy as that guys so those were a lot of functions and i actually recommend that you guys pause the video at every point of time and make a note of all of the important stuff that i've said here guys so this will actually take you a long way in learning python well, now that we're actually done with the built-in functions, again, let me quickly give you a recap and then start with user-defined functions, guys. So what are user-defined functions? Again, as I said, we'll be taking the code-first approach here. So here I have for you guys two simple syntaxes. So the first one is how we can actually create a function and the second one is on how we can actually call the function. So we have actually looked at this when I previously told you, but let me quickly tell it again. So again, define my function. Define is the keyword. My function is the name of the function. So what what do i want this function to do i want it to print hello from a function so this is actually the body of the function and as soon as the function has been called it's going to print hello from a function well instead of print i could actually make it to calculate something for me or print my name or print edureka's name or anything as such as well right so the body of the function is completely left to your freedom but make sure you check the number of parameters you require and all that you need right so now quickly look at how we can actually call a function so we have defined my function and then hello from a function as well to call this particular function all you need to do is call the last line guys so basically we need to type out my underscore function and you're good 
So how more simpler can you expect Python to be, right? As simple and straightforward as that. So then again, parameters, guys. So parameters are the information passed to functions that you already know. So let me quickly step up the complexity of our examples to one little notch higher, right? So again, check out. So we have defined my function and f name. Here, f name is actually the parameter of us. So we're printing f name plus refsness. So what we're trying to do, we're trying to pass. So this is our function body. So next, what we're actually trying to do is we're actually trying to print it. So we have my underscore function. We've provided three names there. We have ML, we have Tobias, and we have Linus, right? So as soon as you go ahead and check out the output on the right side, so that is actually concatenated to refsness, right? Again, simple. So you can have any number of parameters and then work on all of these parameters and get whatever return output you want, guys. And get whatever meaningful return output that you want. So what is the default parameter value that we stumble upon all the time? Again, check out the example here. So we have defined my function country equal to Norway. So I'm specifying in my parameters that the country is equal to Norway. So no matter what you do, right? So in case you haven't provided any value, the default value it should actually consider is Norway. So we're printing I am from and then concatenating a value of the country. We've called the function four times in which the first time we have said Sweden. So it's printing I am from Sweden. The second time it's India. So I am from India. Third time we've just called the function without passing any parameter to it, right? So this is the exact case where it moves to the default value. Since nothing is provided, it is actually printing. I am from Norway. And then fourth one, my function of Brazil. Again, it is as simple as that. You've already provided the parameter, so print it as it is. So default parameter value. You got all of this, right? And then the important concept you need to know is the return value, guys. Check out the example. We have my function and x is our parameter. We're returning 5 into x. So basically, as soon as we pass a number, 5 is going to be multiplied to that number and we're going to get the output. My function of 3, 5 threes are 15, 15. So next we have 5. 5 fives are 25. 25 is correct. 9 fives are 45. Again, we have 45 as the output. So we're good with that, right? So let me quickly recap on how the function actually works. So we have one set of code and we actually keep using it in recursion. So recursion is basically a function calling itself. So check out this particular example I have for you guys. We have defined a function. We call it uh, try underscore recursion. We have a parameter k. So if k is equal to zero, then add the result to whatever is lesser than the next iteration of this function. I know it sounds complex, but how you can actually analyze a recursive function is to take a pen, a paper. So to write down the values of k at every point of time and then to actually trace what is available in the memory, guys. So if that is the case and if the result in which k is greater than zero, we print the result. Else we print it to be zero and we return the result. And lastly, we actually print the recursion example results and we call the function by passing it a value of k, right? So k is 6 in our case. So if k is equal to 0, absolutely 6 plus try underscore recursion of 5. Again, come into the function. Is 5 greater than 0? Correct. Again, go back. Check if 4 is greater than 0. Yes. Keep doing it until the result is 0, right? So it's pretty much obvious at this point of time, guys. So every time you actually run this, one value gets added to your program, right? So again, check out the output and you will understand this better. So we have one and then two values were added. We got three. Three values were added. We got six. Four values were added. We got 10. Five values, 15. Six values, 21. So all we're trying to do is add one extra value and print it using recursion. And that's about it, guys. So I hope this has been a good introduction to the Python user defined functions as well. So next, quickly let us check out the Lambda function in Python, guys. So what is the Lambda function? Guys, it is extremely simple. A lambda function is basically one small anonymous function. So it can take any number of arguments, but it can have only one expression at the end of the day. Check out the syntax here. So we have lambda arguments and expressions. Well, still nothing is working, right? Check out the example. We have x equal to lambda of a, where the expression is a plus 10. So as soon as we want to print something, all we need to do is we need to print x of 5. As soon as we hit x of 5, a gets the value to be 5. So since a gets the value to be 5, 5 plus 10 becomes 15 and we're printing x of 5, which is now 15. Pretty simple, right? So you basically can create tiny functions all on your own using the lambda keyword here. So do know that the syntax is really important because we have the arguments on the left side and the expressions on the right side. So guys, here is another example I have for you. So we have a lambda function that multiplies one argument with another argument. In our case, it is a and b and we want to print the result. So check it out x equal to lambda of a comma b 
because a and b are parameters here so what is the expression you want to perform between a and b it is multiplication so a cross b and we're printing x of 5 comma 6 so a is 5 b is 6 what is 5 6 are it's 30 right again the output is 30 pretty simple check out this other example so basically we're trying to find the sum of three parameters a b and c and print the result so x equal to lambda of a b and c three parameters a b and c hence three and then we have a plus b plus c so what is the sum of five six and two it is 13 and that is exactly what you've got in the output so these are tiny set of functions that you can make use of any time without any dependencies guys so that is the important part i want you guys to notice at this point but when you can have all the regular functions why would you want to make use of the lambda function right i'm pretty sure this was the first thought that came into your head as soon as i explained the concept well the power of lambda is actually better shown when you use them as an anonymous function inside another function check this particular thing out we have defined a function which is called as my func i have one parameter n and then we are actually performing an other function inside our function and this is basically telling us to return the lambda of a cross n so whatever n value has been provided we're going to use the lambda function as in a tiny function there to provide us the multiplication of a value with a particular n value which is the parameter simple so check out this example guys so we basically use that function definition to make a function that always doubles the number that you send in so we have defined my function of n lambda of again a into n right so it's pretty much the same example and then we have a variable called my doubler which actually is sending the parameter 2 to our n value so what do you think is going to happen as soon as i print the value of my doubler of 11 pretty much simple 11 gets multiplied by 2 because 11 is passed as a function into the my func through my doubler so here a and n becomes 2 and 11 so what is the product of 2 and 11 it's 22 pretty much simple right so here is another last example so basically we can use the same function definition to make a function that actually triples the number that you send in so what i want you guys to note is that check out the function definition it remains the same so define my function of n return lambda of a into n perfectly same my doubler my function on how many times you want to double it so double is two so two my tripler equal to my func of three so i want to triple it so multiply three times as soon as i print my doubler of 11 11 into 2 22 is the first output that i get print my tripler 11 into 3 33 that is the second output that i get so what i am trying to convey to you guys is that you wouldn't have to rewrite all of these functions at every point of time right so the definition of the function remained same how we call it and how we get our output is actually depending on us and that is what makes functions efficient and one of the biggest concepts that you need to learn in python guys what exactly are lambda functions python lambda functions are functions that do not have any name they are also known as anonymous or nameless functions the word lambda is a keyword that specifies what follows is anonymous. Now that you're aware of what these lambda functions are, let's move on further to see why they are actually used. The main purpose of anonymous functions comes into picture when you need some function just once. They are created wherever they are needed. Due to this reason, Python lambda functions are known as throwaway functions. They are also used within higher order functions, which take a function as an input, or return it as an output another very good advantage of using these lambda functions is reducing the size of code and i'm going to be showing y'all in this session how to do this so now let's move on towards our next topic which is to see how to write anonymous functions lambda functions are created using the lambda operator and its syntax is as follows the first thing that you'll need to specify is the lambda keyword and following that you'll have to specify the arguments or the inputs and finally, after the colon symbol, you'll have to specify the expression that needs to be solved. Lambda expressions can take any number of arguments. So as you can see over here, my first example is a lambda expression without any arguments. In the second example, I've taken a lambda expression which just has one argument A1. Finally, I'm demonstrating a lambda expression which has inputs from A1 to AN. Just remember that all your arguments or inputs need to be separated by a comma. So now let's move on towards our Jupyter Notebook and see how we can actually write these Lambda functions. I'll just create a new notebook over here, guys. I'll just open a new notebook over here, guys, and I'll rename it as Lambda functions. 
So guys, now just let me write the syntax as a comment over here. This is going to be good for a referral purpose. So first is the lambda keyword like I already told you all. Sorry guys for the spelling mistake. Lambda and the arguments followed by the expression. Okay, so the first thing I'll have to write down is the lambda keyword. Following that, I'll have to specify the arguments. So let me just give one argument to this. And after that, I'll just say I want to multiply this A with itself. So this is my lambda function. But before executing this, I'll require some variable that can hold the value of this. So I'll just specify that x is equal to this lambda function. And after this, I'll say x of 3. And I'll hit run. So as you can see over here, when I used x of 3, it's returned the output to be 9. So guys, if I had to solve the same expression using a normal function, then I would have had to write a larger piece of code than this. Let me just demonstrate this to you guys over here. So I'll just define a function, say new, and I'll pass the parameter as a. Now I'll be using return to return the value of a star a. To call this function, I'll have to use the name of the function and specify some value to the argument that I've already passed. So in place of a, I'll pass the value as 4, or let me take it as 3 itself, like the previous function, and I'll hit run. As you can see over here, using lambda functions, I just required two lines of code. Whereas, while using the normal function, I had to make use of three lines of code along with this return statement over here. Okay, so guys, I hope you all have understood how to write these lambda functions. So guys, as you all have just seen, I've used lambda expressions in the example along with some other variable x. Now, I did this because these functions are nameless and require some name to be called. But doesn't it seem confusing as to why assign a name to a nameless function and what is the need of it? It's a legitimate question guys, but the point is this is not the right way of using anonymous functions. Anonymous functions like I've already told y'all are best used within higher order functions. These functions either take a function as an input or return it as an output. To demonstrate this, let me just move on towards our next topic of this session. The first thing that we're going to study is anonymous functions within user defined functions. So as you all can see on the screen, I have a user defined function that takes the lambda function as an input. In this example over here, the normal Python function, which in my case is new func, takes one argument x. This argument is then added to some unknown argument, which is supplied through the lambda function. Let me just jump onto my Jupyter notebook to explain this in detail. Let me just first create a heading over here guys. Just remember the number of prefixed hashes tells which heading it is. So if it is h1, it will have one hash prefixed to it. If it has two, then it's h2 and so on. So I'll just create a heading over here of h1 level and I'll give the name as user defined functions or lambda within user defined functions. Lambda within user defined so I hope you guys know what are user defined functions. Okay, so as you all know, when you have to create a function in Python, you'll have to use the DEF keyword followed by the name of the function. I'll just name the function as a and I'll pass one parameter to it, say x. After that, I'll be using the return statement. And within this, I'll specify a lambda function. I'll pass y as the argument to this lambda function and I'll use x plus y as my expression. Now let me just give some value to the variable x and store it in another variable t. So a of 4 and I'll, I'll print the value of t of 9 or sorry 8 and I'll hit run. So as you all can see on the screen, the lambda function that is used within the function a is called whenever I call this higher order function. And the first thing that I'm doing over here is passing a value to the variable x and then I'm printing the value of x plus y. So I hope everyone's understood this part. Okay, now let me just copy this function and pass a few other values to this as well. I'll just store a new value in the variable u and I'll pass the value for x as say 7 and I'll print u of 5 and I hit run. 
Okay, so I hope everyone's clear with this. If you have any doubts, please do let me know in the chat box and my team is here to help you. Now let's move on towards the next topic, which is using Lambda functions within filter map and reduce functions. The filter method is used to filter the given iterables, which can either be lists, sets, etc. Now this is done with the help of another function, which is passed as an argument to test all the elements to be either true or false. After applying the function to the set of iterables, if the value is true, then that value is returned in the output. Now let me just jump on to my Jupyter notebook and use the lambda function within the filter method. I'll just give a new heading over here again. Just for your reference guys, I'll create a heading of h2 level by prefixing it by two hash characters. So I'll just use lambda within filter. And since this is a method, like I already told y'all, the filter function needs iterables. Now here I'll just create a list. I'll say my list and I'll specify some elements to this. The filter method is going to check for all the elements to either be true or false in accordance to the expression that is passed within the lambda function. Like I already told y'all, the filter method is going to check if the expression that is specified within the lambda function is either true or false for all the elements that are present within my list and it returns all the elements that satisfies the expression. So as a result, I'll have a new list. So I'll just name it as a new list and I'll use the filter function and within this I'll be using the lambda function like I already told y'all. Let me just specify the input as a and I'll give an expression over here say a. I just want to check if any of these values when divided by 3 will equate to 2 and I'll pass my list and I'll pass my list as an argument to this. And since the output is going to be a list, I'll just use the list method over here. And one more point I want you guys to note is the syntax of the filter function. And since I forgot to specify this before beginning the demonstration, let me just specify the syntax of this function over here. I'll say syntax. You'll have to use the filter keyword along with some function followed by the iterables. Okay, so as you can see over here, I have the filter keyword, I have the function which is lambda and then I've passed my list as the iterables to this function. Now let me just print the new list and I'll hit run. Uh oh, sorry guys, I've made a spelling mistake over here. So it's F-I-L-T-E-R. So as you can see over here, I've passed the elements 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 to this filter method. And after checking if this expression is true for all the iterables, it has returned 6 as the output. Now let me just cross check over here. So if I divide 1 by 3, I will not get a result which is equal to 2. Similarly, if I divide 2 by 3, I'm not going to get the result as 2 again. Finally, as we all know, if I divide all these elements by 3, only for 6, I'll get the output as 2. So I hope everyone's clear with how to use the lambda function within the filter function. So now let's get back to our presentation and see how we can use the lambda function within the map function. Guys, the map function in Python is a function that applies a given function to all the iterables and returns a new list. So I hope you're understanding what exactly it does. It takes a function as the input and some iterables as well. And then it applies this function to the set of iterables that are passed and it returns a new list. So now let's get back to Jupyter and do the same. I'll create a new heading of course. And it's going to be lambda within map. And I hit run. So before moving on towards the demonstration, I'll just write the syntax for the map function. So it has to have the map keyword, of course. And the parameters that are passed to it is a function and the iterables. Now let me just make use of the same list which I was using previously. And I'll copy that over here. And then I'll just store the output in a new list P. And I'll use the list function since I want the output to be a list. Within this, I'll use the map function and to that map function, I'll pass a lambda function as the input. 
I'll just pass one argument to this as a and the condition I'm going to specify is to check if any element present within my list divided by 3 is not equal to 2 and I'll pass my list as the set of iterables and then finally I'll be printing this. Now let me hit run. So as you all can see over here, it has returned a list with some Boolean values. The expression that I wanted to check is a by 3 not equal to 2. Now let me just move on to my list and see what happens when I divide 1 by 3. Of course I'm not going to get 2, so I have true as the output. Now when I divide 2 by 3, again I'm not going to have the output as 2 and therefore I have true as the Boolean value for this. Similarly, all the elements present in my list are divided by 3 and it's going to check if the condition is true. Therefore, only for 6 it's going to be false and I have the output as false. Okay, so I hope you guys have understood how to use the lambda function within the map function. If you have any doubts, please do let me know the chat box guys and my team will revert to you. Okay. Now let me just jump on towards our next topic which is using lambda function within the reduce function. So guys, the reduce function is used to apply some other function that is passed as a parameter to it to a list of iterables and finally it returns a single value. And to demonstrate this, I'll just jump on to my Jupyter notebook again and I'll create a heading. This is going to be lambda within reduce and I hit run. So first let me just write the syntax of this function. It is the reduce keyword and it takes a function as a parameter. The first parameter is a function and second is a sequence. Now to make use of the reduce function, you'll have to import the func tools library or from that library you'll have to import the reduce function. To do this, I'll be using from func tools import reduce. You can also directly import the func tools library as import func tools, or you can also use from func tools import star. These are just the alternate ways that you can also use over here. Okay, so now I'll be using the reduce function and within this I'll specify a lambda function and I'll pass two parameters say a and b and let me just print the sum of a and b and finally it has to have a sequence as its input. So I'll just specify a list over here. I'll say the list of values to be 23, 56, 43, 98 and 1. Okay, so now let me hit run and see what it returns. So as you can see over here guys, I have 221 as my output. So what this reduce function is actually doing is, it first adds 23 to 56. So guys, the first thing that the reduce function does is add 23 and 56. And the output of this is going to be 79. Now after adding these two values, to this output it will add 43. So to 79 it's going to add 43 and it will produce a new output. After finding the output of 79 and 48 it's going to add the result to 98 and finally it's going to add that result with 1 and returns the final output which is 221. So I hope you guys have understood how this function is recursively adding each value to the next value that's present in the sequence. Guys, if you have any doubts, please do let me know in the chat box. Okay, now let's move on to see how you can actually use these lambda expressions or lambda functions to solve some algebraic expressions. For this, I'll just go back to my Jupyter notebook and I'll create a heading over here. Uh oh, sorry guys. I'll just delete these two kernels. And I'll create a heading. I'll just say lambda for algebra. So guys, first we'll be taking some linear equations. So I'll just create a heading as linear equations. So 
So as we all know algebraic linear equations consists of variables of degree 1 which means they'll have the power as 1. So now let's just use the lambda function to solve some linear equations. I'll just say s is equal to lambda and I'll pass the argument or the input as a and the expression I'll specify as a star a and I'll use s of 4 and I hit run. So as you all can see over here 4 cross 4 is 16. Now let me take a different linear equation. So let me just write the linear equation over here as a comment. So I just want say 3x plus 4y. Okay, so if I want 3x plus 4y, so I'll have to specify some name to this. Say d is equal to lambda and x and y as the inputs. And since I want 3 star x plus 4 star y. Okay, I have 3 into x plus 4 into y. Okay, and then I'll pass the values as 4 comma 7 and I'll hit run. As you all can see 40 has been returned as the output when I pass the value of x as 4 and the value of y as 7. Now let me take some quadratic equation. So I hope you all know what is a quadratic equation. It's an algebraic equation with the degree 2. Let me just give the heading as quadratic equation. Okay, so now let me just try to solve the very famous a plus b the whole square. a plus b the whole square. So I'll just say part 2, okay? Now let me write a lambda function that's going to return the value of a plus b the whole square. I'll just save it within a new variable x and I'll use the lambda function and the arguments or the inputs are a and b. The expression that I'm going to use is a plus b and like we all know we'll have to use double star when we use powers and then I'll print this x. I'll pass the values of a and b as 3 comma 4 and I'll hit run. Okay, so as you all can see I found the value of a plus b the whole square using the lambda expressions. What exactly is an array? An array is basically a data structure guys with ordered series of elements. Any variable that is declared as an array can hold more than one value at the same time. All values in an array have a particular address which is specified by its index number. Here, as you can see on the screen, I've declared a variable a as an array and I've stored values from 1 to 100 in my array which is a. Also make a note of the index values. Indexing always starts from 0 and not from 1. Therefore, a of 0 holds 1, a of 1 holds 2, a of 2 holds 3 and similarly a of 99 holds 100. When the length of my array is n, the index value will be n minus 1. It is always one less than the length of the array. So I hope you're clear with this topic. Now let's move on towards our next topic for this session, which is the difference between Python lists and arrays. Python lists and arrays have the same way of storing data, but there is a key difference that you all have to note. Arrays can store only single data type values, whereas lists can store any data type values. So for example, if I have an array of integer values, all values present in that array will be integers and nothing else. On the other hand, if I have a list, then it can store integers together with float and cares and strings, etc. Now when you try to perform some operations like slicing or looping, it will be similar for both. But when you try to perform different operations, like if you want to multiply your array values by 2 or you want to divide it by 2, you can do so easily when you have an array. But if you try to do the same with a list, it will throw an error because naturally you cannot multiply cares and strings or divide them. So I hope you're clear with the difference between these two. So now let's move on towards the next topic. How to create arrays in Python. Unlike other programming languages, if you want to create arrays in Python, you will have to import the array module. Now this module has all the functions that are necessary for creating and performing various kinds of operations on arrays. To import the array module, you can use three ways. First is to import the array module by its original name which is array. 
The second method is to use an alias name. This is the most widely and commonly used method as well. In my demonstrations, I'm going to be using this method. The third way is using star from array import star. What this does is it's going to import all that is present in your array module. Now let's go to our Jupyter notebook and try to do this. Please do it along with me guys. I'll open a new notebook and I will use the first method to import the array module. As you can see when I hit run, no error has been returned, which means this is executed. Now let's try to create arrays using this method. As you can see over here, I've created an array A using the first method. So I have used array dot array of integer values and I've specified some random integer values. Here the first array is the name of the module. The second array is the array constructor and then I've given a type code. This type code specifies what type of elements my array will hold. As you can see, I've created an array. So I hope you're clear with how to create arrays using the first method. Now let me open a new notebook and try the second method. The reason to open a new notebook is because I've already imported array module in this notebook. I'll rename this notebook because I'm going to be using this method in further demonstrations as well. As you can see over here when I use import array as ARR, ARR here is my alias name. When I use this and hit run, it does not throw any error. Now let me try to create arrays using this method. I'm using int as my data type. You can use any data type of your choice. As you can see that an array has been created with some random integer values. In place of the module name array, I've used ARR. Now let's try the third method. I'll open a new notebook again. As you can see over here, when I'm creating arrays using the third method, I've just specified the constructor name and then the type code and the value list. So I hope you're clear with how to create arrays using all three methods. Okay, so now let's get back to our presentation. Our next topic for this session is accessing array elements. To access array elements, you'll have to make use of the index values. Each index value holds a unique element. Like I've told you before, Indexing starts from 0 and not from 1. So therefore a of 0 holds 1, a of 1 holds 2 and so on. This is the normal traversal order which starts from the left hand side and moves towards the right hand side. But here I want you all to note this point as well that negative indexing also exists. So negative indexing will start from the right hand side and move towards the left hand side. Therefore 100 will be at a of minus 1. 99 will be at a of minus 2 and similarly 1 will be at a of minus 100. So I hope you are clear with negative indexing. Now let's go to our Jupyter notebook and try to access some array elements. As you can see over here, I've created a heading. To create a heading, all you have to do is go to code, select heading and prefix your text with the number of hashes based on the heading level you want. So if I want h1, I will use one hash. If I want h2, I will use two and so on. Here I've created a heading of h1. So I prefixed my text with one hash. Now let me try to access some array elements. As you can see over here, when I access a of two, my output is 3. Let's see where 3 is present in my array. 1 is present at a of 0, 2 at a of 1 and 3 at a of 2. So therefore when I access a of 2, 3 has been returned. Are you guys clear with this? 
just give me a quick confirmation before i move on towards the next topic shashank says yes preeti says please try to access something using negative index values okay preeti let me show you that as well so here i've tried to access a of minus 2 a of minus 2 has returned 5 let's get back to our array a and see where 5 is present 6 is at a of minus 1 and 5 is at a of minus 2 therefore my output is 5 so preeti are you clear with this okay preeti says yes now let's move on towards our presentation and see what is the next topic our next topic of this session is basic array operations here i just want to tell you all something arrays are mutable which means they are changeable so in case you want to add or remove elements from it you can do so easily now coming back to our presentation Our first operation under this section will be finding the length of an array. The second is adding or changing elements of an array. And then we will try to remove or delete elements of an array. And then guys we will try to perform array concatenation, slicing and finally we will be looping through an array. Now let's move on towards the first operation. To find the length of an array you will have to make use of the len function. Now this function returns an integer value which is equal to the number of elements that are actually present in your array. The len function takes one parameter which is the name of your array. As you can see in the example over here, I've created some random array A and I've given some random values. As you can see, I have three values over here. And when I use the len function and I specify the name of my array, the output is 3, which is equal to the number of elements that are present in my array. Now let's move towards our Jupyter notebook and see how this works. As you can see over here when I use the len function and I've given the array name which is a an integer value is returned which is 6. 6 is the number of elements that are actually present in my array which is a okay so i hope you are clear with this so our next operation is adding elements to an array in case you want to add elements to an array you can do so using the append extend or the insert function the append function is used when you want to add an element to the end of your array the extend function is used when you want to add more than one elements to the end of your array The insert function specifically adds a new element to a particular position in the original array. Let's have a look at a small example of these three. As you can see on the screen, I've created some random array A, and then I've used the append function and I've given the value that I want to add to my array. As you can see in the output, 3.4, which is the value I've specified to the append function, has been added to the end of my array, which is A, and then I've used the extend function. please make a note over here that when you use the extend function you will have to specify the values between square brackets if you don't use the square brackets it will throw an error i have given three new values and all three values have been added to the end of my array and then i've tried to use the insert function over here i've specified the index number as 2 and the value to be inserted at that position as 3.4 as you can see in the output 3.4 has been inserted at c of 2 now let's go to our jupiter notebook and we'll do the same i'll reprint my array which is a so that it's easy for us to refer to it since my array a holds integer values i will give some new integer value to it as you can see i have given 8 as the value that i want to insert in my array and 8 has been added to the end of my array now let me try to give some float value to this array and see what happens as you can see when i try to append some float value it gives me a type error therefore i can add only those values which is specific to the type of elements that are present in that array now let me try to use the extend function
Like I've told y'all, when you're using the extend function, you will have to make use of the square brackets. As you can see in the output, all the values that I've specified within the extend function have been added to the end of my array. Now let me use the insert function. I've used the insert function and the first parameter I've specified is the index value and the second is the element to be inserted at this index position. So at index value a of 2, 6 will be inserted. As you can see in the output, 6 has been inserted at a of 2. So I hope you're clear with how to add elements to an array. Now let's move on towards the next operation. Our next operation is removing elements of an array. In case you want to remove elements from an array, you can make use of the pop or the remove function. The pop function removes the element and returns it, whereas the remove function will remove it but it will not return it. The pop function can either take no parameters or one parameter. The parameter it takes is the index value of the element to be removed. If you do not specify any parameter, it will remove the last element from the array. The remove function takes one parameter which is the element to be removed itself. Now let's have a look at a small example of this. As you can see on the screen, I've created some random array A and then I've used the pop function without specifying any parameter. As you can see in the output, when I do not specify any parameter, the last value present in my array has been popped and returned as well. Second time, I've used the pop function and I've given some index value. Now this pop function will remove the element that is present at this index position. As you can see, it has removed 3.1 and returned it as well. After that, I've used the remove function. Like I've told you before, the remove function takes one parameter which is the element to be removed. And you can see in the output that the remove function has not returned any value. After that, I've printed my array. And you can see all the values that are removed using these two functions are no more present in the array A. Now let's go to our Jupyter Notebook and do the same. Let me reprint my array which is A. First I will use the pop function without specifying any parameter to it. As you can see over here, when I do not give any parameter, it removes the last element that is present in my array. Now let me give some index value to it. I'll reprint my array A because I've removed an element from it. Now let me give some index value to the pop function. As you can see, when I use a.pop of 2, it removes the element which is present at a of 2, which is 6, and it returns it as well. Let me try to use some negative index value for the pop function. a.pop of minus 1 removes the last element that is present in my array, which is 5. Now I'll use the remove function. Let me reprint my array, guys. As you can see, all the elements that have been removed using the pop function are no more present in my array A. Like I've told you before, when using the remove function, you will have to specify the element that is to be removed. Here, let me remove 8 because there are two occurrences of 8 and let's see what the remove function does. When I hit run, remove function does not return anything. Now let me print my array A and see what is present. As you can see, the first occurrence of 8 has been removed, but the remove function did not return the value. So I hope you're clear with the remove and the pop functions. Now let's get back to our presentation and perform the next operation. Our next operation is array concatenation. Concatenation means joining. So in case you want to join different arrays, you can make use of the plus symbol. As you can see on the screen, I've created some random array A and B and then I've created some random array C which is empty. Also make a note that all three arrays have the same type code. And then I've concatenated A and B into my empty array which is C. As you can see in the output, all the elements present in A and B have been concatenated into my array C. Now let's go to our Jupyter Notebook and perform array concatenation.
I'm using int as my data type. You can use any data type of your choice. To create an empty array, all you have to do is specify the type code and leave the value list empty. Here I've created an empty array D and I've concatenated B and C into my array which is D. Now let me hit run. When I hit run, all elements present in B and C have been concatenated into my new array which is D. So I hope you are clear with array concatenations. Let me just show you what happens if I try to concatenate arrays of different data types. I'll just change one of my previously created arrays type code and I'll give it as float. Let's see what happens when I change the type code and I try to concatenate these two arrays. You can see that I've encountered an error and it says type error, which means it cannot concatenate two arrays of different data types. So just be careful when you're concatenating arrays, you cannot concatenate arrays which hold different data type elements. Okay, now let's move on towards our presentation and see what is the next operation. Our next operation is slicing an array. Slicing actually means fetching some particular values from your array. To do so, you can make use of the colon symbol. As you can see on the screen, I've created some random array A and I've sliced it from 0 to 3. 0 specifies from where fetching has to start and 3 specifies where it has to stop. So, it will start from 0, it will go on till 3, but it will not include the value which is present at 3. As you can see in the output, I have a of 0, a of 1 and a of 2 that is present in my output. Now let's go to our Jupyter notebook and we will try to slice our arrays. I'll reprint my array D over here and then I will try to slice it. As you can see, I've sliced my array from 0 to 5. So it will start from index number 0, it will go to 5, but it will not include the value which is present at index number 5. You can also see the same in the output over here. Let me try to use some negative index value. My output when I use 0 colon minus 2 contains all the values between 0 and minus 2, but it will not include the value which is present at minus 2. Okay, so I hope you're clear with this topic. Just give me a quick confirmation before I move on. Okay, Anil says yes. Shashank has a question. He asks, what does colon colon minus 1 mean? Shashank, unlike what many of us think, colon colon minus 1 does not reverse my array, but it prints a reversed copy of my array. So let's try to do this over here. As you can see, all the elements present in array D have been reversed. Now let's print our array which is D. The original array D is the same, but colon colon minus 1 has reprinted a reversed copy of my array which is D. This method is actually not preferred because it exhausts the memory. So I hope I've cleared your doubt Shashank. Just give me a quick confirmation. Okay, Shashank says yes. Now let's get back to our presentation and perform the last operation of this session, which is looping through an array. You all might be familiar with these two loops, which is the for and the while loops. The for loop iterates over the items of an array specified number of times, whereas the while loop iterates until some condition is met or some condition is true. When you're using the while loop, you will have to keep three things in mind. One is initializing your iterator. Second is to specify a condition. Third is to increment your iterator. Remember that if you do not increment your iterator, your while loop will go on forever. Let's see a small example of this. As you can see on the screen, I've created some random array A and then I've used the for loop to loop through my array A. I've used for x in A print x, which means go to every element that is present in A and print it. Let's try to do the same on our Jupyter Notebook.
Let me reprint my array D. Now let me use the for loop to loop through this array. For x in A, print x, which means go to every element in D and print it. As you can see, all elements present in D have been returned one after the other. Now let me try to slice this array and print specific elements. As you can see over here, I've sliced my array from index number 0 to minus 3 and I've printed only those specific values using the for loop. Now let's go to our presentation and have a look at the while loop. Like I've told you before, when you're using the while loop, you will have to do three things. One is initializing your iterator. Second is to specify the condition. And third is to increment your iterator. Let's try to perform looping on our Jupyter notebooks. Please do it along with me guys. Let me reprint my array D. Here I'm using the iterator as temp. You can use any name of your choice. As you can see over here, I've initialized my iterator to 0 and then I've specified a condition wherein I have told whenever the value of my temporary variable is less than d of 2, then print that value and then I have iterated the value of temp. I can also use temp plus equal to 1, which is same as temp equal to temp plus 1. Now let's try to use the while loop using the len function. Here I will use my array a. So let me reprint it over here. As you can see over here, when I use the len function, my temporary variable will go to all elements present in my array A and print them one after the other. What is inheritance in Python? If we take a look at a real life example, inheritance is when a child inherits properties from their parents. It can be the genes or it can be any other property characteristic. So looking at it from the programming point of view, Inheritance is when a class inherits properties from another class. The class which inherits the properties is known as the child class or the derived class and the other class is known as the parent class or base class. Now let's take a look at a few advantages of using inheritance in Python. So first of all it is mainly used for code reusability so that you don't have to write the same code again and again and it provides a transitive property and also resembles a real life relationship between classes. So these are the advantages of using inheritance in Python guys. So let me take a simple example to explain what is inheritance and how you can do it in Python. So let's take it up to PyCharm guys. And now I'm going to enter the presentation mode for better visibility. So now what I'm going to do is I'll just take one class guys and name it as parent let's say. Now give it a function. So I'll name the function as function one. And after that let me give it a statement let's say print function number one. Okay, let's say this is a parent function. Now what I'll do is I'll take one more class guys and name it as child and for this in the declaration I have to specify this parent over here. This is also known as subclassing guys. We do the subclassing because a child class is not able to identify which class it is inheriting the properties from. So we do this by declaring the parent class inside the declaration of the child class only. Now what I'm going to do is I'll just make one definition of a function. Let's say function number two. And in this I'll give the print statement as. Let's say this is a child function. Now when we are declaring a child class, it must understand from which class it is inheriting the properties from. So we have declared the child class with the parent class in the declaration. And that's how the child class differentiate between a parent class guys. So now to call the parent class methods, we use the child class objects. So what I'm going to do is I'll just make an object 
of the child class guys now to call this parent function which is the function number one let's see if i can do that and i'm getting function one and function two as well so i can call both the functions so first of all i'll call the function one and after that i'll call the function number two let's see what the output will be now the output is this is a parent function and this is a child function so basically what we have done is we have taken two classes named it as parent and child and from the child class we are inheriting the properties of the parent class here which is the function number one and this is the basic example of inheritance guys this is how you can do it now that i've shown you a simple example let's talk about the init function in python so what exactly is the init function init function automatically gets called each time an object is created for a class now when we add an init function to a parent class a child class will not be able to access the parent class method so to overcome this the child class init function overrides the parent class init function so now let's take a look at an example to understand this now to show how init function works let me first clear this we will write a init function over here yes and instead of self i will add one more variable let's say f name and f age now what i'll do is i'll just write self dot name is equal to f name and self dot age is equal to f age now i'll take one more function guys so i'll just name it as let's say view and for view i want to print the value of f name self dot name and self dot age so this is my parent function guys and for the definition in the child class i will also make one init function so i'll just write it as init self and again i have to add f name and f age and let's say self dot name is equal to f name and self dot age is equal to f age now this init function is going to override the parent in function guys so let's make one more function so this is going to be view as well and in this let's say i want to print okay before we move on we have to specify the parent function with the init function as well and we don't have to mention these variables instead i'm going to add one more let's say i want to add last name as well and i'm going to add it as let's say eddie raker now i'm going to print over here self dot age self dot last name and self dot let's say name all right i have to remove these let's make one more object and give it the value let's say i want the age to be 23 and last name is going to be python in the inverted commas name we have already specified so we don't have to give it again and i'm going to just call the function let's see what happens what is the output will be so as you can see i'm getting the output as python edureka and 23 so this is how you can override the parent class init method using the child class guys so this is all about the init function now let's talk about the next topic that we have which is the types of inheritance so depending upon how many types of parent class and child class are going to be there inside the program following are the types of inheritance in python guys so there is single inheritance there is multiple inheritance then there is multi-level inheritance hierarchical inheritance and there is hybrid inheritance as well so we are going to talk about each of them in detail guys so first of all let's talk about what is single inheritance so when the inheritance involves one child class and one parent class only it's going to be a single inheritance the example that i showed you before is the example of single inheritance guys and talking about multiple inheritance it is going to involve more than one parent class which means we are going to have at least two parent classes and the child class is going to derive properties from both of them and this is called multiple inheritance now talking about multi-level inheritance let's say we have a single inheritance going on we have a parent class and we have a child class but the child class also act as a parent class for another child class that is going to be a multi-level inheritance guys and talking about hierarchical inheritance hierarchical inheritance actually involves multiple inheritance from the same parent class and talking about hybrid inheritance if a program has more than one types of inheritance let's say we have a single and multiple inheritance going on simultaneously it's going to be a hybrid inheritance guys so let's take a look at examples for each of them so let's go to PyCharm guys 
and I'll remove all this so I'll start with single inheritance guys so I'll just take a parent class and give it a function let's say function 1 and give it a statement let's say this is function 1 now let's take another class guys class child and give it the value of the parent class and after that we can move for another function let's say function number 2 and give it a statement let's say print this is function 2 now make a child class object and call the function so we can call both of these functions so I'll just call function 1 give it the output and we are getting the output as this is function 1 so this is a basic example of single inheritance guys now talking about multiple inheritance what I'm going to do is I'm going to make one more class over here let's say class parent 2 now what happens is let's say give it a function number 3 let's say and print statement this is function 3 and in the declaration over here I'm going to just specify two classes and when I call the functions I can call function number 1 and I can call function number 3 as well guys so let's see what is happening here in the output I'm able to call the function number 1 and function number 3 as well from the child class object so this is the example of multiple inheritance guys now talking about uh, multi-level inheritance so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to specify parent over here and from this let's say it doesn't have any declaration of parent 1 which is this class so it is not able to inherit any properties from that but what I'm going to do is I'll just specify parent 2 over here and I can still call these functions because there is an inheritance going on between them which is multi-level inheritance which basically means this class the parent 1 class is actually giving properties to parent 2 class and parent 2 class is giving properties to the child class so this is example of multi-level inheritance guys now talking about hierarchical inheritance guys what I'm going to do is instead of parent 2 over here I'll just specify parent so for these two child classes I have the same parent class and now let's see if I can have the same output or not I'm not going to get the properties from the parent 2 because I have not specified it in the inheritance so I'll just remove this and let's see what happens I'm getting the output as this is function 1 Okay, let's make the object for parent 2 as well. All right, give it 1 and ob1. Dot, let's say what functions we can have. I can have the function number 3 and I can have the function number 1 as well. So I'll just print function number 1 and from both the child classes I'm able to print the function number 1. So this is the example of hierarchical inheritance guys. I'm using the same parent class to give the properties to both parent 2 and child class as well. And now talking about hybrid inheritance hybrid inheritance actually involves uh, more than one inheritance going on in the single program so we have a single inheritance over here so let's say I want to have multiple inheritance as well so I'll just specify parent 2 now and this is the example of uh, hybrid inheritance guys because we have a single inheritance going on over here and in the child class I'm inheriting both the parent 1 and parent 2 and this is the example of multiple inheritance so this is a hybrid inheritance example guys Okay, we are getting a type error which is saying cannot create a consistent method resolution order for base parents parent 1 and parent 2 Okay, let's say instead of this I'll make one more class over here Give it a value. Let's say parent number 3 Give it a function function. Let's say 4 and print statement This is function 4 Now instead of parent number 2 what I'm going to do is I'll just take parent number three guys and with the child class operator let's see if I can actually get the function number one and let's say I want function four as well I'm able to do that so in the output let's say what I get I'm getting the function one and function four so this is a simple example of hybrid inheritance guys now that we are done with the type of inheritances let's take a look at what all we have now so we're going to talk about the super function guys super function actually calls the parent class method directly so let's take a look at a simple example guys how it works so I'll just remove all this now what I'll do is I'll make a let's say parent class and give it a function function 1 again the print statement
now what i can do is instead of calling the parent function from the object i can just use the super function and over here i can just call the function one now i'll just print this is function two let's make a child class object now let me see if i can call the function two or function one i can do that so i'm going to call the function two guys let's see what the output will be so i'm actually able to call the function one directly from the super function over here so this is the function of super function guys it can directly call the parent method and now that we are done with the super function let's take a look at the next topic that we have which is method overriding in python so method adding can also be achieved to change the functionality of the parent class function so let's take a look at an example to understand how we can actually achieve method overriding in python guys so instead of naming them separately i'll just name them as same so when i create the child class constructor and if i call the function now okay function one which is so when i'm calling this function technically it should call the parent function but what happens is it overrides the parent method okay to specify this run it again now i'm getting the output as this is function two even though i'm calling this function one which should be ideally calling the parent function but it is printing out the function which i have specified in the child class so this is how i have overridden this parent class method and this is how we can perform method overriding in python guys why we need exception handling well to understand the concept let me quickly walk you through a very simple scenario consider the case where you're dividing any number by 0 what will happen can you divide a number by 0 you cannot correct but how would a kid approach this problem the kid would think that you can actually use regular division to divide something by zero so you're dividing something by nothing so it stays the same something like this right little does the kid know that this is wrong now check out how a programmer would approach the same concept well it is established that dividing by zero is not possible mathematically so as programmers we know it is not correct So this basically leads to two cases either an exception or an error. So a python program terminates as soon as it encounters an error. Well in python an error can be either a syntax error or an exception. And it is as simple as that. Well let us actually divide by 0 for fun guys. So this is what happens in python. Python presents us with this beautiful error message saying that it cannot divide something by 0. Well in fact let us head to pycharm which is my IDE for coding in python so we can actually walk through this practically So guys here I am in my pycharm so let me quickly go ahead and type out some simple code for you guys so let us start with y equal to 10 we can actually print y by 0 now so let me quickly go ahead and run this in the console so as you can check out it says zero division error division by 0 is not possible so you cannot divide anything by 0 so let's establish that at this point guys That was good enough, right? So let's get started then. Let us quickly check out what exception handling actually is. Well guys, to get a clear picture of what that is, we need to start with understanding the definition for both exception and exception handling. Well, what is an exception? Guys, an exception is an event which occurs normally during the execution of a program that disrupts the normal flow of the program's instruction. So instead of the program actually executing evenly and nicely, there is actually a disruption in between the code. So this we basically call as an exception. So next what is exception handling? Guys, this is the process of actually responding to an occurrence of an exception. As simple as that. So basically the process of responding to the occurrence during compilation of exceptional statements which require special processing is actually what is exception handling, guys. So this is basically done because of the change in the normal flow of the program execution. Well, it is a very simple concept and I'm sure at the end of this session you guys will agree. Well at this point what do you think of exception handling in python guys head to the comment section and let me know what you think so we can interact there and now that we know what exception handling is we need to understand how the entire process of exception handling works so let us check it out first let us walk through what happens in python so let us say the user makes an error what happens next guys when you think about it it is either the user that finds out the error or python will actually tell you what the error is correct so once you know what the error is and you know where it is you can basically start analyzing it to know if it is fixable or not well if it is fixable how can you go about doing that well if it isn't nothing to worry guys python is so good that no matter on what level you mess up there is always a way out of it guys 
So now if it's fixable, how can we handle the exception? Check out the image on the right side. So we need to first find the error. If we cannot do it, Python will find out for us. Well, next is to make sure you take caution while coding if you think that there is going to be an error in that particular piece of code. Well, remember the word try at this point, all right? And later we'll actually fix the error and we call this as catch. Just remember the keywords for now and we'll be walking through these in detail in the following slides. In fact, let us begin by checking it out right now. So guys, these are some of the important terms that you need to take a note of before starting to code and understanding exceptions. So first we have try. Well, try is basically the keyword which is used to keep the code segment under check. So whatever code you put under try is actually the code under scrutiny guys. And next we have except. Well, except is the segment which is actually used to handle the exception guys. So how do we know that the exception has occurred? If our piece of code in the try block has actually caused an exception, then we can handle it in the except block. And how do we use else? Well, else is basically run when no exceptions exist guys. And lastly, we have finally. Finally, we'll run even if there is an exception. Finally, we'll run if there is not an exception as well. So I want you guys to note this at this point of time and this will help you a lot in the coming slides guys. So enough coming back to Python. This is what it visually looks like. We first have the try block where we run a piece of code and next we have the except where the code actually runs only when there is an exception in the try block and if there are no exceptions, then we run the else block guys. And lastly, no matter what exception or no exception, we run the finally block always guys. Sounds simple, right? Well, it actually is. And now that we are familiar with the process of exception handling, let us check out how we can go about understanding this using Python practically guys. Well, syntax errors occur when the parser detects an incorrect statement. Well, check out the tiny arrow on the left side here. Well, this is basically to indicate where the parser ran into the syntax error. Well, in this particular example, there were too many brackets, right? So there was an extra closing bracket. Well, if you actually remove it and run it, you will actually get a different error this time. Well, check on the right side part of the code. Well, this time you actually ran into an exception error. Well, this type of code occurs whenever syntactically correct Python code results in an error, guys. So the last line of the message indicated is what type of an exception error that you actually ran into. Well, in this particular case, it is zero division error and it says that the integer division or modulo by zero is not possible. So this is basically the same case that I showed you in PyCharm a while ago. But instead of showing the message exception error, Python details what type of exception error was encountered. Well, as I mentioned, in this case, it was a zero division error, right? Well, Python comes with various built in exceptions as well as the possibility to create self defined exceptions as well. And now that we are clear with that, let us check out how we can go about raising an exception on our own. So we can basically make use of raise to throw an exception if a condition occurs. The statement can be complemented with a custom exception. Well, if you want to throw an error when a certain condition occurs using raise, you can actually go about it like the following piece of code you actually see on the screen. And when you run this piece of code, you'll be greeted with the following output guys. So it says exception X should not exceed five and the value of X was 10. So let me quickly jump back to PyCharm and we can execute this there. So guys, I'm in my PyCharm right now. So I quickly typed out the code for you guys. So let me quickly go ahead and run it and we can check out the error. As you can see, it says exception X should not exceed five and the value of X was 10. Perfect, right? So let's quickly jump back to the presentation to check what's next. So the program basically comes to a halt and displays our exception to screen, right? So this basically offers clues about what went wrong. And now that we're clear with that, we can actually proceed to checking out the assertion error guys. So instead of waiting for a program to crash midway, you can actually start by making an assertion in Python. Well, we assert that a certain statement is actually met. And if this condition turns out to be true, then excellent. The program can continue. But if the condition turns out to be false, you can have the program to throw an assertion error exception for you guys. Well, have a look at the following example on your screen. Well, this is basically where it is asserted that the code can be executed in a Linux system guys. So if you run this code on a Linux machine, the assertion passes. If you were to run this code on a Windows machine, the outcome of the assertion would be false. And what would happen? Well, definitely the result would be something like this, right? So it would basically present us with an assertion error and says that this code runs only on Linux, right? So I'm using a Windows desktop in this particular case. So let me quickly open up my PyCharm and then we can actually run this piece of code to check out our exception guys. So I'm back in my PyCharm and I've typed out the code guys. So let me quickly go ahead and run this. As you can check out, since this is a Windows machine, it says this code can run on Linux only. But this particular case, this assertion would be true if you were actually running this on a Linux machine guys. 
So if any of you guys are using Linux machine, make sure to try it out. And on that note, let's quickly come back to the presentation guys. Well, in this particular example, throwing an assertion error is the last thing that the program will do. The program will definitely come to a halt and it will not continue guys. But what if that is not what you want? What if you want something different from this or that you want the program to continue while displaying an exception for you guys? Well, now that we actually have a fair idea about how we can go about understanding exceptions, let us dive right into the heart of exceptions now. Yes, I'm talking about the try and accept block guys. So basically the try and accept block in Python is used to catch and handle exceptions. Well, Python basically executes code following the try statement as a normal part of the program. The code that follows the accept statement is the program's response to any exception in the preceding try clause guys. Well, as you saw in the earlier example that I actually showed you when syntactically correct code runs into an error, Python will throw an exception error. And this exception error will actually crash the program if it is unhandled guys. So the accept clause determines how your program responds to these exception guys. So instead of actually crashing our program, we can actually tell Python what to do when this particular exception occurs. We'll check out the following function guys. So this function can basically help us understand the try and the accept block. Well, the Linux interaction function can only run on a Linux system. The assert in this function will actually throw an assertion error exception if you're using it on any other operation system apart from Linux. Well, we can actually give this a try in PyCharm. So let me quickly open up that. So guys, I'm quickly here in my PyCharm. So let me quickly go ahead and select this and run it. Well, this won't say anything right now because well, if it was actually a Linux platform, the message would have been printed, right? So let's quickly jump back to the presentation. So basically, if we run the tiny piece of code you see on the bottom, the way we actually handle the error in this particular case is because we gave out a pass, right? Well, if you were to actually run this code on a Windows machine, you would get the following output, which is already on your screen, right? So it is a blank output. You get nothing. Well, the good thing here is that the program actually did not crash, but it would be nice to see if some sort of exception occurred when you actually ran your code. Well, to this end, you can actually change the pass into something that would generate an informative message like this. Check it out. So let me quickly go ahead and uh, run this in PyCharm. Well, as you can check it out, it says the Linux function was not executed, right? So basically this happened because I am on a Windows machine, guys. So let's quickly go back to the presentation. And guys, when an exception occurs in a program running this particular function, the program will continue as well as inform you about the fact that the function call was not successful. Well, what you did not get to see was the type of error that was actually thrown as a result of this function call, guys. So in order to see what exactly went wrong, you would need to catch the error that the function threw. Well, check out this particular piece of code I have for you guys. So here is basically where we actually capture the assertion error and we print the output message to the screen. So we have a try block, we have the same function and we have accept as error, right? So we're going to print what type of an error it is followed by a message for us, right? So running this particular case on a Windows machine will actually give us this following output guys. So it says function can only run on Linux system and whatever you have chosen in the print block is actually being printed for us. So let me run this in PyCharm. So as you can check it out, we have the message printed, right? So it was the same as I told you. So it was the same message as I told you before. So heading back to the presentation. Well, in the previous example, we actually called a function that we wrote ourselves, right? And after that, when we actually executed the function, we caught the particular assertion error exception and then we printed it on the screen. Well, I have for you another example where you actually open a file and use a built-in exception, guys. In fact, let us dive into PyCharm and we can actually run this and we can come back and take a look at the output. So guys, I actually came into PyCharm and I actually ran that particular piece of code. Why does it say could not open file log? Well, guys, Basically, if the file.log does not exist, the block will give you this output, right? So it says the file could not be opened. Well, this is an informative message and our Python program is actually still able to continue to run. It has not crashed, right? Well, actually in the Python documentation, you can see that there are a lot of built-in exceptions that you can make use of. And here is one exception that I have for you guys that you can check it out. So it says exception file not found error, right? So basically this is raised when a file or directory is requested, but that doesn't actually exist. And this is just one among many that Python offers to us guys. Well, to catch this type of an exception and to print it on the screen, we would actually use this following piece of code guys. So in the try block, we're actually going to open it as file and we're going to read something present in it guys. We're going to accept it by pushing a file not found error as an object and later we actually end up printing that object, right? So let me quickly go into PyCharm and we can check it out. Well, as you can check it out, we have error number two, which says no file or directory, right? So it's perfect. 
Well, you can have more than one function call in your try clause actually guys and anticipate catching various exceptions as well. Well, a thing to note here is that the code in the try clause will actually stop as soon as an exception is encountered. But there is one important thing that I want you guys to note down is that while catching an exception, it basically hides all of the errors guys. Well, definitely there are some unexpected errors in your program, right? When you're catching an exception and even these are completely hidden from you. Well, this is why basically you should avoid using bare except statement clauses in your Python programs guys. So instead basically what you can do is you can refer to the specific exception class that you want to catch and then handle those particular exceptions guys. So look at this following piece of code I have for you. So here basically you first call the Linux interaction function and then later actually try to open a file guys. So let us quickly jump into PyCharm and we can actually check it out. So as you can see I actually executed the program guys. Again if the file doesn't exist running this code on a Windows machine will give you that output right. So it basically says that the function can run only on a Linux machine and then we have actually printed something guys. Well what we actually did here is inside the try clause we directly ran into an exception immediately and we did not get to the part where we'll actually try to open our file.log right. Now basically when you actually run it on a Linux machine it's gonna says no file or directory found. Check it out here guys. So this is the Windows output that you get and this is the Linux output guys. Well at this point let us take a quick break and check out what are the key takeaways of this particular module guys. So basically a try clause is executed up until the point where the first exception is encountered and inside the except clause or the exception handler what we basically call it we can actually determine how the program actually should respond to that particular exception and we can actually manipulate multiple exceptions and differentiate how the program should respond to each of them right. And lastly, we actually learned why we should avoid using bare except clauses guys. And now that you're clear with this, next up I have for you is the else clause guys. So basically in Python using the else statement you can instruct a program to execute a certain set of code only in the absence of exceptions guys. Well check out this following diagram on your screen. So basically in the try part we have the code except when we actually want to handle the exception or else in case there is no exception we're gonna run the piece of code that comes in under else guys. So let me quickly walk you through the code guys. So here is basically the same Linux interaction function and we have an assertion error here and we actually are going to print the error right. So else if there is no assertion error so we're gonna have an else clause and we're gonna print saying executing the else clause right. So let me quickly open up my PyCharm and we can run this piece of code guys. So as soon as I go ahead and run this it says function can only run on a particular Linux system right. So as you can check out the output it says the function can run only on Linux systems right. So in this case I have a Windows machine so we are actually not printing the except clause here. But if you are running this on a particular Linux machine this is the output that you would get guys. So it says doing something and executing the else class correct. This happened because if the program did not run into exceptions any exceptions right. So else clause was actually executed. Well you can actually try to run the code inside the else clause and catch possible exceptions there as well. Well again we have the same Linux interaction here we're gonna print it right. So the Linux output says doing something and no such file or directory found. Well this is basically for the else clause and we're using the same file example here but then we're actually trying to catch an exception in the else block as well. So the output is pretty much straightforward as well right. Well from the output you can actually tell that the Linux interaction function actually ran. Well because no exceptions were encountered an attempt to open file.log was actually made and that file did not exist. And instead of opening the file you actually caught the exception which is the file not found exception. Pretty simple right. And I hope you guys are clear with all of the concepts that we discussed until now. And next up we need to check out how we can actually use the finally clause guys. Well to begin with imagine that you always had to implement some sort of action to clean up executing your code guys. Well Python basically enables you to do so using the finally clause. Have a look at the following example guys. Check out the workflow on your screen. I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with try except and else at this point of time right. So this is the chronological order that you need to go into. First we have the try to check for an exception then we actually handle if there is an exception using the except or else if there is no exception we're gonna print whatever is there in the else block and lastly we have something called as finally guys. So no matter what we're gonna execute this in case if there is an exception the finally block is going to run. In case there is no exception finally block is going to run there as well. So let us quickly check out a coding example guys. So basically this is the particular code I have for you guys and uh, let me jump back into my PyCharm and we can actually execute this. So guys I'm back into my PyCharm so let me quickly go ahead and run this. Well as you can check it out it says that the function can only run on Linux machines. This is because I'm on a Windows machine right now. 
and no matter what right so exception or no exception we have this message which is cleaning up irrespective of any exception guys so this is basically the use of finally guys and that is as simple as it gets so it's pretty much simple right well try except else finally all of this is a really simple concept and once you understand what it actually does you can go about doing a lot using python guys well no matter what the python application is there is a very good chance that you'll actually make use of exceptions guys what is python request request in python is a module which can be used to send all kinds of http requests it is very easy to use and has features like passing parameters in the url and passing custom headers as well it is a human friendly http library as it also suggests on the official documentation page as well and it is one of the most downloaded python library with more than 400000 downloads every day so you can imagine the popularity of python request guys it was written by kenneth rights and has a license under apache 2.0 so this is about python request guys i hope you are clear with what exactly is python request so now that we have learned what is python request let's take a look at the advanced features that python request come with so first of all we have keep alive and connection pooling and then we have elegant key value cookies then coming on to the next one we have international domains and urls and automatic decompression as well and then we have sessions with cookies persistence and unicode response bodies then we have browser style ssl verification and https proxy support as well there is automatic content decoding and multi part file uploads and then there is basic authentication and streaming downloads as well and last but not least we have connection timeouts and chunk requests so these are all the advanced feature guys don't worry we'll be learning about how we can use python request so let's talk about why exactly do we need python request or why are we using python requests So the reason behind this is pretty simple guys we use python request because you don't have to manually add the queries to your urls and form encode post data and that is a reason enough to use python request guys and if you're not able to understand this reason behind using the python request you'll be able to understand this later on in the session when i'll be showing you the use case so hang in there now that we are done with the reason behind why we are using python request Let's try to understand how you can install Python request on your system or on the project that you're working on. So first of all, you have to install the pip environment on your system and then you have to run this command that I'm going to tell you inside the terminal which is pip install request guys. So let's take it up to pycharm and I'll show you how you can install request on your project or on your system guys. Now as you can see, I have a new project over here inside pycharm. So I'll show you guys how you can install request on your system. So you have to open the terminal here. just write pip install requests and you will see that the files are being installed here it will take some time guys and there is one more approach to this if you are using pycharm you can open the settings and inside the settings you will find the project interpreter and over there you can simply add the request library and that will do the job for you guys it is same as running this command inside terminal okay i'll show you that as well so you open settings and here you will go to the project where you will find the project interpreter and over here you can simply just add your file let's search requests here and this is by author kenneth rights that i have told you guys so i'll just install this package and it will not take so much time because we have already installed it and as you can see we have request over here inside the so you can see request over here which has all the files and everything for our project so i'll just type okay close the terminal and over here i will make one demo file guys to show you how you can make get and post request so we have this file let's enter okay let's first of all talk about making get and post request guys so we have installed uh, request on our system guys so let me talk about get request what exactly are they used for and how are we going to use them inside the tutorial i'm going to show you or the use case as well so get request are basically used to request the data from the server so what you have to do is I'll show you the syntax as well so you just have to import the request library and then you will have to make one response object in which in this case r is the response object and you are going to use the request library and make the get request and inside the get function you have to mention the url that you are going to make the request from so let's take it up to pycharm guys i'll show you how you can make the get request so let's enter the presentation mode for better visibility so i'll just import the request library yes and i'll make one response variable or response object 
and inside this I will use request dot get and inside this I will have to specify one URL guys so I'll just show you what URL I'm going to use so what I'm going to do is I'll just copy the URL over here and when I make the print statement I will use the response object and let's get the text over here using the response object whatever we have on the server and when, when I run this I will be getting the text for this URL that I've just provided as you can see over here so this is how you can make a get request guys now let me show you how you can actually pass parameters inside your URL also so what I'll do is I'll just make one variable let's say payload and inside this I will specify a dictionary with some values let's say key one and value one okay so when I pass this inside the get function with the parameter that is params is equal to that is the parameter variable guys so I'll just uh, pass payload over here and when I get the URL now I should be getting this parameter that I have just passed inside the URL so you will be getting this dictionary of the value that I've just passed as a parameter inside the URL so this is how you actually pass parameters inside your URL guys while you're making the get request similarly you can also pass custom headers as well I'll be showing you that later on in the session so we have talked about making get request guys so let me just talk about how you can make the post request as well so we'll talk about what exactly post requests are used for so basically post requests are used to submit the data to be processed to the server so let me show you an example with the syntax first of all you have to import the request library and then you have to use the post function as well using the request keyword after that you have to mention your URL and the data that you want to give it as a payload or something like that and then you have the response variable as well or response object so let me take it up to PyCharm guys you will be able to understand this better in PyCharm so instead of get request we'll get post over here and instead of parameters we'll just pass this as data so instead of uh, text okay we'll just get the text again so let's see what are we getting so we don't have post request allowed inside this so instead of get we'll just write post over here run it again as you can see so we have this dictionary that I added using the post request guys these are the headers and then we have cookies as well no we don't and uh, this is how you can actually make a post request guys I hope you are clear with making the post request and get request guys so this is all about making a post and get request guys also I want to show you what are all the content or the response content that you get using these requests so let me just take one response object again I'll make a get request so I'll just pass the URL over here and we are good to go so we will print whatever we'll get so using the response object let's see the content type or what all content we can get so we can get text we can get headers cookies and then there is status code let's check the status code first guys if the status code is 200 we are good to go it is 200 guys so we'll get some more content from this so we'll get cookies now it will be showing us the cookies inside our cookie jar yes we are getting the cookies inside the cookie jar and we can also pass our own cookies I'll be telling you about that in later on in the session don't worry guys so then there is headers as well you'll see all these headers inside a dictionary guys so this is how you actually access the headers inside a URL and then there is the content format also you can get the content in the format of JSON as you can see we're getting the content as JSON objects so this is all about response content guys now let me get to the next topic that we have which is cookies and headers guys so I've just shown you how you can get the cookies and headers inside using the response variable so let me just talk about what are cookies and headers guys so we can view the server's response headers using a Python dictionary which I have just shown you guys so the dictionary is special though it's just made for the HTTP headers and similarly you can get the cookies as well if a response contains some cookies you can quickly access them and to send your own cookies to the server you can just use the cookies parameter and cookies are returned inside a request cookie jar which acts like a dictionary but also offers a more complete interface suitable for over multiple domains or paths so let's try to understand this inside PyCharm guys so what we'll do is we'll just get some cookies here and when I run this we're getting a cookie jar okay guys what I've done is I have actually changed the URL so what I'll do is I'll run this command now and you will be seeing the cookies over here which is inside the request cookie jar and what I can do is I can also pass my own cookies so I'll take a variable name it cookies and give it a dictionary guys and inside the dictionary I'll specify some values let's say key one is equal to 
value 1 and then over here using the cookies parameter I will just pass cookies here so I'll just write text over here and when I run this I should be getting a dictionary with the cookie jar which actually has the cookies named as key 1 and value 1 so this is how you can actually make your own cookies inside a web server and then I'll show you what you can do with headers as well so let's get the headers here when I run this I should be getting the headers inside this URL which are all these headers over here inside the dictionary so this is how you can actually access the headers inside the URL guys so let me talk about session objects guys which is the next topic that we have so session object actually allows us to persist certain parameters across request so it also persists cookies across all requests made from the session instance and we'll use the URL library 3 connection pooling and if you're making the several requests to the same host the underlying TCP connection will be reused which can result in a significant performance increase and also a session object has all the methods of the main request API as well so let's try to persist some cookies across the request guys so we'll move to the PyCharm again so we have come to the PyCharm now what I'll do is I'll make one variable let's say session object that is so I'll use request dot session and after that I'll just use a get statement where I'll just use s dot get pass the URL and we're good to go then what I'll do is I'll make a response object and inside the response object I will pass one more variable or URL which is this one now what I'll do is I'll just print response dot text let's see what happens as you can see we have persisted one cookie so this was all about session objects guys and any dictionaries that you pass to a request method will be merged with the session level values that are set and the method level parameters override the session parameters as well and you have to consider that method level parameters will not be persisted across requests even if making a session as well so now that we are done with session objects let's take a look at errors and exceptions that we have for python request guys so first of all in the event of a network problem for example a dns failure or a refused connection request will raise a connection error exception and it will raise a HTTP error if the HTTP request returned an unsuccessful status code which is actually 405 or 404 as well now if a request times out a timeout exception is raised and if a request exceeds the configured number of maximum redirections a too many redirects exception is raised so this is all about errors and exceptions that we have in Python request guys so now that we are done with errors and exceptions let me talk about a small use case that I have made using the Django app so we will exit the presentation mode over here and I will open the project that I had made so as you can see I have a Django file over here with all the init settings.py urls.py so I have over here the URL configurations and everything and I have a views.py file inside my app that I had created so this has the code for making a request to a web API and inside that I will be able to search for a particular city and I will be getting the description of the weather and the temperature over there and the condition of the weather over there so I will show you this and this is my template guys so let me run the server guys and if you're wondering how you can actually make a web app I suggest you check out the Edureka tutorial for Django web applications where you will be able to learn how you can make a web app from scratch guys so when I run my server I should be getting a URL guys so that's where I have to actually make the request so as you can see I have a city London over here specified first of all so when I open this first of all I have a heading which is saying what is the weather like then I have the icon which is saying it has broken clouds then there is London city name and the temperature in Fahrenheit so let's see if I can do that since I'm making request to the API when I change the city over here I should be getting the temperature of the city again so when I refresh this now as you can see I've changed the city as well but I'm getting the temperature of the city that I have just specified guys so as you can see how easy it is to make request to a web server and get these values so I'm making this request to this URL guys which I have specified over here open weather map API this provides us the API and I'm able to search for cities over there inside the request that I'm making and this is how you can actually make a simple Django app for calculating or getting the weather of a city using the request library guys
let's take a quick look at the time module and its built-in methods. The time module consists of all time related functions that are required to perform various operations using time. It also allows you to access several types of clocks required for various purposes. The time module begins recording time from the epoch. Epoch literally means a time in history and it begins on 1st January 1970. As you can see on the screen, I've listed down some of the most important functions that are available in this module. So talking about the first function, which is time, it returns the number of seconds that have passed since the epoch. The C time method returns the current data and time by taking the elapsed seconds as its parameter. Sleep tops the execution of a thread for a given period of time. The local time method returns the date and time in the struct time format by taking the number of seconds passed since the epoch as the parameter. GM time on the other hand returns the current date and time in the UTC format. The MK time method is inverse of local time. It can take a tuple of maximum nine parameters and returns the seconds passed since the epoch. And finally, the ASC time method, which can also take up to nine parameters and returns a string representing the same. Okay, so now I'll jump on to my Jupyter notebook and show you all how this works. So the first thing that you'll have to do is import the time module. So I'll say import time and I'll hit run. Okay, so first I'll be making use of the time method present in the time module. So I'll just say time dot time. And I'll hit run. So like I've already told you all this method returns the number of seconds that have passed since the epoch. So I'll hit run. Okay, so here is the number of seconds that have passed since the epoch. Now if I want to convert it to the current date and time, I can make use of the C type method. So I'll just have to use time dot C time. Now if I want to convert this into the current date and time, I can make use of the C time method. To do this, I'll just use time dot C time. And I'll have to pass the number of seconds as a parameter to this. So as you all can see on the screen, I've passed the number of seconds which was returned by the time method to the C time method and I've got the current date and time. If you want more information about these functions and methods, all you can do is use the help method. So I'll just say help time. And if I want to fetch data about the time method, I'll just say time dot time and I'll hit run. So as you all can see, it says that this method returns the current time in seconds since the epoch. Similarly, if you use help on any method or function, it will return the corresponding information about that function. Okay, so moving on, I'll be making use of the local time method and see what it returns. So I'll just say time dot local time. And I'll hit run. So as you can see on the screen, I've got the current date and time in the struct time format. Now to make you all understand what the struct time class is, let me get back to my presentation. Okay, so as you all can see, the struct time class basically has nine attributes starting from the year whose value starts from zero and goes up to 9999. The second attribute is month whose value will be anything from one to 12. After that is M day, which means the day of the month and the values can range anything from one to 31. Similarly, R minutes and seconds have the values 0 to 23, 0 to 59 and 0 to 61. The weekday value can be from 0 to 6 where 0 is Monday. Y day or year day can be anything between 1 to 366 and the final attribute is daylight saving time. It's 1 if it's summer, 0 if not and minus 1 if unknown. Okay, now that you're aware of what this struct time format is, let's come back and see what our output actually means. Year is 2019, month is 8th or August, the date today is 8th as well and so on. So I hope you're clear with this. Okay, so now in case you want to fetch the number of seconds that have passed since the epoch. So to do this, you can make use of the MK time method. Okay, so all I'm going to do over here is first store the local time in a variable say a and after that I'll take another variable b wherein I'll be using the mk time method and I'll pass the parameter to it as a finally I'll just print out b so as you can see on the screen the mk time method has returned the number of seconds that have passed since the epoch till now so now in case you want to fetch the current date and time 
from the struct time format and return it in local format you can make use of the ASC time method. So like I've already told you all before the local time method returns the current time in the struct time format. I'll be using the variable a which stores the struct time format of the current date and time to convert it to the local format and to do this I'll create some new variables a c and then I'll use ASC time method. So time dot ASC time. And I'll pass the parameter to it as a. And then I'll just print out C. Okay, so as you all can see over here, it has taken the struct format and has returned the local format of date and time. Python also allows you to format and pass strings using the strf time method and the strp time method. The strf time method can take a tuple containing nine parameters and returns a string representing the same depending on the format code used. The strp method passes a string and returns it in the struct time format. To show you all what these format codes are, I'll just use the help method and I'll pass time dot strf time as a parameter to this and I'll hit run. Oh, I've made a spelling mistake over here. Sorry guys, it's strf time. So as you all can see over here, I have a number of format codes which I can use to format my date time strings. Okay, so first let's make use of the strf time method. So as we all have seen, I've created a variable a in which I've stored the current time in the struct time format. So let me just print this out again. Okay, so now I want to format this output in a manner which is convenient for me. So to do this, I'll use the strf method. So I'll just say time. I'll take another variable say x is equal to time dot strf time. I'll use the strf time method within which I'll be using the format codes to format the date as per my choice. So first I want to print out the month. So I'll use the format code mod m. It's small m guys. Please be careful because this is case sensitive. And then between this I just want to see a slash. After this I'll just print the date. I'll use mod d and then the year. So I'll use mod y. Sorry for the spelling mistake. I'll just print X. So as you can see on the screen, I've returned the current date in the month day year format. Similarly, you can also pass a string and return it in the struct time format. To do this, you can make use of the strp time method. To do this, I'll take another variable say y and I'll pass a string to this. I'll say 8th August. 2019 and then I'll make use of the strp method to pass this string. So I'll just say time dot strp time and I'll pass y as a parameter to this and the format of it which is day month and year. Capital B means the full name of the month. And now hit run. Okay, so as you all can see over here, I've passed a string using the strp method and returned it in the struct time format. So now let's get back to our presentation and take a look at the date time module. The date time module is similar to the time module consisting of all the required methods that are essential for working with date and time. Some of the important methods present in this module are the date time method which is a constructor and it consists of two methods which is today and now that will return the current date and time. The date method will help you create a date and the time method will help you create time which includes hour, minutes, seconds, microseconds and the time zone information. The date time module also consists of a from stamp method which converts the seconds to return the corresponding date and time. Another very important function that's present in this module is time delta. Time delta basically returns a duration which will be the difference between two different times. Okay, so now let's get back to our Jupyter notebook and see how this module actually works. I'll just create a heading over here. Say date time. And I hit run. The first thing that I'll have to do is import this module. So I'll say import date time. After this, I'll be making use of the date time constructor to create some date. So I'll say date time. 
and then I'll pass some values to this starting with the year which is 2019 and the month as 6 date as 7 time as 4 minutes seconds and milliseconds and then I'll just print this out. So as you can see on the screen, I've created some random date using the date time constructor. Now, in case you want to fetch the current date and time, all you can do is use the today and the now methods like I've already told you all previously. So I'll say date time. So I'll just copy this. And then I'll use the today method. So as you can see over here, it has returned the current date and time along with milliseconds, which is very precise. I can also use the now method instead of today method over here. So I'll just say now and I hit run. So as you can see, both these methods return the current date and time. Now in case you want to access some particular value from this date, all you can do is use the attribute name to access that particular value. So in case I want to access the year and the month, all I can do is save this into a variable, say v, and then I can use v.year to access the year. So as you can see, I've accessed just the year from the current date. Similarly, you can access anything of your choice. So if I say print v.month and then I'll say print v.r and I'll hit run. So as you can see, the month and the hour have been returned. Similarly, you can access any values of your choice using these attributes. Now, in case you want to set only date without time, you can use the date method. So you just say date time dot date and then pass the date as a parameter. The time method can be used to create time without date. So I'll just say it's three hours, 45 minutes and 23 seconds. So now moving on towards time delta, which is a very important method that's present in this module. Like I've already told you all, this method represents a duration which can either be the sum or the difference between two different dates. Now to make use of this method, I'll just take some variable, say B1, and I'll say date time dot time delta. And I'll pass the number of days as 20 to this. You can also pass other parameters like microseconds, minutes, etc. Okay, I'll take another variable, say B2, and I'll use the same method again. And to this, I'll pass the number of days as 30. Now, I'll take another variable, say B3, within which I'll just store the difference of B1 and B2. So I'll say B1 minus B2, and then I'll print what is B3 and the type of B3. So as you can see over here, the difference between B1 and B2 is minus 10 days and the time since I've not specified anything is zero. And the type of B3 comes under the time delta class. Why exactly we use regular expressions? We are going to focus on various problems that regular expressions helps us to solve. So this is the first problem guys. So over here what happens, you have a log file. And from that log file, you want only date and time. And as you know, with the format of the log file is not understandable to everyone. So here's a guy who only wants date and time from that log file. So what he can do, he can make use of regular expressions, identify the pattern, and he can actually get the date and time for that particular log file. So this is the first problem. We'll see a lot of more problems which irregular expressions help us to solve. So we'll move forward and we'll see the second problem. Now this is the second problem that it helps us to solve. Imagine yourself as a salesperson and you have a lot of email addresses and many of them are fake. So what you can do, you can make use of regular expressions and all the email addresses have a particular pattern, they have a format. So with the help of regular expressions, you can verify that format and you'll get to know what all email addresses are correct and what all email addresses are fake ones. So as you can see, obviously schash.com is a fake email address. So using the pattern that is there in all the email addresses, you can verify whether that email address is correct or not with the help of regular expressions. All right, so let's move on and see what are the other problems. 
So this is the third problem that it helps us to solve. We'll take the same sales guy's example that we have taken in the previous slide. Now over here, that guy has a data of various customers' phone numbers. And we know that a lot of time people don't give the correct phone number because nobody wants a sales guy disturbing them at odd timings, right? So that salesperson has a problem. He wants to know that what all phone numbers are correct and what all phone numbers are fake. So every correct phone number will have a particular pattern or a format. So using regular expressions, he can identify what all phone numbers are correct and what all phone numbers are wrong. And at the same time, different phone numbers that belongs to different countries or different location will have a different format. So again, taking that thing into consideration, he can again use regular expressions and identify to which area it belongs to. Now in this particular example, what I've shown you is, I've shown you two geographical areas, one is India, another is USA. So with the help of regular expressions, you can actually find out what all phone numbers belong to USA and what all phone numbers belong to India. So I hope this is clear to you. So this is the fourth problem guys. Now over here what happens, you have a student database and that contains name, age, address. Now what happens, there are a lot of students who live in a particular area and the area code of that area is 59006. But what happened, the area code has been updated and it has become 59076. Now if you go manually update that for all the students, that will take a lot of time. So instead of that, what you can do, you can make use of regular expressions and find out all the area codes from the student database and after that you can replace it with the updated area code or the pin code. So as you can see with regular expressions you can even replace a particular string. We'll move forward and we'll see one more reason of using regular expression. So now this is one more reason to use regular expression because even if you don't have a Python background, if you have any other programming background like Java, PHP, C, Hash, Groovy, Swift, Ruby, you can use regular expressions because it is compatible with all of these programming languages. And it is even compatible with JavaScript, although it is not written here, but yeah, it is even compatible with JavaScript. So till now we have seen various reasons to use regular expressions. But I know you guys must be wondering what exactly regular expressions is, right? So don't worry guys, we'll move forward and we'll see what exactly regular expression is. So a regular expression is basically used for describing a search pattern. So you can use regular expression for searching a specific string in a large amount of data. You can even verify that that string has a proper format or not. You can find a string and replace it with another string. And you can even format the data into a proper form for importing, for example. So these are all uses of regular expressions. Now over here I've shown you an example. Here there's a string which is present in which they have written Janice is 22 and Theon is 33. Gabriel is 44 and Joe is 21. So as you can see, what all useful data that I can find from here? Only name and age. I don't want the rest of the things that are present in this string. So what I can do, I can identify a pattern and with the help of regular expression, I can convert that to a dictionary and in that dictionary, only the name and age will appear. Now my question is to you all guys, can you identify a pattern in order to get the name and age? Just give a guess. You just need to identify the pattern. Alright, so Sarah says all the ages are in the form of integers. Alright, Sarah, that's a very nice observation, but what about the names? Alright, so I've got a couple more answers and they say the same thing that the age is represented with the help of integer numbers, so you can get the integers. For the name, they have no idea how to get it. Don't worry guys, it's totally fine, just give a guess. Alright guys, so let me tell you. So basically, if you notice that every name starts with an uppercase first letter. So the first letter of all the names is an uppercase letter. And when you talk about age, all of the age are represented in numbers. So what you can do with the help of regular expression, you can actually find out the two digit numbers. And at the same time, you can find out the words that starts with an uppercase letter. And then it goes on to lowercase letters. And the star actually represents all of them. So you don't need to worry about the syntax that is there in front of your screen. I'll be actually explaining you these things in detail. So you don't need to worry about that. So I hope you have understood the pattern that I'm telling you. Alright, so we have a question from Devon. He's asking, what if this may contain a name of a place? Alright, Theon, so this string does not contain a name of a place. That's all I can say right now. If there was a place present here, then we have to look for a different pattern at that time. So basically with regex, you have to make sure that you identify the pattern for the string that you want. So it is very important. 
So let us move forward and I'll open my PyCharm and I'll tell you how to get age and name. All right. So let's do it. So this is my PyCharm guys. So over here what I need to do is I need to first import the module for regular expressions. For that I'll type import RE. And now I'm going to type in the string that was there in the example. So I'll type in name age equal to. And now I'm going to write it Janus is 22 and Theon is 33. Now the next line I'll write Gabriel is 44. Oops, I forgot the space. And Joey is 21. Now close it. So now for age I'm going to type in ages equal to. Now you don't need to worry about the syntax that I'm going to write. I'm going to tell you all these things in detail. So this is just an example that I'm giving you that with the help of regular expression you can actually get the name and age. After that I'm going to discuss each and every operation in detail. So what I'm going to type in you don't need to worry about that. I'm just showing you that you can actually do it. I'm just giving you an example. re dot find all are one comma three because all of my ages are two digits are of two digits and then write the name of the string and for names what are you gonna do you're gonna type in names equal to similar to that re dot find all r and my first letter is an uppercase letter that is between a to z after that i have lower cases so i'm going to type in a to z in lower cases and then I'm going to put in a star that will actually include all of those and uh, finally the name of that string that is name age. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a variable and I'm going to name it as age dict equal to curly braces. Let's keep it empty right now and now one more variable I'm going to define that is x is equal to zero. Now I'm going to use a for loop I'll type in for each name in names age dict each name ages x x plus equal to one now print this age dict yeah so if you are not able to understand what exactly for loop is and what are dictionaries so you can go and watch the previous tutorial videos on python and then come back again now let's go ahead and execute this. So yep, you have got the dictionary that includes only name and age of that person. So what I've done here is, what is the pattern? I'm repeating it again. So for all the names, the first letter is an uppercase letter and all the ages are expressed in terms of numbers. So using that pattern, I have got only name and age. So this is just an example. We'll actually see how to perform various operations using regex or regular expressions. So I'll go back to my slides. Now let's move forward and understand the cursor operation of regular expression. So basically in both strings and regular expression, both of them have their own cursors. So what happens is, suppose you are searching for R and your regular expression includes R. So your cursor is at R in the regular expression, but for text, it will check for B, it is not equal to R, then E, then E, then again. When it comes to R, it will see that this is what you are searching. So it'll stop right there. The moment you search for S, it'll go on and it'll come towards S. And same goes for N as well. So this is a pretty basic operation, but it will really help you to visualize how things work with regular expressions. So we'll move forward and we'll look at various operations that you can perform with regular expressions. So first we'll find a word in a string. So we have a string that says we need to inform him with the latest information and we need to find the word inform. So let us go ahead and execute this practically. I'll again open my PyCharm. So yeah, this is my PyCharm guys. Let me just first clear it. So let's begin by importing our regular expression module. So for that I'll type import re. And now we have a sentence and we want to find a word inform there. So what I'll do, I'll just type in if re.search inform and our string is we need to inform him with 
the latest information. So this is our string. Give a colon and now I'm going to type in print there is in form. So let me tell you what I've done here. First I've imported the regular expression module and after that I've defined a condition which says that if it is able to search in form in this particular string that is we need to inform him with the latest information then it will print there is inform otherwise it won't print anything. So as you can see that inform is present here so it should print there is inform. So let us go ahead and execute this. So yep you can see that it has printed there is inform. Now let's be more specific and suppose we want to find all the matches here. So let's write a method that will do it for us. So for that I'm going to use find all which will return a list of matches for me. So for that what I'm going to do is I'm going to write in here let me first remove this and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write in all in form which is nothing but a name that I've given you can give whatever name you want re dot find all and I've told you earlier as well find all will return a list of matches now over here what I need to find I need to find in form from which string the string is we need to inform him with the latest information all right guys and uh, so now I'm going to type in a for loop which says that for I in all inform give a colon print I that's it so now what I've done here you can see that I've imported the regular expression module then I'm using find all in which it will return all the matches and what I'm finding I'm finding inform and from which string I'm finding inform this is the string that I'm using and I finally I've used for in order to find all the matches so let's go ahead and execute this so yep it has found inform twice because you can see that it is available here as well inform and even information over here you can see that inform is present so this is how basically you find a word in a string by the help of a regular expression so let me first go back to my slides so we have seen how to find a word in a string next we are going to understand how to generate an iterator so basically what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the starting and the ending index for the word that I'm searching over here I'm searching inform so it'll give me the starting as well as the ending index for all the matches that it finds so let us go ahead and execute this practically I'll open my PyCharm once again let me remove all of this and over here I'm going to define a string so what I'm going to write here is I'm going to write here we need to inform him with the latest information yeah so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate an iterator by using find iterator and it is going to return the iterator of the matching object so basically I'll be printing the starting and the ending index of the matching object so for that I'll use the for loop so I'll write in for i in re dot find iterator and I want it for inform so I'll just type in inform and now I'm going to type in the name of the string that is str colon now I want that to be converted into a tuple so for that I'm going to type in locked up equal to i dot span and finally print locked up so basically it will print the starting and the ending index of the matching object so let us see if it does that so yep so as you can see that for inform the starting index is 11 and the ending index is 17 for information it starts with 38 and ends at 44 so this is how you can actually generate an iterator by using find iterator and this will return the starting as well as the ending index of the matching object so if you have any doubts you can write it down in your chat box it's pretty easy guys so we'll move forward and we'll have a look at the other operations that you can perform with regex so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to match words with a particular pattern so we have a string in which we have sat hat mat and pat so now my question is to you all guys what is the pattern that you can see in this particular string that is sat hat mat and pat so let me go ahead with it and I'm going to show you how you can match words with a particular pattern using regex so first I'm going to open my PyCharm let me remove all this 
So let me define a string once more. I'll type in str. So we have sat, mat, hat, mat, and we have bat. This is our string. Now I want to match anything that ends with at. So for that, I am going to define a variable all str. And now what I'm going to do is re dot find all. Now what I want, I want words that start with s, h, m, and p. All right. And after that, it should end with at. So I've written at. It's very simple, guys. And now what I'm going to type in, I'm going to type the name of the string that is str. So this bracket where I've written s, h, m, p. It shows that I'm matching specifically for the words that starts with S, H, M, and P. Now I'm again going to use a for loop in which I'm going to type in for I in all string. Give a colon, print I. It's that simple. Go ahead and execute this and see what happens. So yep, it prints hat, mat, and pat. But one thing to notice here, guys, it will not print sat. Why it is not printing sat? Because it is an uppercase letter. So if I go ahead and I make it as capital S and go ahead and execute this. So yep, you can see that even sat has been printed. So let me go back to my site and see what all other operations that we can perform with regular expressions. Now over here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to match series of range of characters. Now what does that mean? Let me explain you with the example that is there. So now what I want here is I want all the words in which the first letter is between the range H to M. So all the words whose first letter comes in the range H to M should be printed and it should be ending with at. So basically it should print hat and mat because P comes after M so does S. So it won't print sat and pat. Now let's go ahead and see in our PyCharm whether this happens or not. Now over here what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this S, so does P. Throw in a hyphen here and execute this. So yep, it has printed hat and mat. So if I want all these things to be printed, what I can do is I can write in here Z and execute this. So yep, it has printed hat, mat, and part. But it has not printed sat. Why? Because it starts with an uppercase S. So if I make it as S and I'm going to print this, so yep, it has printed sat as well. Because between H to Z, all S, H, M, and P lies. So it has printed all the range of characters whose first letter is present in the range H to Z. So now I can use a caret symbol that will include all the words apart from ones which have the first letter between the range H to M. So let me first make it as M and now I'm going to use a caret symbol. Yeah. So when I use this caret symbol, this means everything apart from this range that is H to M. Go on and execute this and you can see it has printed sat and pat but not hat and mat because of the caret symbol that I've just shown you, right? So I hope you all are clear with how to actually find a range of characters in a string. And now what I want, I want to replace a particular string. So as you can see in the example, I have a string in which we have hat, rat, mat, and pat. But I want to replace this rat. I don't like rats. All right, so jokes apart, I want to replace this rat and I want to replace it with the word food. Now let me show you how actually you can do that. I'll again open my PyCharm. Let me first remove all of this. I'll define a string, I'll name it as food, although there won't be any food items in it, but yeah, just for the demonstration purpose, hat, rat, mat, and pat. Now I will replace rat with food. So now I'm going to compile our regular expression into what are called pattern objects. And pattern objects provides us with additional methods and one of which is substitute. Let me show you how you can do that, just type in regex for example yeah regex equal to re dot compile and i want to compile r which ends with at and now in the string food i want to substitute it so i'll type in regex dot sub what i want to substitute i want to substitute food 
in which string I want to substitute. I want to do that in the string food itself. So yeah. And now finally go on and print it. So as you can see we have hat, food, mat and part. So we have replaced rat with food. So this is a pretty simple example that I'm giving you right now but with these basics you can actually go on and find out a pattern and you can perform a lot of operations. Now there's one very important thing that I want to talk about. It is called solving the backslash problems. Now let me show you what I'm talking about. So I have a string, let me name it as a random string. So I'll write it rand str equal to here is drogba. All right. So when I go on and print this, let me show you what comes. So we got only single backslash, but we have typed in here double backslashes. So this is what I'm talking about. Now in order to solve this problem, what I can do is I can make use of regular expressions. So let me show you how you can do that. So all you need to do is you need to type in re.search. So this is re is basically we call it as a raw string. So raw string will treat backslashes as special. So let me show you how it will do. I'll just type in re.search then r quotation drogba comma and the name of the string that is random string. Go ahead and execute this. So yeah, it has solved our problem and you can see that double backslash appears over here. So this is what I'm talking about the backslash problem. All right, so we have no doubts. Let me open my slides again and we'll have a look at the other operations that you can perform with random strings, with, that you can perform with regular expressions. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to match a single character. So I have one, two, three, four, five as my string and now I want to print only the fifth digit. So it should print five. But before that we'll have a look at a couple more examples in which I'll be telling you about how to deal with white spaces. So let me open my PyCharm again. Let me remove all of this. Yeah. So now I'm going to define one more string. Let me name it as random string equal to keep the blue flag flying high and Chelsea, this is nothing but my favorite club. And let me just print this random string. So that's printed, keep the blue flag flying high. Now let's go ahead and remove the new lines with the space. So for that what I need to do is, again I'm going to define a variable, let me name it as regex equal to re.compile. We have talked about compile in the previous example so I hope you can remember it. So the symbol for new line that is a backslash n. Then I'm going to type in the random string equal to regex substitute it with what? What do you want to substitute it with? Just a space right? So just give a space in between. That's pretty easy and just type in here random string. Now go ahead and print this random string. Yeah. So as you can see earlier it was like this. Keep the blue flag in one line, flying high in one line, Chelsea in one line. But with, with the help of regular expression I have replaced the new lines with a space. So this is how you can work out with uh, white spaces. So this is how you can work with white spaces. Now there are other white spaces that you'll be able to work with. For example, let me just show you. So you have a backslash B that stands for what? It stands for backspace. Then you have backslash F for form feed. Then you have backslash R for carriage return. Similarly you have backslash T for tab and you have vertical tabs as well. So for that we have backslash V, vertical tab. So these are the white spaces that you can work with. 
Now let's see how to match a single character that we have discussed in our slides. So let me first remove all of this. All right. So let me define one more variable. I'll name it as random string again. And I'm going to type in here 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And now what I'm going to type in, I'm going to type in print matches. I'm going to give a colon and then I'll type in length re dot find all backslash t in a random string. Now over here you can notice that we have backslash t. So basically this backslash d will match any numbers, any any numbers which are present. But if I write a capital D over here, so it will match anything but a number. So let me keep it as backslash D and print this and show you what it will give us. So we have five matches. As you can see that we have five digits. Now if I make it as capital D, so that will return me everything but the digits. So let me just show you. I've converted this to capital D. Go on and execute this. So we have zero matches now. So now if I want to match a specific digit, I'll be using curly braces. So let me show you how you are going to do it. So in the curly braces, just type in 5 and it should print that for us. So yep, it has found one match that is present over here. So I'll now what I'll do, I'll clear this again and I'm going to define in one more variable. Say let it be num. Over here I have 1, 2, 3. Then I have 1, 2, 3, 4. Then I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. Now we can even match digits with a certain range. Let's say our range is between 5 to 7. So for that what I'm going to type in, I'm going to type in a print statement and again I keep it as matches, give a comma and now I'm going to type in length re dot find all. What I'm searching for, I'm searching for digits so backslash d and what is my range? Range is between 5 to 7. Give a comma and then type in the string name that is num. Go ahead, execute this and it finds three matches because over here we have 5, over here we have 5 and 6, over here we have 5, 6 and 7. So it has found the three matches that we were talking about. So this is how you can perform basic operations using regular expressions. Now we have seen all basic operations that you can perform with regular expressions. Now how about I show you what are the various applications of regular expressions. I'm going to take in some use cases, a problem statement and I'm going to show you how you can use regular expressions in order to solve those problems. How about that guys? Alright, so I see a lot of people are interested in that. So without any further ado, let us move forward and see how you can do that. Alright, so we have a first problem in which we need to verify the phone numbers. So we have a list of phone numbers and the general format of a phone number is it should start with three digits then a hyphen sign then three middle digits and the three digits in between and a sign and then four digits in the end. So this is what our basic format of a number is. So let us go back to our pie charm and verify these numbers with the help of regular expressions. Let me remove all this. So before I start writing down the code let me explain you something. So we have backslash w. So basically what it does is it is same as writing down lowercase a to z, uppercase a to z, even numbers and underscore. So lowercase w is actually equal to this thing that I've typed here. So it will match anything that is inside the brackets. When we talk about uppercase backslash w, it will match anything but the things inside the braces. So it is similar to using a caret inside the brace. So I'll just show you. So it will match everything but the things that are present inside the braces. So this is what I'm going to use in in order to write the code for validating phone numbers. So let me just uh, make a string that has my phone numbers. So I'll just type in as phone and I'll put here 412 and say 1212. All right. Now I'm going to use a condition statement that says if re.search 
So anything that has three digits, then it should have a hyphen sign. Then again, anything that has three digits, then again a hyphen sign, and anything that has four digits. Give a colon, go on and print it is a phone number. Now basically instead of backslash W, I can even use as backslash D because all of these are digits. But let me just keep it as backslash W only and go on and print this. So yep, it is a phone number. But what if I am going to change here and I am going to make it as triple five one. Let me show you, it is not printing anything because, so because our regular expression says that it will take only three digits. Now as I've told you earlier as well, W takes A to Z lowercase and uppercase as well. So even if I replace it with D, it won't matter. Let me show you, go on, execute this. So yeah, it has not printed anything, but if I go on and remove this one and print it again, so yep, it has printed a phone number. Now if I would have added here, a as well it won't print that so yeah so basically I wanted to tell you what backslash W is that's why I've written it over here now let me tell you a use case of this backslash W as well so if you want to see that a full name is a valid full name or not so what you can do is you can use backslash W at that time so basically why I've explained you backslash W is this is how you can use backslash W all right I'll give you one more example so now let me remove all of this and now we'll see if the full name is valid or not. Basically, there should be a space between first and last name. So for that, I'm going to use a backslash s, which is same as writing down backslash f, that is form feed, or a backslash n, that is a new line, or a backslash r, that is a carriage return, or a back backslash t, that is tab or vertical tabs so it is pretty much similar to that so it is exactly the same similarly if I write here an uppercase s can you guess what it will be all right so everybody almost guessed it so basically it will be equal to a caret and form feed new line backslash r tab as well as vertical tabs so it will include anything but backslash f backslash n backslash r backslash t and backslash v let me just comment this all right so now let us go ahead and validate whether a valid full name is present or not so for that what i'm going to do is i'm going to type in a condition if re dot search now over here what i need to do is can you guys tell me all right so first i'm going to type in w and range of W should be between 2 to 20 then in between I want a space so I can just type in as now in between what I want I can have either a new line or a tab or a vertical tab anything like that so I can give a backslash s and one more backslash W for the last name and the range of the last name can be from 2 to 20 and finally, I'm going to write the name. I'm going to write my own name. Give a colon and print full name is valid. Go ahead and execute this. So yep, as you can see that it has printed, the full name is valid. So if I convert this lowercase s to an uppercase s, it will basically be equal to a caret and form feed, new line, vertical tabs, tabs. So anything apart from all of these. So I hope you have understood the concept that I've explained you till now. All right, so we have no doubt. So now I'm going to move back to my presentation again. So now this was one use case. Now a second use case is we need to verify the email addresses. So our email addresses should have 1 to 20 lowercase and uppercase letters, numbers plus, period, underscore, percentage, plus, minus. It should have an at the rate symbol. Then again, 2 to 20 lowercase and uppercase letters, numbers, plus, period, and a hyphen. Then we should have one more period and then a 2 to 3 lowercase and uppercase letters. 
So let me go ahead and show you practically how you can do it. Let me remove all of this and let me first write a list of emails. So you can write it as sk at the rate aol.com. I can have md at the rate dot com at the rate seo dot com. Now I can have one more and I can name it as dc at the rate dot com. Let me just remove the space. All right. So now what I'll type in, I'll type in print email matches, give a colon. And after the space, I'm going to type in length re dot find all. Open the parentheses and over there in the square braces, what I want first, I want anything. Then I want a period. I want underscore percentage plus hyphen close the braces and it should range between say 1 to 20. After that what I want I want at the rate. After at the rate I want anything so for that I'll type backslash w dot that is period then I want a hyphen and what should be the range it should be between 2 to 20 characters. After that I want a period and then I want uppercase and lowercase letters then it should range between 2 to 3. Email. Alright guys. Go ahead and execute this. So it has found only one match. So which is sk at the rate aol.com. Now if I actually copy paste this once more in the end and print this. So yep we have two matches. So this is how you can match the email address. You just need to identify the format of it and you can do it. Alright, so we have no doubts. Now let us move forward and see the third application of Python regular expressions. So you can perform web scraping using regular expressions. Now what is web scraping? Let me explain you with a flow diagram that is there in front of your screen. So we have websites, right? And obviously these websites contain multiple web pages. Now if I want to scrape some useful information from those web pages, I can use web scraping and extract that content and I can save it wherever I want. I can save it in an XML format or a CSV, basically however I want to save. So you can do that with Python regular expressions. So in our case what we are going to do, there is a website and on that website we have phone numbers, we have addresses. So what we are going to do, we are going to write a code in order to get only the contact numbers from there. And how are we going to do that? We are going to do that with the help of a regular expression. So for that I'm again going to open my PyCharm. So guys I've already written the code. So over here uh, I've imported a couple of libraries in the beginning which are used to perform web scraping. I mean they are used basically to read the web page. Uh, then we have uh, find all which we have discussed earlier as well. Now this is the URL that I'm talking about right. So let me just uh, copy this and I'm going to show you to you in my browser how it looks like. So this is how our web page looks like. So we have name here, we have the address, then finally we have the phone number. Now notice a pattern in the phone number. We have three digits inside the parenthesis, then again we have three digits, then we have a hyphen, and then finally we have four digits. Just keep this pattern in mind and we are going to write a code in order to scrape only the phone numbers from this particular website. Now let me close right now. Alright, fine. So now you've seen the URL, right? So uh, apart from that, whatever things that are there, actually we have covered that in the web scraping tutorial, so you are pretty much aware about it. So what is this? Uh, we are basically reading the content that is there in our particular website. Now we'll focus on the regular expression part, so you know what exactly find all is, we have discussed that. Now since we want only digits, so we are going to make use of this particular identifier and inside the curly braces, I have written three, which means that there will be three digits inside the parenthesis. After that there is a space, then again we have three digits then we have a hyphen and then finally we have four digits. Then save it in HTML STR and then finally print it. Now let us go ahead and execute this and see what happens. So we have scraped all the phone numbers that were there. This is how it looks like and we made use of regular expressions. So you can use regular expressions for web scraping as well.
why we require file handling. Well guys, think about this situation. You have a server running and you need to give access to someone who needs to access it remotely, right? Or basically you need to work with these files in general and say you need you need to have some import into your program where you're actually configuring an input for it. Well, if I had to answer this personally, how would I go about it? I would be using files for a lot of my deep learning models to import my data sets into the program at all the time. So basically by doing this, I'll be making use of files a lot. So coming back to the basics again, how can we input something into Python? The standard input, the usual keyboard input, right? So you can key in anything you want. Well, there's another case as well. Maybe even command line arguments to input some parameters into the code, correct? But what if you had to read lots and lots of data, which is not practical to type in at every point of time, or even that it doesn't make sense at all to type it all the time. The easiest way out of this here is to actually store whatever input you want in one place and keep using it as long as your requirement is met. So what's the answer? The answer is files, guys. So guys, this concept is actually very easy. I'm sure everyone who's joined will take away some really interesting stuff about Python that you can practically use. Working with files basically opens another door among thousands and each door with Python opens up to n number of opportunities again. So now that we're good with this and we started off on a really high roll, let's keep it going. Next, we'll be taking a look at some of the types of files available in Python. So guys, Let's keep the session very interactive. Head to the comments section and keep the energy going. So can you quickly name all of the types of the files that you know? So again, let me help you here. So we have images, we have audio, we have video, we have text, we have script and so much more, right? There is a key difference here I want you guys to note. Check this out. Windows supports all of these files that I told and more. Well, virtually unlimited to be honest. But again, I won't get ahead of myself here because there are limitations here as well. Now check out Python. There are two types of files, binary and text. So whatever is not text is binary, as simple as that. So either a file gets to be a binary which contains obviously zeros and ones, or it can have some literal text. Well, text as in strings or anything valid for that matter. Text files are structured as a sequence of lines where each line includes a sequence of characters. And this is what we call as code or syntax, right? And every line is terminated with a special character, what we call as the EOL. What is the EOL? Guys, it's the end of line character. A binary file is any type of file which is not a text file as I mentioned. And because of their nature, binary files can only be processed by an application that knows and understands this file system structure. In other words, they must be applications that can read and interpret binary, right? And now that we know what are the types of files are, so we can start looking into more of this. Guys, formally speaking, I think it can be consolidated as the operations performed on a file, right? So what all can we do? Check this out. It's called as the CRUD operations. What is CRUD? Well, create, read, update and delete guys. These are the operations which can be done with files. Well, again, there are many other operations as well, such as copying a file, changing the properties of a file or anything. But for simplicity's sake, I have planned to keep this session really easy for all of the audience. So let us dive into Python now. So let us quickly see how we can go about understanding the file handling capabilities of Python. Check out this flow diagram to give you a quick picture of what needs to be done. First, we create a file and later we open that file. We work on the file. Well, working on it is basically reading or writing or anything for that matter. And lastly, we close the file when we are done using it. Coming to Python now, 
Creation of a file can be done manually by the user or through Python. For now, let us consider that we will do it manually by going into the location and creating a file, say like a text file. Later in this session, I'll show you how easy it is to make Python create the file for us. So make sure you stay tuned till the end. So now we concentrate on how we can open a file with Python. Guys, it is very simple. So we have an inbuilt function called as the open function, which is used for this exact purpose. The open function takes in two parameters as seen here. One is the file name and other is the mode. And this on your screen is the syntax for the open function. So what do the two parameters mean? One is the file name that you want to open. It can be anything at this point of time, right? So it has to contain the extension of the file type as well. So this is compulsory and important. So make sure you keep this in your mind. And second, we have the mode. We know this means something that has to do with opening the file, right? So check the, check the screen. So basically these are various modes available to open a file. We can open it in the read mode, the write mode, the append mode, and even the create mode as well. Pretty straightforward. But do note that, that the default mode is always the read mode. And guys, note that you can open a file in read mode only if it exists as well. If you try to read a file or something that doesn't exist, then Python will greet you with a beautiful error message. And in addition, if you want to specify if the file should be handled as a binary or a text mode, then along with the mode as well, we can actually push in two categories for it. Check this out. So we have T for text and B for binary. T is the default value and B is for binary modes. So we can have something as WT. So what does it mean? So it basically says that the file needs to be opened in the write mode and the file that the Python opening is a text file. So we're basically making the job of Python to be really easy in this case. So check out the example code I have here for you guys. Even if we do not give a mode, as I said, the default is the read mode. So these two tiny snippets I have for you are one and the same. And yet, make sure something exists before reading that guys, or else you're sure to hit that error. So check this out, right? So I have f equal to open and the file name is demo file.txt. I don't have a mode here. This is exactly equal to having the read mode in the next example. And it is as simple and straightforward as that. So now we know how we can actually create a file and open it, right? So let's begin working on it. Let us start with creating on how we can actually do a read operation using Python. So the read operation is very easy, guys. So basically, just like all the other functions and handling files in Python, we make use of the read function for this very purpose. But then again, there are so many ways to read a file too. So let me so let me break it down for you all, right? So we can do many things here. We can read an entire file or read a few characters or read a few lines or any number of characters and lines together and so on. Check out this example code here. So we have a variable, right? It's, we call it file. And then we are opening the file. It's called textfile.txt and opening it in the read mode. Later, we are actually going to make use of the print function to read the contents of the file and print the same on the Python console. Now, similar to the previous code that I just showed you, we have something slightly different here. Can you notice that five on your screen? What do you think the five indicates here, guys? Let me help you out. So it basically tells the Python interpreter to read the first five characters from the file and nothing else. Now check the old syntax. So here we don't have the five. So we are basically telling the interpreter to read every single valid character present in our file and print it out for us. So you got a good picture of what is happening with the file now? Well, let's quickly take a tour into seeing this practically. So I'll open up my PyCharm now, which I use as the IDE to work with Python, where I'll show you the code for all of these. Guys, you can basically make use of any IDEs that you're comfortable with and even the console as well. It is your call. 
I am comfortable working with PyCharm, so I'll go ahead with that. So let me quickly open up the IDE and we can see the basic code to read the file. So as you can check out, I'm here in my PyCharm right now. Importing the OS module is the first line. This is currently being unused right now, but I'm going to talk about this in the future session. So basically, we're opening a file, right? So we have a variable file. We're going to open it and we're providing the entire path to the file present. So here, the file is demofile.txt. This is the name of the file. W is the write mode that I already told you about. Let me quickly go ahead and run this. That ran fine. But you cannot see anything on the output, right? That is because we just opened it, overwrote everything that is present in the file and we just closed it. So we're not seeing absolutely anything here. Check out example two, importing the OS module, file equal to open. Again, we are providing the same file. Here we had write mode and now we are having the read mode. And here we are actually printing it using the file.read. Again, I'll be walking you through file.read in a second, but right now all you need to know is this will print the output on the screen for us. If I go ahead and actually run it, nothing is going to be printed. Why do you think this happened? This happened because we actually used the write mode and we actually blanked out the entire file. Quick fix is to actually open the file. As you can see, nothing is present there. So let me type in something. So we love Edureka. Let me save that, quickly minimize it, go back to my PyCharm. Now, as soon as I run this, it is supposed to give me that exact output which says we love Edureka. Perfect, right? So with absolutely three to two lines of code, you can actually print something on your screen. How simple is this, guys? Well, check out the next case. So again, it's the same thing, opening the file using the read mode, and then you're printing file.read of five. Guys, file.read of five, right? So I actually explained this to you. So let me just go ahead and run it. We'll check the output. We got the first five character, right? So W, E, a blank space, L and O. Uh, let us try to make it more nice to look at. Let me just quickly open up the file. Uh, hello world. This is a perfect candidate for our example. Uh, yep, the quick typo. Uh, save it. Exit back into the code. Now I'm going to run this old code, right? So you're going to get the entire output here. Check it out. Hello world. Perfect. Because we have read of blank. Now we're going to actually run this. Because we're telling the interpreter to read only the first five characters of the first line for us, it is just printing hello. How simple is this, guys? So now that we are actually done with this, let's quickly jump back to the presentation to see what's next. Well, guys, next, I want you guys to check out this syntax, right? So this is what I love about Python. Amazing readability and you can almost guess what it means and you can be certain of it, say, 90% of the time. So we saw how to read characters. Now let us look at how we can read lines. Well, read line will actually read each of the lines and give us a line by line output. Read line of three will tell the Python interpreter to read only the third line and absolutely nothing else. But what if we wanted to return every line in a file which is properly separated and nice to look at? Well, you can actually use the same function only in a new form. This is called as file.readlines function. Again, let's take a quick jump back into the code so we can see this in action. So check out example four on your screen. I have the same file demo file.txt. I'm opening it in the read mode and I'm using read line. As soon as I go ahead and run this, I will have the same output as hello world. Okay, let us step it up a little. Let me just change this. Hello world. We love Python. And we love Edureka. So I have three lines here. All good, right? So I'm going to save it. I'm going to close it. I'm going to come back here. I'm going to run the read line. Again, we're reading only the first line. Cool. Check out example five now. This is where things get interesting. 
import again it's it's all the same guys so basically instead of the read line i have read lines over here so the s is extra and it's going to read all of these lines and it is going to put it in a really beautiful way for us to see check this out hello world is an entity we love python is an entity we love edureka is another entity and that's nice to look at right so instead of just get, getting a gibberish output of everything in the line separating it actually makes a lot of sense so now that we're done with this another quick hop back to our presentation so guys next we need to check out a tiny concept on how we can actually loop over a file object well this is another simple concept so let me teach you this we're using the for loop for this very purpose as shown but why would we want to do this when you want to read or return all the lines from a file in a more memory efficient way and in a faster manner you need to use the loop over method so the advantage of using this method is that the related code is both really simple and easy to understand right so let me take another quick jump into pycharm and check the single snippet out so we are back into pycharm and check out this for loop example i have for you so again we're sitting on the same file demo file.txt reading it in the mode so for every line in our file object print read lines so it is going to print the output for us containing all of the documents of our file as you can see we love python and we love edureka that's really simple right and with this we are actually done understanding how to open the files and read them in multiple ways next we need to actually take a look at the write operation which is again very simple and almost similar to the read method let's start writing to a file is as simple as using the write function guys similar to the read again so to write to an existing file we make use of two modes one is the append and the other is write which we already checked out earlier by append we actually add the contents of the write to a new existing content and with write we just add it to the blank file now i am sure there is a question in your mind right now so what if the file that i'm trying to work on is not blank what if it contains some previous data and we make use of w instead of append guys this will basically delete everything in the file and overwrite it with what we've just put and this is exactly the first example case that i actually showed you so make sure that you use the mode very wisely in every situation right so here's a quick example before we dive right back into code as you can see we open a file in the write mode and we write two lines into it and we close it it is as simple as that right now again taking you back to pycharm and let me walk you through the code So guys, we are back into Pycharm right now. So check out the first example I have for you. Import OS, I already explained. Opening it in the mode of write. So since we already have some content, all of that content will be overridden with hello world and hello world again. So we're opening it. We're using file dot write to write two content into it, and then we're going to close it. Let me run this again. No output because we are not printing it to our console. How do we check if everything is working? Open the demo file. hello world and hello world again right so this is exactly what we wanted but then again this looks a bit gibberish as i told you right so we use read lines to actually make it look nice for us heading back to pycharm again check out the next example i have for you so now this is to prove that we are actually overwriting it again which i've already told you and it is simple but still let me walk you through this so we are working on the same file we are using the w mode and then we are writing it to it saying oops we have overwritten it run it it ran no output but in the sense the file is changed so it says oops overwritten instead of hello world and that old message that we printed let me get back to the pycharm again and this is for creation and we'll be coming back to this in just a second so let's quickly go back to our presentation and then we're going to be coming back to pycharm again so we're down to the last two concepts that we will check out in this session The first one among that is for us to create a new file using python. Well guys, even for the creation of the file, we need to make use of the open method. 
we already know that a is used for up and and w is used for write and now we have x which is used to create a file but do know that you cannot create two files of the same name guys so basically it means that you cannot create a file which already exists check out the example on your screen and you will definitely get a bet better picture of it right there so you cannot have two files with the same name test file dot text this is not right so again python will give you a beautiful error message and it won't be so beautiful at the end of it let me dive back to pycharm and we can check out the example over here uh let me change this we have something else right so let me type edureka dot text i'm going to print new file into edureka opening it we are opening it in the x mode so we are actually creating this file physically write mode to write something into it and close it so as it no output check out the file where is the file called edureka it is here new file of edureka so it's perfect right let me quickly head back to the presentation and we can check out what's next and then the next simple concept i have for you guys is showing you on how deletion operation works with respect to files using python guys deleting a file is very simple and straightforward we'll require the os dot remove function just for this purpose so yes importing the os module is a compulsion here i have been using it all along because it is just a good programming habit to use the os module when you're playing around with the file system the biggest mistake i have seen people do is that they usually go on to delete a file which doesn't exist again python pushes in an error message and that is not good at the end of the day right so it is very vital to know for sure that the file exists to do this we just check if the path exists and if it does cool remove the file else print that the file doesn't exist so you cannot remove it what does this say guys this is a very simple case of an exception handled by the user and this is a really good programming habit too so all good but can we delete a folder yes we definitely can a folder with all the content inside it can be deleted using the rmdir command what does rmdir stand for it basically stands for removing directory and the parameter here is basically the path and by the path it includes the name of the folder which needs to be removed and this is all of the operations you can do with python by making use of files introduction to python and mysql well as you already know python is one of the most widely used programming language and in demand among developers but you can't merely develop any application without having to know where to store the data so this is where database management system comes into picture and one of the most widely used dbms server that is also used in the industry practices is mysql db server let me move ahead and talk a bit about integrated connection all right guys this is just a glimpse of how the bigger picture will look like what i'm trying to do is i'm basically trying to integrate my python with my back end database server and then do the further manipulations now let me move ahead and explain you the internal working logic behind when you establish a connection between python and mysql db server or i can say that i'm basically going to explain you the internal working logic that how does it actually connect or work so as you can see there are numerous pictures given in this slide on my extreme right hand side there's a picture of a database and on my extreme left hand side there's a picture of a python application and in between lies the mysql connector python api so mysql connector python api is nothing but acts as a bridge between my front end python application and my back end database server now when i say this word python application think of any python application let's say suppose think of a website which a user has developed which lies in the front end Now my front end python application will basically send a connection request to the mysql connector python api then the api will forward the same request to the database further which the database will accept the request and send the connected message and then my python application will send a cursor connection request so over here think of connection as a method and cursor as an object which basically lets you communicate through your entire mysql db server and also lets you create your own database Finally my python application will execute a certain sql statement or a certain sql query and for that my backend database server will fetch the result data 
So guys, this was it with the internal working logic that basically works behind when the Python and MySQL DB server connection is taking place. Now let me move ahead and talk a bit about operations which I'm going to perform with Python and MySQL. So guys, I'm basically going to perform CRUD operations, which simply means create, read, update and delete with my Python and MySQL. So let me move ahead and show you the implementation of CRUD operations from coding point of view. So let me quickly open my PyCharm. All right. Guys, before diving deep into the coding perspective, my first and foremost step is to basically import the MySQL connector package. And how do I do that? I'll click on file, click on settings. Click on project interpreter on the extreme right hand side. There's a picture of a plus sign and then type here MySQL hyphen connector. All right. Click on MySQL hyphen connector. Click on install package. It will basically take a minute or two to get installed. Essentially, our first step is to install the MySQL hyphen connector package, which forms the stepping stone for our further operations, which I'm going to do again. It is it will take a minute or two to get installed. All right, so as you can see our package MySQL hyphen connector has been installed successfully. Now one of the other approach to install the same thing is suppose this is for those set of users who don't use any Python IDE. Suppose you're using a Python command line. So for them quickly open command prompt. Once your command prompt is opened quickly go there and type pip install mysql hyphen connector which is the package and press enter well it is going to show me or give me a message that is requirement already satisfied since i've already imported the package on my pycharm id but this demonstration i'm showing for those set of users who simply use python command line so for them you can go to your command prompt type pip install mysql hyphen connector your mysql hyphen connector package will be installed and then you can import your same package on your python command line and then you can move on with the further operations so now it's saying me a warning this is none of our concern guys let me just quickly close it and as i've already created a file under the name of python db creation i'll move on with my coding demonstration so let me enter the presentation mode and start off by writing my first line of code so the first line of code which I'm going to write over here is I'm simply going to import the package which I installed just now that is mysql hyphen connector. I'm sorry, it will be mysql dot connector. Now I'm going to create a local DB instance that is my DB under which I'm going to write mysql dot connector dot connect under which I'm going to pass in the three parameters that are host which is equal to your local host. Then comes the username that is equals to root. And then comes the password, which is equals to password one, two, three. So root is the default username, which I had given guys and password one, two, three can also be customized. So this is the password which I gave. Now I'll merely print this local DB instance. That is my DB quickly go ahead and run this code. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so as you can see the connection has taken place, but how do I verify whether the connection has been established successfully or not? So in order to do that, I'm just going to write two more lines of code. That is if my DB then print that is if it falls or if there's a local DB instance that is my DB, then I'm going to print connection successful else. I'm simply going to terminate this or I'm going to write print connection. That is if there's a local DB instance that is my DB is coming or under my DB it is coming or the parameters are there, then my connection will be successful else. My connection will be unsuccessful. Let me move ahead and run this code. Give me a minute guys. Well, as you can see, our connection is successful. Now I'll just change one parameter and see whether it's verifying that the connection will be established successfully or not. Now I'm going to change a parameter. Suppose I'm changing the root, which is the default name of user to Ram. And let's see if the connection is being established successfully or not, or it is being verified or not. 
Well, as you can see guys, it shares access denied for user RAM as because our default username was root, which I had given. So it will not be getting connected to our MySQL DB server. Now let me quickly write back root over here and move on by creating a database. So in order to do that, I'll quickly open file. I'll create a new Python file with the name as Python DB creation. Let me just name it Python DB one creation. Now I'm going to write my first line of code that is importing MySQL dot connector, which is the package. Then I'm going to write my DB is equals to MySQL dot connector dot connect under which I'm going to pass in the three parameters that are host, which is equals to your local host. Then comes your username that is equals to root and then comes my password that is equals to password one two three finally i'll move on and i'm going to show you what i'm going to do over here so i'm going to create an object with the name as my cursor under which i'm going to pass my db dot cursor which is pointing towards the location and finally i'm merely going to print this object that is my cursor dot execute under which i'm going to write create database and let me say my database name is HarshDB. All right. And then I'll quickly move ahead and run this code. Let's see what is the output. All right. So it says that the database has been created. That is HarshDB has been created. Now I'm going to show you whether this database is existing in our MySQL workbench or not. So in order to do that, I'll just change few parameters and add a for loop. I'll explain you about the for loop part later. So let me just omit this part HarshDB. And instead of create, I'll simply write show over here. And then over here, I'm going to write show databases. Now I'm going to write for DB in my cursor. I'll simply print the database. All right, move on and run Python DB1 creation file. Well, guys, as you can see from the output, the reason why I used a for loop over there is because once my code enters the for loop, it is basically printing all the databases which are existing in our MySQL workbench along with the database HushDB that we have just created, which is there in our output. So it's very clear. Now I'll quickly open my MySQL workbench and I'll write the same SQL query over there so that it's crystal clear to you. All right, let me quickly maximize it one second. Now let me simply write show databases and click on execute. One minute, guys. Well, as you can see, our database HarshDB has been created along with all the other databases which are existing in our MySQL workbench. Now, let me just refresh the schemas. All right. So, let me just minimize this and I'll move ahead by creating a table under the database. So, I think you guys are pretty clear with the concepts which I explained just now. I basically started off by creating or by establishing a connection between our Python and MySQL DB server. Further, I moved on and created a database, and now I am moving on and creating a table under the database HushDB. Now, how do I do that? Well, let me create a new file first. One second, I'll name it as create db and python. All right, all right, guys. Before moving ahead, I'm going to tell you one thing: the first three or four lines of code are going to be same everywhere. I don't find it useful by repeating the same first three lines of code everywhere again and again. I don't want to bore you guys with the same thing. So let me just copy paste it. Enter the presentation mode. Yeah. Control V. Now I'm going to write my cursor dot execute. It's going to be create table. Suppose I give my table's name as employee under which let me pass two parameters they'll be name varchar 200 salary integer 20 we just close it move on execute this code well i have done a very silly mistake guys and the error is also very self explanatory it says no database selected i'm going to pass a parameter over here it's going to be database is equals to harsh db and let me quickly move ahead and run this code. One second. Yeah. 
All right. So when I run this code, our table has been created. Now I'm going to show you the table which I've just created in our database HarshDB. So I'm going to write the same code what I wrote while I was showing you the database. So let me just omit these things and add an S over here. And instead of create, let me just add a show and let me type a for loop. So it will be for TV in my cursor print your table. All right, now let me move ahead and run this code. So as you can see, we have created only one table under the database HarshDB. So it is showing that table which is employee. Now I'll show you the table in our MySQL workbench. So one minute guys. So instead of databases, let me just write tables. Let me just select the HarshDB thing over here. Instead of databases, let me just write tables. Select HarshDB and then execute this. Yeah, so once I execute this, well, as you can see, it is fetching the table, and our table employee has been created on the extreme left hand side under the schemas column. Now, I'll quickly minimize this and I'll move ahead by doing the read operation. So, before I dive deep into the read operation, guys, let me give you a small introduction about this. So, our read operation will basically happen in two stages. In my first stage, I'm going to populate my table with some values. And in my second stage, which will be the main stage where I'm going to do the read operation consisting of two fetch functions. So I'm going to talk about the fetch functions later. First, let me just in order to populate my table, I'm going to make use of insert command from the SQL query. So let me just name it as insert op table and move ahead. Yeah, control V before there's one more parameter which I left. It's going to be database is equals to harsh db now moving on let me create a new variable with the name as sql form and under sql form i'm going to write the sql query insert into employee one second guys pass in the two parameters which i declared which were name and salary values and make use of or i'm going to write percent s comma percent s well guys these percent s are nothing but placeholders you can replace them anytime you want with any other value now i'm going to create a tuple now the reason why i'm creating a tuple is because again in my second stage where i'm doing the read operations i'm going to make use of two fetch functions so there's one fetch function called fetch all so when i'm making use of fetch all i need not populate my table with a single value because that will not look good that's the reason why I'm creating a tuple over here so that to give you more clarity into what actually happens. Now, let me just name it as Harshit. Let me give my salary as 20,000, comma, Amit, salary as 30,000, comma, Ankita, and her salary as 40,000, comma, space. Yep, I think I need to put this back. Now, when I move on, I'm going to simply write my cursor dot execute many because if I use execute, it is just going to execute a single value. But since I'm making use of a tuple over here, I need to write my cursor dot execute many and call in SQL form comma employees. And finally, I'm going to write my db dot commit, which is going to save my changes from my last executed SQL statement. Now, let me quickly move ahead and run this code. So as you can see our insert operation has taken place and our tuple has been inserted into the table employee under the database harsh db now i'll quickly exit the presentation mode and show you the same in our mysql workbench it's going to be the same thing i'm going to write select star from employee and click on employee click on execute one second guys Yeah, I'll click on the result grid over here. Well, guys, as you can see, this select star from harshdb.employee, well, it changes nothing. Our concern is to basically view the tuple which we have created, and that tuple is being viewed in the result grid that is under name and salary, the values which we pass that are Harshit, Amit, Ankita, with the salary as 20, 30, and 40,000. Let me quickly minimize this. And moving ahead, I'll be creating a new file. 
and let me just name this file as read op table all right now into the presentation mode once again copy the first three lines of code over here what i'm going to do is yeah let me pass the parameter database which is equals to hush db and then i'm going to start off my read operation by the first function that is fetch one so let me write my code and then side by side i'm going to explain you also why am i writing that part so i'm going to simply write my cursor dot execute let's say i'm going to write a sql query that is select name column from employee okay this is a very simple sql query and let me create a new variable and let me name it as my result under my result i'm going to write my cursor dot fetch one now guys this is one of the most important part of my code because this is the first function of read operation what fetch one is going to do is it is going to fetch me one value from the column name under the employee table all right now when i move on let me write the for loop that is for row in my result print the row and when i run this code as you can see it has fetched the value harshit from the row name under the table employee which is again under the database harsh db as you can see this code is pretty self explanatory when i make use of the fetch one function it basically fetches a single value from the column name under the table employee now let me just quickly move on with my next function of fetch in order to do that let me just make few changes in this code so instead of name suppose i'm going to fetch the whole tuple it's going to be select star from employee and instead of fetch one let me write here fetch all and let me run the for loop so it will be for row in my result print row all right now when i run this code i'll explain you why am i doing it or what does fetch all do well as you can see from the output the whole tuple has been fetched now when i make use of the fetch all function guides it basically fetches the whole tuple for us as because we are writing the sql query select star from employee so the, all the values which are there under the employee table which was in the form of a tuple when we inserted it a while ago while we were writing the insert code that whole tuple gets fetched now i'll exit the presentation mode i'll go to the mysql workbench and rerun this code once again well as you can see there are no differences the name is still there with the values harshita mitankita and salary 20000 30000 and 40000 suppose i write this thing select name from employee one second i'm going to show you the changes of the fetch one functions in order to do that let me just write name again over here name and instead of fetch all let me write fetch one all right Let me quickly go ahead and run this code. So as you can see, it is fetching here. Now I'll go to the MySQL workbench and click on same thing. Well, guys, uh, these changes are not taking place over here because uh, we were showing you the changes in the PyCharm, and since we applied a for loop over there, that's the reason why it is doing it. But since when we are using the backend database server, we need not do that because we are not using any loop or we are not doing anything. We are simply fetching the name whole column from the table employee. Now I'll move on and uh, do the update operation. So in order to do that, let me just create a new file, a new Python file. and name this as update pop table yeah let me close this let me just click on this enter presentation mode yeah control v let me pass the parameter which was database that is equals to hash db moving on let me create a new variable with the name as sql under which i'm going to write update uh, employee set uh one second salary let me set the salary to 70000 making use of the where clause where name is equals to let's say i'm updating ankita's salary to 70000 and finally i'm going to write my cursor dot one second 
execute call in the SQL thing and then write my DB dot comment you quickly go ahead and run this code our update operation has taken place and in order to see the changes let me quickly go back to the read operation I'll show you the changes on both places in the PyCharm and MySQL Workbench 2. So the last code which I wrote, let me remove this and right here select star from employee. This was fetch all. Okay, enter the presentation mode once again. Yeah, run this code. As you can see from the output, the changes have taken place and Ankita's salary is updated to 70,000, which was 40,000 before. I'll quickly move on and show the same changes in the MySQL Workbench. So it's quite easy. Let me just read on this code. Uh, this should be star over here. Yep. And then execute it. As you can see, Ankita's salary over here is again updated to 70,000. Now I'll move on and do the last operation that is delete operation, which will also conclude my tutorial. It's going to be delete op, let me name it as table. All right, enter the presentation mode once again. Copy the first three lines of code. I'll pass here the database parameter. Database is equals to harsh db. I'll move on and let me make use of the same variable which we used that time. Let's say, suppose delete from employee where name is equals to. Suppose I'm deleting my record, guys, which is harshit. And then my cursor dot execute all in SQL and then write my db dot commit, which is gonna save the changes from my last executed SQL statement. Let me quickly go ahead and run this code. Well, the database spelling which I use is wrong, I guess. Well, as you can see from the error, it's quite justified. It says unsupported argument data BAC. So the database spelling is wrong. Let me quickly rectify that. One second, guys. Yeah, I'm gonna write A over here. I missed it. My bad. And run this code once again. So as you can see, our delete operation has taken place, and I'm gonna show you the changes. Exit this. We'll go to read op. I'll enter the presentation mode once again. Run this code. Well, as you can see, the record Harshad has been deleted from here and the same thing would be or the same changes would have taken place in the MySQL workbench. Let me quickly open it and run this code once again. Well, as you can see, the record Harshad is deleted from here too. So what is NumPy? NumPy is basically a module or you can say a library that is available in Python for scientific computing. Now it contains a lot of things. It contains a powerful n-dimensional array object, then tools for integrating with C, C++. It is also very useful in linear algebra, Fourier transform and random number capabilities. Now let me tell you guys, NumPy can also be used as an efficient multi-dimensional container for data, for generic data. Now let me tell you what exactly is multi-dimensional array. Now over here, this picture actually depicts multi-dimensional array. So we have various elements that are stored in their respective memory locations. So we have one, two, three in their own memory locations. Now why is it two-dimensional? It is two-dimensional because it has rows as well as columns. So you can see we have three columns and we have four rows available. So that is the reason why it becomes a two-dimensional array. So if I would have had only one row, then I would have said that it is a one-dimensional array. But since it contains rows as well as columns, that is it is represented in a matrix form. That is why we call this as a two-dimensional array. So I hope we are clear with what exactly two-dimensional array is. So let me open my PyCharm and I'll tell you practically how to actually create a NumPy array. So this is my PyCharm guys. Over here, the first thing that you need to do is first install the NumPy module. And how you're going to do that, click on File, go to Settings tab and you'll see the Project Interpreter option. And on the right hand side, you'll see a plus symbol. Just go on and type the module that you want to install. So I'm going to install numpy. Just go there, click on it and install package. I've already done that, so I'm not going to repeat it. So this is my PyCharm. So first thing that I need to do is import numpy as np. Now after that, I need to create a numpy array. 
So for that, I'm going to define a variable, let it be a, and I'm going to type in here np dot array and certain elements inside it. So I'm going to put in one, two, three, and print it. That's all. So this will actually print a single dimensional array. So one, two, three has appeared. Now, if I want to convert this to a 2D array, so for that, I'll keep this in parenthesis. And after a comma, I'll add one more element and I'm going to give certain values inside that. So I can give, say, four, five, and six. Now go ahead and print this. So as you can see that it is now a two-dimensional array. So this is how you actually create arrays using NumPy module. So now I'm going to open my slides and we'll move forward and see what is our next topic. Now let us see why are we using NumPy instead of a list. All right, so many of you might be thinking why are we using NumPy when we have lists? All right, so basically we use NumPy because of three main reasons. The first thing is it occupies less memory when compared to lists. Then it is actually pretty fast when you compare it with list and at the same time it is very convenient to work with NumPy. So these are the three major advantages that NumPy has over lists and that is the reason why we use NumPy instead of lists. Now don't worry I'm actually going to prove it to you practically by opening my PyCharm. So guys this is my PyCharm again so first thing that I need to do is import NumPy as NP and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to import a couple of more modules I'm going to import time and I'm going to import sys all right done so our first step is to actually define a list and the name that I'm going to give to my list is say s and I'll type in here range thousand so what this will actually do it will actually take all the integer values between 0 to 1000 and it will give it to a variable s so this list will contain the integer values between 0 to 1000 but it won't include 1000 it will be only there till 999 that is 999 and now I'm going to print the space occupied by this particular list so for that what I need to do is I need to type in print sys dot get size of any one element okay so you can give three four five anything I'm going to give it as five any one element and multiply that with the length of my list that's all so this will actually give me the space that has been occupied by the list because sys dot get size of will actually give me the memory occupied by one element and when I multiply that with length of my list I get the entire memory that has been occupied by my list now the same I'm going to do with my numpy array as well let me give a name to that I'm going to type in d np dot a range and the range will be 1000. Now a range function is pretty much similar to the range which is there. So the same thing will happen here. The integer values between 0 to 1000 but it won't include 1000 will be present in my variable d. So we have created a numpy array. Now let us print the space occupied by it. So the first thing is I'm going to type in here d dot size. So this will actually give me the space occupied by one single element and when I multiply that with the length of my numpy array I get the entire memory that is occupied by the numpy array so I'm going to type in here d dot item size that's all now go ahead and print this so this actually shows the memory that has been occupied by my list and this shows the memory that has been occupied by my numpy array so as you can see there is a quite a lot of difference between both of them so we have proved our first point that it actually occupies less memory. Now when I talk about NumPy array is faster and more convenient than a list. So the next step is I'm going to prove it to you that NumPy array is actually faster and more convenient than list. So I'll remove all of this and so now I'm going to show you that NumPy arrays are faster than list. And at the same time it is easier and more convenient in order to work with NumPy arrays when compared to list. Let me show you practically. So first what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a variable say size which is equal to say 1000 and then I'm going to define two lists. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add those two lists as well as I'm going to add two numpy arrays which I'm going to define now. And then I'm going to compare the time taken in order to find the sum for list and the sum for numpy arrays. So first let me define two lists and two arrays. So my first list will be equal to range size same goes for my second list as well 
just change the name to L2 and now I'm going to define two numpy virus a1 equal to np dot a range size go ahead and do the same for the second numpy array as well and change the name as a2 so we have two lists and two arrays and we need to compute the sum of both of these lists as well as arrays now before that I'm going to define a variable say start which is equals to time dot time and now I'm going to calculate the sum so I'm going to save that in result and first I'm going to calculate the sum of list that is L1 and L2 so for that what I need to do is I need to run a for loop because if I directly write L1 plus L2 it is going to give me a result which is nothing but the concatenation of both the lists so in order to calculate the sum I need to use for loop let me show you how to do that first I'm going to type in X comma Y and we have already studied loops in detail for X comma Y in zip and the name of the two lists that is L1 comma L2 that's all so what will happen here it will first take the first element of list L1 and then it will take the first element of list L2 it will go in it will calculate the sum and it will store in result and it will keep on repeating until the range has been exceeded now this is how you calculate sum in list but when you talk about arrays what you need to do is you need to just write in a1 plus a2 that's all that's why I'm saying that it is more convenient in order to work with numpy arrays when compared to lists now our next step is now our next step is to define the same variable start and initialize it with time dot time and now I'm going to find the sum of my two numpy arrays which is nothing but a1 plus a2 that's all and now print the time taken so print time dot time minus start and then multiply it with thousand because by default it will take it in seconds and I need to convert it into milliseconds now I forgot to actually print the same thing for my list so I'm going to do it over here so this will actually give me the time taken by my list in order to compute the sum and this statement will give me the time taken by my numpy array in order to compute the sum so let us go ahead and execute this and we'll see what happens so it gives me zero milliseconds because the size is small let me just add a couple more zeros uh, let's make it a million now go ahead and execute this now you can notice the difference that there is a significant change lists took 208 milliseconds whereas numpy array took almost 67 milliseconds so there's a huge difference between the compute time of a list as well as numpy array that's why I say that numpy array are faster convenient and at the same time they occupy less space when compared to list so that is the reason why we choose numpy arrays over list so let us go ahead and move forward towards the next topic that is numpy operations so let me go back to my slides so now is the time to see various operations that you can perform with the numpy arrays so you can find the dimension of your array whether it is a two dimensional or a single dimensional array then you can even calculate the byte size of each element it is pretty easy I'm going to tell you that practically you don't need to worry about that and you can even find the data types of the elements that are stored in your array so if you want to know what is the data type of the elements you can do that as well so let me show you these three operations first and then we'll move forward to the other operations I'm going to open my PyCharm once more guys let me remove all of this so we have imported the numpy module now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define a numpy array I'm going to name it as a and I'll write here np dot array 1 comma 2 comma 3 put that in parenthesis now add one more element say 2 comma 3 comma 4 all right so it's a two dimensional array now if I want to know whether it's a two dimensional or a single dimensional array so I'm just going to type in print a dot and it'll give me the dimension so let me show you that and I'm going to run this so it says 2 that means it is a two dimensional array so what if I move this part and make it as a single dimensional array it should give us the result as 1 let's see if it does that or not and yep it gives us 1 as a result so this is how you actually calculate the dimension of your array now if you want to find the byte size of each of the elements so what you need to do is instead of endm you can call a function called item size go ahead execute this 
and you'll get so each element occupies four bytes after that if you want to know the data type that is stored in the array so you can just type in here d type go ahead execute this it should give us integers integers 32 bit all right so this is how you can actually perform these three functions that i've told you in my slides so let us proceed with the presentation now let us move forward and see what are the other operations that you can perform with numpy module so by using numpy array you can actually find the size of your array how you can do that that i'll show you practically you don't need to worry about that so when i say size of the array that means the total number of elements that are present in the array so if this is an array so the total number of elements become four one two three and four now you can even find the shape of your array now what do you mean by shape so basically the total number of columns and rows now over here we have three columns and four rows so our shape is actually three columns and four rows now let me show you practically how you can do that again i'm going to open my pie charm and show you let me remove this print statement from here now if i want to find the size of my numpy array i just need to type in print a dot size that's all you have to do and it'll give the size of your array so there are three elements so if i go on and add some more elements say four five six seven then if i execute this you'll see that seven elements have appeared that means the total number of elements in my array is seven then comes the shape part that i was talking about so in order to find the shape what you can do is you can just type in here a dot shape and it'll give you the shape so let us see what happens so it has seven columns but there are no rows so it has given seven comma blank so what i can do is i can close this in parenthesis and i can define one more element say eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen fourteen go ahead and execute this and you can see two comma seven because we have two rows and seven columns available with us so this is how you can actually find the size of your array as well as you can find the shape of your array now let us move forward and see what are the other operations that you can perform with numpy module so we saw how to find the size and the shape of an array so we can perform reshape as well as slicing operation using numpy array now when i talk about reshape what do you actually mean by reshape geography all right fine so that is absolutely correct guys now over here there is an example so we have three columns and two rows which we have converted to two columns and three rows now let me show you that practically how you can do it in a variable and i'm going to start a numpy array and i'll have two elements in that my first element will be one comma two comma three comma four and my other element will be say three comma four comma five comma six so i have a two-dimensional array that contains two rows and four columns now I can convert that to four rows and two columns. Let me show you how to do that. You're just gonna type in a is equal to a dot reshape. And I wanna convert it to say four rows and two columns. Go ahead and print this. So it has converted that to four rows and two columns as you can see in front of your screen. Now, let me show you that earlier this is not the case. I'm going to type in a print statement here as well in order to show you that how it has reshaped. So earlier we had four columns as well as two rows, but now we have two columns and four rows. So this is how you can perform the reshape operation. Now, let us talk about slicing. So slicing is basically extracting a particular set of elements from your array. And the slicing operation that happens here is pretty much similar to the one which is there in list as well. So suppose if I want only this particular element that is three. So for that, what I need to print, I'll show you print a and the index value of three, which is present at zero comma and the index is two. Let me tell you how indexing happened. So this element will be zero. This element will be one. Now, if I want three from here, the from the zeroth element, I want the index 2. Indexing starts from 0, 1 and 2. So that's why I've written 0, 2 and it should print 3 for me. Let us see if it does that or not. And yep, it prints 3. Now say if I want to print 4 and 6. Now for that what I need to do is I need to remove this 2 here and I'm going to put a colon that says all the rows including 0 and in that row I want only index 3. So we have only two rows. So if I were have written zero colon one, then it wouldn't have included this particular row. So if I have one more element here, so I can actually write here two. So that won't actually include the element which is present at the second index. 
So when I say zero colon, this actually means all the rows that include zero as well. So we have only two rows. It will include both the rows. And at the same time, it will actually going to print the third index from both of these rows. So let me show you if it, that happens or not. And yep, it happens. We have four and six available with us. Now, just to remove confusion, what I'm going to do is I'm going to add one more element and I'm going to give values to it, say 7, 8, 9, and 10. So now, if I want 4 and 6, I can't just write 0 colon because if I do that, it'll print 10 as well. Let me show you that. Yep, it has printed 10. Now, in order to avoid that, what I can do is I can write in here 2. So as I've told you, this is the 0th element, 1st element, and the 2nd element. So when I write 0 colon 2, it won't include the 2nd element. It'll only include 0th as well as the first element. Now inside that, we have index 3 from both of these rows. That is why we'll actually get 4 and 6. Let us see if that happens or not. And you can see 4 and 6 is now available. So this is how you can perform slicing when we in NumPy arrays. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to type in a equal to np dot line space. And now over here, first I'll write 1 comma say 3. And I want say five values between one comma three. What this will do is it'll actually print the five values which are equally spaced between one to three. So let me print this first. I'm going to type in print A and go ahead, execute this. And you can see that we have one, then we have 1.5, then we have two, 2.5 as well as three. So if I would have written here 10, it will actually give me 10 values between one to three. And yep, you can see we have the 10 values between 1, 2, 3. So this is how you can perform line spacing as well. So we saw how to perform reshaping and slicing. Now let us see what are the other operations. So we are now going to find out the minimum, maximum, as well as the sum of our numpy arrays. So let us go ahead and execute that practically. Let me remove all of this. And now I'm going to define one more numpy array, np.array. And I want elements in it, say one, two, three. Now, if I want to find the element which has the maximum value, so what I can do is I can just type in here print a dot max. That's all. And it'll give me the maximum value in my a numpy array, which is three, obviously. If I want to find minimum value, so I'm just going to type in here min, and it'll print the same for me, which is one. Now, if I want to calculate sum, it is pretty easy. Just go on and type sum, and it'll give you the sum. That's all, guys. It's that simple. Whatever I'm telling you, these are all the basics that you require. After that, whatever your requirement is there, on that basis, you need to use those basic knowledge that you have and implement it. Now, the best way to do that, now the best way to understand any programming language is to play around with it. So you know the basics with the help of those basics, just install PyCharm first, then try out new things like how should I get that, how should I get this, and if I'm not getting it, what is the reason behind it? So go on and try to discover new, new things. So the conclusion is you need to actually perform things practically. You need to make sure that you are not only getting the theoretical knowledge, you need to perform it practically. That's why I always say that side by side when I'm executing these practicals, you need to do that as well. Although you might find it pretty basic, but with the help of this knowledge, you can perform a lot bigger task as well. All right, so Janice looks happy now. So let us move forward with our slides. So now comes the axis uh, concept here, guys. It is pretty similar. We have a numpy array, which looks like this. And the rows are called axis one, and columns are called axis zero. Now you must be thinking, what is the use of this axis? Suppose if you want to calculate the sum of all the rows, then you can actually use these axes, and you can do that. Now let me show you practically how it happens. I'm going to open my PyCharm again, and I'm going to show it to you. Let me remove this and let me add one more element here. Three comma four comma five. All right. So if I want to find the sum of axis zero, it's very, very easy. Just go on and type print a dot sum and type in axis equal to zero. Go ahead and print this. And you can see four, six, and eight. One plus three is four. 2 plus 4 is 6. Similarly, 3 plus 5 is 8. If I make this as axis 1 and print this, so it gives me 6 and 12 because 3 plus 2 plus 1 is 6. Similarly, 4 plus 5 plus 3 is 12. So this is pretty easy, I know. Now let's go back to our slides and see what are the other operations. So there are many mathematical functions that you can perform with NumPy. That is to find the square root of each element. You can even find the standard deviation. 
So uh, these two operations can be performed with the help of NumPy. Why? You can find the square root. You can find the standard deviation. Now let me show you that how you can do it. This is my pie charm again. So now I'm going to remove this print statement here. And I want to print the square root of each of the elements that are there in my numpy array, which is actually assigned to a variable a. So I'm going to type in here print np dot sqrt, that is square root of my numpy array a. Go ahead and execute this. And it has actually printed the square root of each of the elements. So the square root of 1 is 1. For 2, it is 1.414. For 3, it is 1.73. Again, for 3, it is 1.73, then for 4, it is 2, then for 5, it is 2.23. This is how you can find the square root of each of the element. Now, when I talk about standard deviation, so you can find that by typing here. So now, if I want to find the standard deviation, what I need to do is, instead of SQRT, I'll just type in here STD, and it'll give me the standard deviation, that is, how much each element varies from the mean value of my numpy array. And this is the standard deviation, guys. It's that simple. So this is how you find standard deviation. Now let us go back to our slides and see what are the other operations that are still left. Now these are the basic mathematical functions that you can perform with NumPy by arrays like addition, uh, multiplication, subtraction and division. And that will actually happen element wise. So basically you are performing matrix addition, matrix multiplication, matrix division as well as matrix uh, subtraction. Let me go ahead and show it to you practically. It is very, very simple guys. So similarly, I'm going to define one more array and let me name it as B. Let me remove this print statement. Now, if I want to calculate the sum, so what I need to do is I need to type in print A plus B. That's all you need to do. But when I talk about list, again, I'm telling you that when I talk about list, if I do that, it will concatenate both the lists. So if I want to print list, that is the addition of two lists, I need to use for loop. So that is where NumPy array stands apart and it is pretty convenient. Go ahead and execute this and you'll see that element wise addition has happened. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 2 is 4, 3 plus 3 is 6, similarly 3 plus 3 is 6, then 4 plus 4 is 8, 5 plus 5 is 10. All right, so this is how you can perform addition. You can perform subtraction by using the subtraction operator. Go ahead, execute this and you'll find all zeros because 1 minus 1 2 minus 2, 3 minus 3, 3 minus 3, 4 minus 4, 5 minus 5 will be 0 only, right? No rocket science. Now go ahead and multiply it as well and see what happens. So you have 1 into 1 is 1, 2 into 2 is 4, 3 into 3 is 9, again 3 into 3 is 9, 4 into 4 is 16, 5 into 5 is 25. If I go ahead and divide this, it will give me all 1s and yep, it does. So this is how you can actually perform addition, subtraction, multiplication and division using a numpy y arrays. Now let me go back to my slides and see what are the other operations present. So now guys, let me tell you one more thing. If I actually want to concatenate two arrays, I don't just want to add those two arrays. You can say that if my one array is a box, then I want another array on top of it. So let me show you how you can do that. Actually, there are two ways to do that. One is called vertical stacking and another is called horizontal stacking. Let me show it to you one by one. First, I'm going to show you vertical stacking. For that, what I need to do is print np.vstack and a comma b let us see what happens when i run this so we have one two three three four five then again we have one two three and three four five so this is called vertical stacking if i want that horizontally i'll just write in here h stack and i'm going to run this now and you can see that we have one two three then again one two three that means these two are present added horizontally and we have three four five again we have three four five so this is how you can perform stacking as well now, there's one more thing that I want to show you. If I actually want to convert this particular in numpy array, that is A, to say a single column. So how I can do that, just type in here print A dot revel. That's all you have to do. Go ahead and execute this. So you'll have 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5. So you have 1, 2, 3, 3, 4, 5. Let me go back to my slides and see what are the other topics that we are going to cover. Now come certain numpy special functions. Now, I'm going to talk about sine function and cosine function first. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this cosine and sine function and I'm going to plot sine and a cosine graph. So for that, I'm going to import a module called matplotlib. So you don't need to worry about that module because I'm going to discuss about matplotlib in the upcoming sessions. So there'll be a detailed session, especially on matplotlib. So you don't need to worry about what exactly matplotlib is and how it works and 
all those things because that will be covered in the upcoming session. For now what we are going to do, we are just going to use sine and cosine function in order to print their graph. So for that I'll open my PyCharm and let me remove this and import my plot lib dot pyplot as plt. Now we are going to define two coordinates that is x and y. First x is equal to np dot a range 0 comma 3 into np dot pi comma 0 0.1. Uh, now I'm going to define y, so for that I'll type y, np dot sign x. Now I'm going to use plt in order to plot the graph, x comma y. Now finally show the plot, for that I'll type plot dot show. Uh, you must plot dot show to make a graphics appear. So plot dot show and here we go. Go ahead and execute this and you might be able to see a graph and yep, it is here. Similarly, what if I change the sign to cos and should give me the cosine graph. Go ahead and run this and you can see we have a cosine graph as well. Similarly, if I write in here tan, that is any other trigonometric function and I print this, so I get the graph for tan as well. So I'll open my presentation once more and we are going to see what are the other special functions that we can use with NumPy. Now NumPy comes with two very good functionalities I would say that is called exponential function and logarithmic functions. Now exponential this E value is somewhere equal to 2.7 and we all know log. So when I talk about log it is actually log base 10 and when I'm talking about natural log that is log base E I will write it as ln. So instead of that I've written log, that means log base 10. So you can perform these operations with the help of numpy. Let me show you how you can do that. So I'll open my PyCharm. Let me remove this. And I'm going to define a numpy array. Let it be AR equal to np dot array 1 comma 2 comma 3. Now I want to calculate the exponential value. I'm going to throw in a print statement and I'm going to write in here np dot exp ar and this will calculate the exponential value for me and let us see if it does that or not. So yep, as I've told you earlier as well, value of e is 2.71. So e to the power of 1 is actually equal to e, so it has re returned the e value. But e to the power of 2 will be somewhere equal to 7.38. e to the power of 3 will be somewhere equal to 20.0855. Now in order to calculate log, what you can do is, you can just type in here log. Now this will give you natural log. So when I talk about natural log, it is nothing but ln or you can say log base e. But if I want to calculate log base 10, so I need to type in here 10. First let me show you how you can find the natural log. Just go ahead and execute this. Alright, so when I talk about 1, so e to the power of 0 will be equal to 1, right? So log or ln ar equals to 0. Similarly, the other values as well. Now if I want log base 10 instead of ln or you can say natural log, I can just write in 10 and go ahead and execute this and you'll find log base 10 values. So obviously when answer is 1, that means anything to the power of 0 is equal to 1. So the answer will be 0 here and similarly we have other answers as well. If you are pretty, if you are unsure about it, you can open your calculators and do that. So let us go ahead and take a look at what exactly is Pandas. So Pandas is a Python library which is used for data manipulation, analysis and cleaning. And Python Pandas is well suited for different kinds of data such as we can work on tabular data with heterogeneously typed columns. We can work on ordered and unordered time series data, arbitrary matrix data with rows and column labels. We can work on unlabeled data and we can also work on any other form of observational or statistical data sets. Now I'm going to tell you how you can install pandas on your systems guys. It's very easy to install python pandas. You just go to your command line or terminal and just type pip install pandas or if you're working on an IDE such as PyCharm, you can just simply type in pip install pandas in your terminal over there or you can just open the project interpreter and add the library over there. Since we are going to work on Jupyter Notebook, I'm going to tell you how you can install python pandas on Anaconda. So you just have to do one thing. 
So I'll just show you guys how you install Python Panda on your system. You open the Anaconda prompt. We'll wait for the prompt to set up. So you type Conda install. It's already there in my system because I've already installed Panda since I've already worked on various data analysis projects and it's a very integral part of it. Because to work on a data set, to read a data set, you require pandas. And it's just that you cannot work without pandas if you're working with any data related project. So this is how important Python pandas actually is. I'm going to tell you a few applications of pandas as well. So first of all, you can just say that Python pandas is an integral part of data, whichever project you're working on. So you can work on economics. You can uh, use uh, Python pandas for stock prediction. You can use it for recommendation systems. Then you can use it on neuroscience and statistics. Also, you can use it for and then there is advertising so many data coming from different platforms. You can just analyze the data using pandas, you know, clean the data for irrelevant, you know, inconsistencies in your data. You can do that using pandas. And then you can use it for analytics as well. That's the very basic use of Python pandas that I can think of. So right now that we know how pandas actually is in Python programming and what it is used for. Let's go ahead and take a look at the very integral part of pandas that is data frames and CDs. We'll wait for this to install guys. Meanwhile, I'll just tell you what are data frames and CDs guys. So data frame is a two dimensional and the size of the data frame is mutable potentially heterogeneous data or we can call it heterogeneous tabular data. So the data structure which is data frame also contained labeled axis which is rows and columns and arithmetic operations align on both rows and column labels. It can be thought as a dictionary like container for series objects. Now what exactly is a series guys? So a series or a panda series is a one dimensional labeled array capable of holding data of any type which is integer can be string float Python objects, etc. And the access labels are collectively called index and Panda series is nothing but a column in an Excel sheet. So let's just take a look at a few examples and then you'll be able to understand this better what I'm talking about like pandas and series what exactly they are. We'll be working on an example now. So I'll just take it to Jupyter Notebook guys. So we have already uh, created a Jupyter Notebook. If you are not familiar with Jupyter Notebook guys, we have a full tutorial on how to use Jupyter Notebook all the cheat sheet and everything. So you can just refer to those in our Edureka YouTube channel and make sure you subscribe to Edureka for more exciting tutorials because we have a lot of content on Python guys. So if you want to learn Python inside out or any other technology for that matter, we have a lot of content on YouTube you can refer. Also, if you are at it, be sure to check out our courses on edureka.co and we have a full Python programming certification program that you should also check out. So since I have already installed uh, Python pandas, I'm just going to import pandas as pd run this. I'm not going to face any problem uh, running this command because I have already installed pandas. Okay. So what this command will do over here, it's going to install the package, the latest release of pandas for me. I think that's why it's not running. Okay, we have our first statement over here and we have successfully imported pandas as pd so i'm using the alias as pd i hope you guys know what alias is so let's just say i'm importing this library so alias is going to be this one that is pd so for importing i'll tell you why i'm using this now if i want to create a data frame i'll just use df as my variable name for data frame so i'm going to use the alias now when i type tab over here okay i'll just so this is how i can use my alias to create a data frame so this is just to tell you how you use an alias. Now I'm going to show you how you can create a series and a data frame. So first I'm going to okay, I'll have to import numpy as well because I'm going to use it to create a null value. All right, so df is equal to I'm going to make a series. So I'll just write it as s. All right, series, and I'm going to pass a list of values. Let's say one, two, three, four, five, six, and I'm going to use my numpy now to create a null value, like eight, nine, and one more value. Let's say ten. So it's going to create a series now. When I print s, 
So we have a series which has indexes which are already there and all these values that I pass inside a list. So this is how you create a series in Python guys using pandas. After this, I'm going to tell you how you create a data frame. So for that also, I'm going to tell you how you create a data frame using a dictionary object and how you can create a data frame using series as well. So now what we are going to do is uh, we are going to create a data frame by passing a numpy array with a daytime index and label columns. So I'll take one variable, let's say date or dates. I'll just type it as D and I'm going to take PD dot. So we're going to take the date range. And after this, I'm going to pass a few values, let's say 2020 and I'm going to pass values like we're in the month of March. So I'll just write it as March. And after this, I'm going to take periods, which is equal to, let's say 10. So this is my date range guys. Okay. I have an invalid syntax, right? Should work fine now. So when I print D over here, so I have all these values in a date range format. After this, what I'm going to do is I am going to take one data frame, which I am going to take as DF for obvious reasons to make it clearer and I'm going to take data frame and inside this I'm going to pass a few values. So first of all, I'm going to take a few random values. So I'm going to use NP dot random dot random number and inside this I'm going to pass 10 or let's say 4. And now I'm going to get the index values as D and I'm going to have to pass a few more values which is columns. So I'll pass the columns as a list and I'm going to take let's say four columns. So I'm just going to take okay. Wait a minute a a B C D all right. Do we have any errors? No. So now I'm going to print my data frame. So I have a data frame guys which I have created using you know passing a numpy array and I have a daytime index with labeled columns which are a B C and D. This is my index guys and I have all these random values using NP array. So this is how you create a data frame guys. It's just a simple example and I'm going to show you how you can create a data frame by passing a dictionary of objects that can be you know converted into a series also. So I'll take let's say again DF is equal to PD dot data frame and I'm going to pass a dictionary over here now. So I'm going to take a few values first of all. So first value is let's say a now after this I have to pass something right okay I'm gonna write let's say a list of one two three and four after this my next value is going to be let's say b and I'm going to pass a timestamp let's say and for timestamp I'm going to use the same I have used over here 2020 zero three zero one I have to use the Right, and after this, I'm going to pass one more value, let's say C, and I'm going to use a series now, a series object. And inside this, I'm going to pass one, and the index is going to be, let's say, a range. All right, index is equal to a list with a range of four because we have only four values over here. We don't want any null values. And after this, I have to type in the data type as well, the data type of the series guys. So for that, I use D type is equal to, let's say float 32. All right. After this, I provide my next value, which is D. Now for D, I'm going to use uh, a numpy array. And for this, I'm going to pass a value, let's say not three, let's say five multiplied by four. And let's take the D type is equal to integer 32. Yes. All right. Now I take my final value, which is going to be E. And inside this, I'm going to pass a a data frame or we're going to use the categorical object guys. We're going to talk about this later on in the session. So don't worry. I'm just showing you how you can create a data frame using all these uh, objects that we have at our 
disposal guys now instead of test and train we can just call it as true or false it doesn't matter we are taking categorical object so it has to be either true or false or it can be zero or one but it has to be decisive in a way that there are only two values so i take another value and for this let's just say i give the value and you all right so our dictionary is done over here so we have created our data frame guys there's no error now when i print this so we have our data frame guys so a b c d e and f so we have all these values using different data types or we can call it objects as well so for that also we can check the data frame and we just write d types and it's going to give us all the data types that we have so we have date timestamps over here integer float integer category and an object because i have used a string over here that's why it is giving us an object but in the new release that is python 1.0.0 it's not going to be an object it's going to show you it is a string so don't worry guys and we have already made a video on python pandas 1.0.0 with all the features that have come with the new release the new stable release released last month you can check that out as well to check for the new features that we have come across so now that we have done this let us take a look at the next topic that we have which is how to view data so viewing data is basically you know how you actually look at the data or how you're going to look at the data using pandas library so we'll just jump right to jupyter notebook guys and i'll tell you what kind of functions or all those things you have at our bay that we can use to view our data so we'll do one thing first of all we have data frames already that we have over here so i'll do one thing i'll just change it to df1 so that we have different data types or i'm sorry different data frames guys i'll run this this and this as well now when i check for df dot d types should be different guys because we have already made a data frame using that all right it's not so i'll run all the wait So I'll do one thing. I'll restart and run all the cells so that we have two different data frames. So first of all, the first very basic thing that you can do for your data frame is to use. I'll just tell you guys. You write df dot head. So what this function is going to do is give you the first five values inside your data frame or the first five rows. And similarly, for the last rows, you can use the tail method. So this is how you get the first and last values inside your data frame. So it's going to display all the five values that you have at your beginning and the end of your data set. After this, we have df dot index. So what this will do is it will give you all the values from your index. And similarly, we have df dot columns, which is going to give you all the columns from your data frame. So this is how you view your data guys. And then we have data frame dot to numpy, which is going to give you a numpy representation of the data. So I'll just tell you how you can do that. So I'll just write df dot to numpy. Wait a second, guys. Yes. So I'm gonna create a numpy array using this. This I actually created a numpy array, and for df our data frame of all floating point values, data frame dot to numpy is actually fast and does not require copying the data. So it is a very best deal for we have. And then okay, I'll just remove this. I don't want this. And then we have data frame dot describe, which is going to give you somewhat like this, which is going to give you the count, the mean, the standard deviation, minimum, 25%, 50%, 70%, and maximum. So these are all values using the describe you can have, which is going to give you an idea or a perspective of how your data actually is and what kind of calculations are already there that you can think of. Then we have sorting by an axis. We can sort our data using an axis. So for that, you have to just write. Okay, I'll just show you guys. You just have to write df dot sort by index, and inside this you you have to give the value of the axis. I'll just give one, and then let's say ascending. You want it to be ascending? No, I'll just write it as false. So it has given me the data frame by sorting the index. Similarly, I can sort it by the columns as well. 
or I'm sorry, sorted by values. So I'll write it as values. And I want to give the value as say values and I'm going to give the value as let's say by. I want to sort it by C. It has sorted the values depending on C. So this is how you sort your data frame guys. And now that we know how we can actually look at our data. I'm going to tell you how you select particular values inside your data guys. I'm going to show you how you select a single column from your data frame. So we'll write DF. It's very simple guys to get a value from your data frame using only a single column. You can write A or let's say C. So it's going to give all the values from C over here. It has actually given you frequency. It has given you name data type as well. So this is how you actually get a single column from your data frame. Now let me show you how you can slice the rows as well. So for that we are going to use the slicing. If you have actually worked on list comprehension, so we have slicing the data over here. We are going to follow the same principle here as well. So I'll just write DF. Now I want my first starting from my first value to third value. So it has given me only three rows starting from the zero row, and it has given me third row and it does not actually include the third row because it starts from zero. So I've been giving three values. If I write six over here, I'm going to get the sixth value. But it's not going to be at the sixth row because the first row over here is going to be zero row. I hope you understand this guys. So I have shown you how you can slice your data, you know, to get particular number of rows. Now let me tell you how you can uh, select the data using the labels guys. So for that you have to use DF dot. There has to be location LOC and inside this you're going to pass the values by labels guys. All right, so let's pass D that is and zero. So let's see what the output is guys. All right, so we have got all the values using the label that is D over here, which we have passed over there in uh, our previous section where we have declared the data frame and I'm sure this is visible to you guys. Now the next thing is uh, selecting data on a multi axis by label. So what we'll do is we'll write DF dot LOC. And after this, we write hyphen and we are gonna create let's say a and we're gonna pass C right so it's gonna give me the values accordingly which I pass over here so instead of a I can write B or I can write D so this is how you can select multi axis using labels guys and I have written this over here so I can just write let's say zero to three let's see what happens oh we have an error guys you cannot do this so we'll now move on to the next topic that we have is showing label slicing both endpoints are actually included so how do we do that so instead of this we can just let's say copy this paste it over here and copy this paste it over here remove this so this is just to show you guys how you can work with it i'm very certain that the data that you work on is not going to be like this it's going to be very complicated so this is just to give you a perspective as a beginner how you can work with pandas now i'm gonna tell you how you can reduce the dimensions of the returned object as well so for that you just type one thing guys you remove all this get just one value and this is gonna give you the column number at over there and this is how you get the values inside a data frame so moving on let's say we want to get a scalar value so for that we just write okay let's say d zero all right let's see if it works we're getting the same values guys only from the zero throw for getting the fast access to a scalar you can just write as a df instead of loc we can just write at okay we have an error guys i'll just remove this and let's see if it works yes so i'm getting the exact value at the zero throw at the column number c now i'm going to tell you how you select a value from using the position inside your data frame so for that we use df.iloc all right 
so let's say three okay so i'm getting the all the values from third column and similarly we can slice the data you know you can just get it like three to five all right and we can add more values to this like zero to two so this is how you select the values from your data frame guys now we have boolean indexing as well inside our data frames so i'll just tell you quickly what it is so for that you just write df now i'm going to check if df column number a let's say this is interesting guys so it has given me all the values inside a where a is greater than zero if i write here let's say two i have no values because none of the values are greater than two so this is how you can get the boolean indexing this is uh, actually important when you're applying functions to your data frame guys so moving on let's uh, take a look at another method which is is in method i'll just tell you how it works guys so it's basically is to check if the particular value inside your data frame is in there or not now there's one more thing we can set new values inside our data frame we can set a new column which automatically aligns the data by the indexes so for that we can make the series and we can set the values by label we can set the values by position and we can set the assigning with a numpy array as well and the result of the settings will actually align with the data frame where a new operation with the setting can be followed where you can simply align the data frame with the existing data frame now let's go ahead and take a look at the next topic that we have which is handling the missing data inside your data frame so let's jump right to it guys we'll go to jupyter notebook and we'll work with our missing values now so pandas primarily use the value np.nan to represent missing data it is by default not included in the computations and we're going to see the missing value right now so first of all you have to re-index i mean you have to do re-indexing which is going to allow you to change add delete the index on a specified axis so which is going to return a copy of the data as well all right i'll just take df2 is equal to df dot re-index so this is how i'm going to do the re-indexing guys so index is equal to let's say d zero to four yes i'm going to get the columns after the re-indexing which is going to be equal to list of df dot columns and i'm going to add one more column which is going to be let's say e all right now what i'm going to do is i'll do loc i'm going to check a few values so instead of dates i've taken d guys so d of zero and d of one at e is equal to one now let's check what is df2 guys we have two null values over here so this is how i'm going to show you how to handle missing values inside your data frame so we have done re-indexing so first of all i'm going to check for null values so we have true over here and we can get the count as well is null and we count these null values all right right now we are going to drop a few columns so we are going to drop the na that is the na values So as you can see from our data frame all the values that had null values are dropped actually the whole column has been dropped or we can do one thing fill in the missing data guys just do one thing okay check df2 we have so we can do one thing we can fill the missing values and we are going to provide some value let's say value is equal to 2 right so we have actually filled the value with some of the value wherever there is a missing value we have given a value that is going to fill over there so this is how you get or you know check for all these uh, missing values inside your data frame after this you can now actually get a boolean mask where values are any n which is null so for that you do pd dot okay is any df2 so this is going to get you a 
boolean mask which i've already told you how you can check using df dot is null same thing but different processes to run this now let us move ahead and to the next topic that we have which is pandas operations guys pandas operations are nothing but a few operations that you can apply on the data frame or any other pandas object so we have descriptive statistics that we can apply we can apply functions histogramming is there and string methods is also there so i'll tell you what histogramming is when we are talking about it so let's take it up to jupyter notebook again guys i'll tell you how you can actually work with pandas operations so first of all i'm going to tell you a basic operation which is that is a descriptive statistics so it's going to give us all the mean values similarly we can get one value like df dot mean provide one value over there so this is how you get it guys or we can write it as two right all right so this is how operating with objects that have different dimensionality and need alignment in addition panda automatically broadcast along the specified dimension so for that let's make a series i'll tell you just how it works pd dot series uh, give it a few values let's say one two three np dot nan five uh, i'm sorry four five and then give the index value the index is going to be dates and let's just shift all this two places right we have made an error guys length of pass value is six and index implies 10. So we have to uh, actually put more values. So write six, seven, eight, nine. Yes. Now when I print S over here, we have all these values. Now we can do one more thing. So we write it as df dot sub, and we pass the S over here, which is our C's, and we make an axis. Write it as index so we have operated with objects that have different dimensionality and the needed alignment so in addition pandas actually helped us automatically broadcast the specified dimension so now i'm going to talk about applying functions to the data so we already have data frame let's see what we have so we have this data frame guys so what i'm going to do is i am going to apply a few functions so first of all i'm going to use the apply method over here and let's see what all do i have let's just check we have absolute absolute import all all close a max a minimum angle any append all these functions that i can apply on this so let's say we have come some let's see what this does guys all right So this is how it works. Now let's apply a few more functions, guys. So I'll write lambda x. So we are talking about lambda functions here. I'm sure most of you must be aware of the lambda functions that we have in Python. If you don't have any prior knowledge on lambda function, guys, there is a full tutorial on how lambda function works in Python, guys. So this is how we applied lambda function to get the subtraction between the x max and x minimum all right for all the columns we have subtraction between all these values so this is how we apply functions to our data guys now i'm going to talk about histogramming so histogram is a representation of the distribution of data so this function we have which is matplotlib.pyplot.hist on each series in the data frame resulting in one histogram per column so what we do is uh, we'll make a series and it's going to give us value counts for histogramming how do we do that actually so we can just write as s dot value counts right let's see if it works all right we have one value for each so this is how we get or do the histogramming with our data guys now i'm going to talk about the string methods so series actually is equipped with string processing methods in the string attribute that actually makes it easy to operate on each element of the array so let's just move ahead with the example so i'll make a series guys pd dot let's say series and inside this i'm going to pass a few string values 
So I'm going to start with Edureka. Write Python next. Let's write Jupyter. Give it a few null values as well to make it a little or slightly different from perfect. All right. So give it a few values. Let's say football. And looking at the current scenario, let's write vault. So we have a series over here guys. Now what we'll do, we'll take or use the string methods. So I'm gonna make it all to lower, which are already lower. So I'll make it up to upper guys, upper letter words. So everything we have changed using the string methods inside our C, uh, Panda series. These are all the operations that you can perform on Pandas guys. So let's move ahead to the next topic that we have, which is merging. So in merging, we are basically going to merge two data frames together. So we have two functions, which is concat and join. So concat pandas objects along a particular axis with optional set logic along the other axis. It can also add a layer of hierarchical indexing on the concatenation axis, which may be useful if the labels are the same or overlapping on the past axis number. So let's take a look at the example for this. So we have our data frame. I'm going to use pd dot data frame. Give it a few values, let's say np dot random dot random number from let's say 10 and 4. All right. So we have all these values. Now what I'll do is I'll break it into the pieces. So how to do that? So let's say I write it as df2 is equal to df from first to third row. The next one is df from third to let's say seventh row. And then we have df from seventh to the end of the data. So this is how I am going to break it into the pieces. Now when I write it as df2, we have three data sets. Now I'm going to write, now I'm going to use the concatenation function using concat. All right, I'm gonna concatenate df2. So this is how I have concatenated the missing pieces, not the missing pieces, the several other pieces together using the pandas concat function. Now let's talk about the join function that we have. So for this basically, I'm gonna tell you how you can uh, do the left and right join. So for the left join, I'll write left is equal to pd dot data frame. And let's see. First value, let's say a. Give it a few values, let's say one, two. And then say B, we have three, four. All right, we make the for the right as well. So I'm just co gonna copy all this, paste it over here. Okay, I'm just going to write it as D, this is gonna be, let's say C, and change a few values. So we have left and right and I'm going to just type left and then we get the output for right. So I'm going to join all these two using the join function. So for that I'm going to use the merge function and inside this let's say left we have right and on is equal to I'm going to join it at uh, let's say a. Let's see how it works. Okay, it doesn't. So we have a key error, which is A. So I'll change it to A, guys. So we actually joined using the merge function over here. And another example that I can think of is, uh, let's say, we have left and right. If we can change the values differently and we can just group them together. 
now what I'm going to talk about is grouping guys so how you do the grouping of different data inside your data frame using pandas so first of all for that you have to split the data into groups based on some criteria that you have and then after that you apply some functions on them and then later on you can combine the results into a data structure so first of all you have to get a data frame guys so let's see we have a data frame over here so we can actually group it by let's say right i'll just write group by let's say a and I'm just gonna sum right we have an error guys so we have a key error that is a because we don't have over there so i'll write it as let's say two all right we don't have two as well we have a key error we don't have two over there because it's not a string value it's an integer value so we have our values right over here so we have grouped the data using the column that is number two now we can actually group the data by multiple columns and form a hierarchical index so for that i'll just copy this guys or over here only i'll just do one thing two and let's say three so this is how you actually combine multiple columns to form a hierarchical index but here again we don't have actually categorical values for these columns if we had we'd be able to do that you know if we had like let's say true and false it is going to have um, created a hierarchical index which will have different values for true columns and for false columns so that's how you do the grouping or that's where you actually need grouping using pandas now let's move and take a look at the next topic that we have okay we have already talked about operations then i have talked about merge where we have talked about concat and join and then i've talked about splitting the data how you apply the functions and then combining the results together merging we have talked about grouping now i'm going to talk about stack and pivot table so what exactly is a stack guys in pandas i'm sure most of you must have heard about some of the definitions of stack so i'm going to tell you about this with perspective of pandas library here so the stack function is used to stack the prescribed levels from columns to index and it returns a reshaped data frame or a series having a multi-level index with one or more new innermost levels compared to the current data frame so you're gonna understand this with an example so i'm just gonna take a let's say my tuple is equal to i'm just gonna take a list and inside this let's see we have values and we provide or we get two lists over here a list inside a list guys so let's take a few values take one two three four five and then again let's say six seven eight nine and ten or we'll add a few more values guys let's say 11 12 and 13 over here i will add a few more values let's say 17 18 and 19 so we have our tuple i'm going to create one more variable index so we'll have multi index so from tuples and inside this i'm going to pass my tuple pass the names as well so the names are going to be let's say first and second so we have our index now i'm going to create the data frame guys so for this we write pd dot data frame and inside this i'm going to pass a few values np dot let's say random dot random number so we have eight values and two columns all right so and the index is going to be index and columns is equal to a and b all right we have an attribute error guys i made a mistake so 
so there's no error now and I'm going to make one more data frame so inside this I'm gonna pass this value now I check my data frame so I have reshaped my data frame with this the first and the second and all these values now we're gonna talk about the stack method guys so which compresses a level in the data frames columns so we're gonna do one thing we're just gonna do what df2 dot stack right this an attribute arrow so this is how we stack or compress a level in the data frames column guys and with a stack data frame or series having a multi index as the index inverse operation of stack is unstack by which default it's gonna unstack whatever you have done with using stack so we'll do df2 dot stack and this is how you unstack now we'll talk about the pivot tables guys oh wait let's put it inside a variable let's say a All right, so this is how you unstack guys We're getting different values there now. We're going to talk about the pivot tables that we have in pandas So it is nothing but the levels in the pivot table will be stored in multi index objects on the index are columns of the result data frame So we'll take a look at one example guys, which is going to be pretty clear so we'll take df again pd dot data frame and inside this we're going to take a few values or we're going to take a list inside a dictionary so let's go with a few values let's say one or let's say a all right so we write a b c d Well, we'll remove a few values over here Multiply it to 3 Now we take another value which is going to be B And for this we're going to take a list again. So let's say Multiply it to 4 Take another value. Let's say C now and inside this uh, we're gonna pass a few values again so we're gonna pass six values so let's write b p and p q q and q multiply it to two because we want the number to be 12 and now D is going to be NP dot random dot random number and the number we want is 12 and we take one more value E and we take the same values for this as well random dot random number 12 no errors I guess so we have an invalid syntax guys so we forgot to add a comma over here and here and here All right so i think it should work fine now without any errors so we have printed the data frame over here guys so this is how it looks now we can produce pivot tables from this data very easily guys the very reason of creating this data frame was to get the pivot tables now what i'll do is i'll just write pd dot pivot table and I'm gonna pass DF over here. All right, DF, and the values is gonna be let's say D, and index is equal to A and B, and columns let's say is equal to C. So this is how you create a pivot table guys Now that we are done with pivot tables uh, Let me talk about the next topic that we have which is time series and categoricals So we have done reshaping merging grouping as well Now we're going to talk about the time series and categoricals 
So Pandas has simple powerful and efficient functionality for performing resampling operations during a frequency conversion which is for example converting secondly uh, data into five minutely data and this is extremely common in but not limited to financial applications. So we're going to take a look at a few examples and for categorical data data that you collect can be either categorical or numerical. So numbers often don't make sense unless you assign meaning to those numbers. So for categorical data is when numbers are collected in groups or categories and categorical data is also the data that is collected in an either or yes or no situation. For example, we have zero or one. We have true or false. So that's going to be the category over there. So let's take a look at a few examples to understand this guys the time series and categoricals. So we'll take a look at a few examples for time series. So first of all, what I'm going to do is I am going to make a time series guys. So first of all, what we will do is we'll convert the data into five minutely data. So it's very common guys. So I'll just take the range first of all. So we'll take the dates. All right, I made a mistake. I'll just cut this. So I'll just run this again. We'll get one more column. And now what I'll do is I'll make one variable using the PD dot date range. Yes, and I'm gonna provide the range as let's say 2020. 01 or 0301. We want the periods is equal to 100 and let's say frequency is equal to S. All right, let's print dates. Okay, so we have dates over here. We'll just remove this for now. So now we take one more uh, variable, let's say TS is equal to pd dot I'm going to take a time series and inside this I'm going to use np dot random and random integer which is going to be 0 to 500 and the length is of dates and then we have index is equal to dates so we have okay we have number attribute no random random all right. So we have an unsupported date time. So I'm going to have to change this over here. So we'll write it as let's say 3 1 or we're going to write 3 3 2020. Right. So let's see if it works now. It doesn't. So we are getting the unsupported D type. Okay, so we just mention a few more stuff over here. So we'll write it as 0, 0, 0, 0. So I think I figured out the problem over here. So I've changed this to the, this format and now I'm going to add one more parenthesis here and remove this one. And now I'm not getting any errors guys. So I'll run it again, All right? So now what I have to do is I will have to make a few changes to that TS, which is time series I've made. So I'll write it as TS dot resample and I want to make it to five minutes, right? And I have to sum this. So no errors there guys. So now I'm going to do the time zone representation. So for that, I'm going to get one more. Okay, I'll just copy this guys, this little change to this only. So I'll just copy this and paste it over here. And here I have to make a few changes that is 0 0 rest everything will going to be fine and we'll change this to 5 all right so now we make another timestamp and we just use pd dot series and inside this I'm going to use np dot random dot random number and the random number is going to be the length of dates and dates over here. All right. So now when I print timestamp, I'm getting the output as some like this. 
so this is how you get the time zone representation guys you're getting the date the time and everything and uh, the data type is float 64 and then you can also get the UTC as well so for that I'll just write TS UTC and we just write timestamp dot TZ localize and we get UTC right it's UTC now I'm gonna print this so we get the UTC as well so this is how you create the time zone representation and now after this I want to show you how we can convert to another time zone so for that we don't have to do anything we just write TS dot all right TS UTC dot TZ which is time zone convert and we write US Eastern So we have converted into the US time zone and converting between time span representations also we can do that let's just say that's your exercise so you have to convert between the time spans representations so that you'll be able to understand this better for that you have to you don't have to do anything you just have to take the date range the pH is going to be 5 and then you write the frequency instead of s you write it as m the rest all is going to be the same guys okay I'll just do it here as well just copy this paste it over here instead of s it's going to be m we we'll have to remove this all right now i make the timestamp which is going to be the same guys now print the timestamp this is how we convert or after this we take one more variable let's say ps and i'm going to to period all right now when I print PS over here this is the output I get so the frequency is M I have changed the frequency and now I can just convert it to timestamp guys Let's see where it is this is how you create it into a timestamp now converting between period and timestamp enables some convenient arithmetic functions to be used so for that we have period range and all those things that you can add now moving on to the next topic that is categoricals so for that let me just take one more data frame guys so I'll write it as DF is equal to PD dot data frame now I'm going to take a few values inside this uh, dictionary the first is going to be let's say ID and now I'm going to pass a list with a few values precisely six so I'm going to use six values over here now my next topic is or the next key is let's say raw grade or just grade we'll write so we're going to write a b c let's say again the guy is getting b and this one's getting a so we have five and one more let's say one guy has failed so we have our data frame let's print this okay so we have our data frame what I'm going to do is I am going to get the grade right so we'll get the grade is equal to df grade now this is going to be the category I'm going to make all right now we print df grade so we have grades like a b c b a e now I'm going to rename the categories to more meaningful names so what I'll do is I'll make the change over here only so I'll write cat dot categories and I'm going to write the categories as let's say good instead of pass fair I'm just going to write very good 
and then there is excellent all right so we have very good very bad and excellent all right we have an arrow guys there's something we have done so we have new categories needs to have the same number of items as the old categories so how many categories do we have over there right, let's just copy this So we have categories four. So we're gonna have to make four categories, guys. So I'm just going to add good as well. Uh, there shouldn't be any arrows. Now what I'll do is I'll just set the categories. So I'm gonna set the categories now. Let's say here I'm gonna to have to give uh, six values, guys. So right, very good. Let's say bad. Very bad. Medium good, very good. Any sort of categories I have to give over here. So I'll just write. very bad good and let's say medium all right so after this i have set the categories as well now i'll just write df great okay so we have good very bad then we have very good very bad and good and then we have any and because we have not given any other category for that and we have the five objects so we are getting very good bad very bad good medium so that's how you use the categoricals in pandas guys now i'm going to talk about plotting using pandas so that's going to be very simple guys for that i'm going to have to import one more library that is matplotlib dot pyplot I'm gonna use it as PLT. All right. Same thing goes with this as well. All right. This is gonna be by plot. All right. So there should not be any errors now. Okay. So uh, I will close all. Now I'm gonna make one series, guys. And inside the series, I'm gonna provide a few random values like np dot random dot random number until let's say thousand or let's say five hundred or yes five hundred and the index is equal to pd dot date range and i'm going to take the date range as one three twenty twenty and let's take the periods is equal to one thousand wait we have to take it as 500 because we have 500 values over there i hope no errors yes now I'm going to take the timestamp and we're going to get the come sum. All right, now ts dot plot. So we have a plot over here using pandas guys this is how we have created one uh, series using the random numbers from numpy library and using the pi plot we have plotted a graph for random values which we have taken from 0 to 500 and the random range as well 
so this is how you take uh, or get a plot using pandas guys now last but not the least we have another topic which is reading and writing to files so inside this i'm going to show you how you can read from a file and how you can actually create a file over there so we have our data frame guys or we have our ts this this is our ts guys so i can just you know convert it to a csv file guys make it or give it a file name as let's say ts.csv and it's going to save the ts.csv file somewhere in my directory and similarly i can read from a csv file so for that i can just write pd dot read csv and i'm gonna have to give the file a location for that so i'll just copy one file location from one of my data sets so this is one data set that i have so i'm gonna check for the properties or wait i'm gonna copy this paste it over here Okay, we have an unicode error so i'll just write r over here and i'm able to read from the csv file guys look at this instead of csv i can write excel and it's going to create a excel file or a csv file it's going to read from so that's how we actually read and write from files like a csv file which is a comma separated file basically or we read from a file So why we need data visualization? Now let us take an example. Suppose you work in an organization as an analyst, and you have made certain analysis. Now you need to show that analysis to your boss or your CEO, or whatever. Now, now you can understand it by just looking at the Excel sheet and the numbers. But the other person is not an analyst. He is not that technically sound as you are. So what do you need to do? You need to present your analysis or your data in such a way that the other person can understand. And how you can do that? You can do that by representing it in the form of a graph. and it is a well known fact that human brain can process information easily when it is in pictorial or graphical form so that is one of the key reasons why we use a data visualization in order to understand the trend better and make better decisions so let us move forward and understand one more reason why we need data visualization now basically it allows us to quickly interpret the data like whatever the trend the data is showing us now basically it allows us to quickly interpret the data So just by looking at the graph, we can understand what the data is about and what is the trend. But if you are not from an analytics background and you see just the Excel sheet, then it is very tough for you to understand it. So if it is there in the graphical form, you'll quickly understand it and you can experiment as well. Now, what happens if you want to change certain variables and see what will be the outcome? So with the help of the graphical representation of your data, that will give you a very good idea as to what all variables are useful for you and what all variables are useless. You don't need to include in your analysis. in order to perform that experiment in an efficient and a quick way you need data visualization so guys these were the two key reasons why we need a data visualization if you have any questions or doubts you can ask me or if you understood everything then you can give me a thumbs up so that i can move forward brian says move on uh, so does neha pooja siddharth theon jason fine guys so we'll move forward and understand what exactly is data visualization So what is data visualization? So data visualization is nothing but the presentation of your data in a pictorial or a graphical format. Now why we do that? We do that in order to enable the decision makers of an organization to see the analytics presented visually so that they can grasp some difficult concepts or identify new patterns. Now since we have discussed a lot about data visualization, so guys I want answers from you all. Give me some example where I can use data visualization in an organization. I don't need a lot of examples just two or three that will be enough. I just want to know whether you have understood it or not. All right, so Devon says you can use it in finance or right, in what way can I use it in finance? Can you please tell me that Devon? All right, so he says in order to find out where should I invest my money. Yeah, that is one perfect use case I would say. All right, fine guys. So I'll give you a couple more cases where you can use it. You can use it to identify the areas that need attention or improvement in the organization. you can even use it in order to clarify which factors influence customer behavior now it might depend on the season or anything else basically now you can even use it to understand which products to place where now this is very important guys obviously you won't be selling jackets or sweaters in summers right you and you won't be selling shaving cream to kids so you should know what are your target audience and 
where you your where you are selling your product and to whom are you selling your product so that is one very important uh, field where we need data visualization and you can even use it to predict sales volume as well fine guys so we have looked at a lot of examples for data visualization now let us understand the diagram that is there in front of your screen so it basically tells you about how to find insights from your data now for that we need data visualization it plays a very very important role and it is one of the major applications of data visualization in order to find insights in data now there's a process that has to be followed in order to do that so it starts with visualize the first step is visualize so basically you understand what your data is you visualize it in a form of a graph and you understand what that data is actually talking about now we'll take an example suppose you have a data set that tells you about the youth percentage of unemployed youth country wise from 2010 to 2014 all right so you have that data then you visualize it the moment you visualize it you'll get to know that okay it's fine this country has a lot of unemployed youth whereas this country is doing pretty good so accordingly you just you just grasp it pretty easily when you visualize it after that you make certain analysis now what sort of analysis suppose if i take the same example forward if i want to find out the change in the percentage of unemployed youth between 2011 to 2010 so that will come under analysis phase so i'll analyze it after that what comes is document insight now you have done that analysis but what is the outcome of that analysis now i'll see what all countries are doing good i mean the percentage of unemployed youth have gone up and which country it has gone down and from what all countries it is stable there's no change so we'll see that and make a document after that we transform our data set now there might be certain fields in my data that I don't need. So at that time what I'll do, I'll transform my data set, I'll remove those fields or there might be certain fields that I need and which is not there. So I'll add those fields. So accordingly I'll transform my data set. And once I've done that, I'll again visualize it in order to understand what my data is now talking about. And this process will keep on repeating. So this is how you find insights in data where visualization plays a very, very important role guys. So I hope you have understood this flow. So we have understood what exactly is data visualization. If you have any questions or doubts, you can ask me. All right, so Neha is asking, Matplotlib is used for data visualization. Yes, Neha, it is used for a data visualization. We are going to see that in the next slide. Any other questions? All right, so we have no questions. So we'll move forward and understand what exactly is Matplotlib. Now, it is very important for us to understand as to how Matplotlib works fundamentally. Now, it is pretty easy and pretty basic. You have some data then your computer will draw that data to a canvas of some sort but it is only in the computer's memory now once your computer has drawn that data you can show that data so this is so the computer can first draw everything and then perform the more laborious task of showing it on the screen very basic i know you might find it pretty lame but it is very important for us to understand how fundamentally matplotlib works so you have an example in front of your screen so again we have that data in which we have country wise percentage of unemployed youth and I've done some analysis and I've shown it graphically the percentage change in the unemployed youth country wise between 2010 to 2011. So this is how that plot looks like it is nothing but a bar plot. Now there are various types of plots available. We'll have a look at few of those in the next slide. So we'll move forward and see what are the various types of plots. So I've listed down six types of plots. First is the bar graph then histograms, scatter plot, pie plot, hexagonal bin plot, and area plot. We are going to plot all these things in today's session with the help of matplotlib module. So we'll move forward and we'll get started with it. We'll write our first matplotlib code. So here's the most basic code in order to generate one of the most simple graph. So let me explain to you this code. First of all, what I've done, I have imported pie plot from matplotlib as plt. Then I'll use this pie plot in order to plot the graph in the canvas and then finally I'll use this PLT which is nothing but pie plot in order to show what we have got all right so pretty basic guys so what I'll do I'll open my pie charm and execute this practically all right so before I open my pie charm we have a question from Brian he's asking what are the tools that are used for data visualization all right, so I'll tell you, we have a lot of tools available in market nowadays. We have Tableau, we even use R, Python. So for Python, you need to import the matplotlib library. So there are many, many tools available in the market right now. So I hope this answers your question, Brian. All right, so he says yes, fine. So I'll open my PyCharm and I'll execute this practically. 
So this is my PyCharm guys. So over here I'll first create a Python file with .py extension and I'm going to name it as first code. Now over here I'll first import pyplot from matplotlib. So for that I'll type from matplotlib import pyplot as plt. Now this plt is pretty much similar to np that we were using in numpy array if you can recall. So it is not mandatory to use plt only, you can use whatever you want but a lot of people use it as plt and I'll keep it that way. Now our next step is to plot our graph to the canvas. So for that what I'll do, I'll type in plt dot plot and uh, I'll write in here my x and y axis uh, values. So for x axis I'll keep it as 1 comma 2 comma 3 and then for y axis I'm gonna add values such as 4, 5 and 1. So this will plot our graph in the canvas. Now final step is to show that plot. How we'll do that? I'll just type in here plt dot show and we'll execute this and see what happens. Run first code and yep this is how our first basic graph looks like. So with three lines of code you have got this graph. So we'll move forward and we'll see how to actually add title labels to our graph. For that I'll open my slides once more. So now of course there are some problems with our graph. First off we have actually learned in school that we are supposed to put labels on each axis and we need to also add a title to our graph. It actually doesn't make sense. Our graph doesn't make sense if there are no x and y axis labels and a title. So you don't know what is axis, you don't know what is x axis, you don't know what is y axis and what is the graph about. Plus in terms of programming it is very unlikely that you'll be actually filling in data to the plt.plot function. Now over here you can notice that we are actually filling in data like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1. Instead you will be passing variables into it. All right. So it should be something like plt.plot and you can say x comma y if you have defined variables x comma y. All right. So now let us show plotting variables as well as adding some descriptive labels and a good title. How does that sound guys? All right. So I can see a lot of people are pretty excited. So we'll move forward and see how to add title labels and plotting variables. Now the code is pretty much similar to the previous one but it has few extra fields. Let me explain you that. So of course I've imported the pyplot from matplotlib. After that what I've done, I've defined two variables x and y and I have certain values in it like 5, 8, 10 and 12, 16, 6. You can put whatever values you want and this can even contain a data frame, a pandas data frame that has a data set. After that what I've done, I've defined plt.plot function in which I have x and y instead of filling the data, I'm putting in variables that actually contain data. After that, I've added a title which is info, then y label which is nothing but y axis and x label which is nothing but x axis. After that, I need to show my plot. So for that, I've done plt.show and the result is there in front of your screen. We have a title, we have labels for x axis and y axis. Now let me open my PyCharm and execute this practically. So before I open my PyCharm and execute this practically, we have a question from Siddharth. He's asking X and Y contains list. Yeah, X and Y actually contains list. We have list of numbers 5, 8, 10 in, in X variable and in Y variable we have similarly 12, 16 and 6. So I hope this answers your question Siddharth. All right, so he says yes. Fine, so I'll open my PyCharm and execute this practically now. This is my PyCharm again guys, so I'll remove till here and obviously I need pyplot function from matplotlib. So now I will define x and y variable. So in x, it'll have a list of numbers, say 5, 8 and 10. And now I'll define one more variable y, which again has a list of numbers 12, 16 and 6. 12, 16 and 6. Yep. Now what is our next step guys? Can anyone answer me? Alright, so I've got a correct answer from Theon. He's saying a plt.plot function, which is absolutely correct. So I'll write in here plt.plot and instead of filling in data, I'll be passing variables. Alright, and now our next step is to add title and x label as well as y label. So in order to add title, I will write here plt.title and the title of my graph. So I can just write here info. And now I'm going to define x and y labels. For that I'll type in plt.y label and I'm going to name it as y axis. Similarly for x label I'm going to do the same thing. 
x axis all right now finally i'll type in plt dot show now go ahead and run this so you can see that we have a graph that contains the title info y axis as a y label as well as x axis as the x label now i'll again open my slides and we'll see what next are we going to see so any questions or doubts still here guys you can ask me any questions so we have no questions so what i'll do i'll open my slides and we'll move forward now this graph is pretty much incomplete or ugly i would say because what if i want to change the width of this particular line what if i want to add some grid lines what if i want to change the color so all those things how will i do that don't worry the next slide will actually tell you the same how to add style to your graph so how to add style to your graph for that first thing that you need to do is import the style function from matplotlib module after that you need to call it style.use ggplot so whatever plot that you want to use i'm using ggplot right now then again i've defined four variables x y x2 and y2 and all of these contains a list of numbers again i'm telling you it can be a data frame as well which contains a data set then what i've done again i have used plt.plot function but over here apart from x and y there are many other fields so don't get confused i'll explain it to you it's very very easy so this thing g actually tells me that the color of my line should be green then this is label so this label is not for your x axis or y axis it is for your curve which is line one you can give whatever name you want then we have line width i want the width of my line to be five so i have put in here five similarly i have done for the next plot as well then I've added title, which you know how to do that. Similarly, Y label and X label. Now, after that, I'm using this legend function in, in order to add a legend to my graph. Over here, you can notice that we have it present in our graph where I'm pointing with my highlighter right now. So we have line one and line two. After that, what I've done, I've added grid lines to my graph, which is of the color K, which is nothing but black. So you can see it in my graph as well. We have grid lines available. And finally, plt.show. Any doubts, questions still here, guys? We are going to execute this practically in my pie charm. So before that, if you have any questions or doubts, you can ask me. All right, so we have no questions. So I'll open my pie charm again and I'll show you how you can do that practically. So this is my pie charm again. So this is my pie charm again, guys. Uh, let me first remove all of this. And I need to import the style function. So for that, I'll type from matplotlib import style. That's it. Style dot use gg plot. Now define the variables. First will be x. Add certain values to it. I'll add in five eight ten. Five eight ten. Then y. I'm going to add a list of numbers. Twelve sixteen six. Now one more variable x2 again it will have list of numbers which will be 6 9 11 then i'm going to use y2 variable and i'll add some numbers to it 6 15 and 7 all right so now i'm going to use plt.plot function and over here first i write x comma y then now given a color to it i'm going to give it as green next label line one now line width is equal to five now again for x2 and y2 i'm going to type in plt.plot x2 comma y2 comma the color then label so I'm going to type in line 2 then comes line width alright so now our next step is to add title to our plot so plot plt dot title and the title that I'm going to give is info again then x and y labels plt dot y label y axis then plt dot x label x axis plt dot show now go ahead and run this 
So over here, I've not added any grid lines. I can do that as well. So for that, let me first close it. Fine, so I've defined title, X label, as well as Y label. Now our last task is to actually add grid lines. So for that, I'll type plt.grid and just write in here, true, comma, give a color. I want it black, so I'll keep it that way. Finally, show your plot. So plt.show, that's all. Go ahead and run this. So you can see that this is our graph. So we have changed the default line width. We have added grid lines. We have added labels, titles, plus we add, can add legend as well. So let me show you how you can add a legend. So for that, I'll go back to my code once more. Just write in here, plt.legend. Go ahead and run this again and you'll see that legend has been added. So here we have line one and line two as a legend. And we have changed the default line width title, y-axis, x-axis labels, plus we have grid lines. So this is how you can uh, customize and add style to your graph. So I hope you all are clear. All right, so everyone says they are clear. So what I'll do, I'll open my slides again and we are going to look at how to plot various types of graphs. For example, a bar graph or a histogram, all those things. Fine, so first we'll look at how to plot a bar graph. So these are all the linear graphs that we have seen till now. Now we'll see how to plot a bar graph. So before I tell you how to plot a bar graph using matplotlib, let us understand why we actually use a bar graph. So bar graphs are basically used to compare things between different groups. And when we are trying to measure changes over time, bar graphs are very well suited when changes are larger. So this is why we use bar graph. Now let us understand how we can do that using matplotlib. Now since we know why we use bar graph, let me explain you the code and how you can do that using matplotlib. So first import pyplot like we do every time. After that, instead of plt.plot, I'll use plt.bar and I have filled in data here. You, you can fill in variables as well that contains data. Then I have defined a label, example one. After that, I have one more plot in which I have filled in data plus a label and I've given a color as well. I don't want the default color, I want some change. So I've written it as a green. After that, I have plotted the legend. After that comes legend and then X label and Y label that you have seen in the previous graphs as well. Then I've added a title and then finally show it. No worry guys, I'll execute this practically in my PyCharm now. So this is my PyCharm guys, so over here what I've done, first of all I've imported the pyplot function, then instead of plt.plot I'm using plt.bar and inside that I have data filled in. Instead of that I can even have variables that contains data. Then comes label in which I am using example one. Then comes label, for this instance it is example one. Then again for one more plot I have plt.bar, inside that I have data filled in, then label and then in order to differentiate between both of them I'm using a color green for this particular bar graph. Then comes legend and then after that, and then after that I've defined x label as well as y label. After that I have title and then finally show it. Now go ahead and run this and see if it works or not and yes it does. So we have legend here, we have x, x label, we have y label as well as x label and we have a title for our graph. So any questions, any doubts guys? Alright, so we have a question from Dave. He's asking what is the difference between histogram and bar plot? Alright Dave, I'll tell you in histograms we have quantitative variables. Alright, and when I talk about bar plot, they have categorical variables. So let me explain you this with an example. So if suppose if I want to plot the GDP growth of every city in a particular country. So at that time I'll use a bar plot because it has a category, this particular city like New Jersey, New York, all those things. Now when I talk about, I'll use histogram when I'm talking about quantitative variable. That means if I'm talking about age group. In that same example, if I want to calculate how much each age group is actually contributing towards GDP growth. So at that time I'll be using histogram. So I hope this answers your question. All right, he wants me to repeat it, fine, I'll do that. So when I talk about histogram, it actually has quantitative variables. When I talk about bar plot, it has categorical variables. Now with an example, if I explain you, you can take the example of GDP growth. So if I want to calculate how much GDP growth is there for every city in a country, so at that time I'll use bar plot. But if I want to calculate how much each age group is contributing towards the GDP growth of a country, then at that time I'll use a histogram. So over there we had a category in bar plot like cities, but here we have a quantitative variable that is age group. So I hope this answers your question.
All right. He says yes. Fine. All right. So let us move forward and focus on the code that you have in front of your screen. So let me explain you this code. So over here we have population ages. So we have defined a list in which we have multiple numbers. After that we have defined one more list or a variable bins in which we have multiple numbers again. Now instead of using plt.bar for bar plot for histogram we use hist plt.hist. Then comes population ages. Instead of data I am filling in here variables that contains data. Then bins. Then hist type I want it to be a bar type. Now when I talk about hist type I want it to be bar then the width should be 0.8 that's all the rest all you can understand it is x label y label title legend and finally show the plot now I'll go ahead and execute this practically in my PyCharm so this is my PyCharm guys and just to save time what I have done I've actually copied it already so over here you can see we have imported the matplotlib module then we have a variable population ages and bins now instead of using plt.bar I'm using plt.hist for histograms then comes the two variables and then his type is equals to bar and then I've defined width similarly I have defined X label Y label and title like the previous examples then comes legend and then finally show the plot so let us go ahead and execute this and see if it works or not yep it does so we'll move forward and understand scatter plot as well now before we understand how to plot a scatter graph we need to understand why we actually use scatter plots Usually we use scatter plots in order to compare two variables or three if you're plotting in three dimensions looking for a correlation or groups. So basically you try to find out how much uh, two or three variables related to each other. So over here as you can see there is one point here and there's another point here. So these two are pretty much dissimilar to each other right now when I talk about these two points are pretty close to each other. So you can say that these two are pretty much similar and Basically what we are doing here, we're trying to find the relationship between the two variables and that and that is actually called your uh, correlation. Now let us understand the code. Now let me explain you the code. So first of all we have imported the pyplot function from the matplotlib module. Then we have two variables x and y which contains a certain set of values. Now instead of calling plt.plot or plt.bar or plt.hist, I'm using scatter because I'm doing it for a scatter plot, right? Now inside the parenthesis I have X and Y variables these variables contain data and I can even write the data instead of just writing the variables as well now I've defined a label and then color then rest of the things you know we have X label Y label the title then legend and then show that's all now let's go ahead and execute this practically in my PyCharm now this is my PyCharm and over here I've already pasted the code so I'll just go and run this and we'll see what happens so this is how our scatter plot looks like so here we have our legend, then we have the title, then we have our y axis, then x axis. These two are the labels for that. So let me close it and see what is the other plot that we are going to focus on. Now once scatter plot is done, we'll have a look at the area plot or you can even call it as a stack plot. So basically these area graphs are very similar to the line graphs. Okay, They can be used to track changes over time for one or more groups. Area graphs are good to use when you are tracking the changes in two or more related groups that make up one whole category. You can take an example of say public and private groups. Okay. So before I explain you the code, let me tell you one thing guys. The problem here is with polygons, we cannot actually have labels for our data. In order to solve that problem, all we did here was plot some empty lines giving them the same color and the correct labels in accordance with our stack plot. We also gave them a line width of 5 as you can notice here to make the lines a bit thicker in the legend. Now we can easily see that we are spending our days sleeping, eating, working and playing. So this is how the code works. Now let me execute that practically in my PyCharm. So I've copied the code already just to save time again. Now this is our code over here. I've already explained to you why are we defining these empty lines just to add labels. Now let us go ahead and execute this and see what happens. So this is our graph guys and again we have legends title to our graph and Y label as well as X label. So we'll move forward and look at various other plots. This is called a pie plot. So let me tell you about pie charts a bit. So pie charts are pretty much similar to stack plots. Only they are for a certain point in time. Typically a pie chart is used to show parts to the whole and often a percentage share. You can consider the example of percentage of market share and things like that right. Now let me tell you guys matplotlib handles the sizes of the slices and everything. So all we need to do is just feed it the numbers. That's what we have done here. So let me explain you the code here. So over here we have 
So over here we use plt.pie to plot a pie chart. We have slices. We have specified slices. Now slices which are nothing but the relevant sizes for each part. Then we specify the labels and then the colors list. Color list for the corresponding slices. Next we can optionally specify the start angle for the graph. This lets you start the line where you want. In our case we chose a 90 degree angle for the pie chart which means the first division will be a vertical line. Next we can optionally add a shadow as well. And after that we can even use explode to pull out a slice a bit. So we have explode that says 0, 0, 0.1, 0, 0, 0. So because of that you can see that eating has been pulled out a bit. Now basically we have four total slices. So with explode if we didn't want to pull out any slice at all we would have just written here 0, 0, 0, 0. Now if we want to pull out the first slice a bit we would do 0, 0.1 comma 0 comma 0 comma 0. And if we want to pull out the second slice a bit what we can do is 0 comma 0, 0.1 comma 0 comma 0 like in our case. Now finally we do an auto pact. Now this auto pact overlay the percentages on the graph itself. So you can see that we have 8.3, 29.2%, 54.2% all those things written on the graph itself. And then finally add a title and then show it. Now let me execute this practically guys. Now just to save time I've already written the code. So I'm just going to go ahead and execute this and we'll see if it comes or not. Yep, here is our pie chart. So we have seen multiple types of plots. We have seen pie plot, bar plot, histograms, area plot. Now what we need to understand is how to handle multiple plots. So at that time what will you do? Let me open my slides again and we'll move forward with that. So this slide actually tells you how to deal with multiple plots. Now you can notice in the figure as well we have two plots available. Now let me help you out with the code that is there in front of your screen. So in the beginning we are importing a couple of modules. One is matplotlib.pyplot which you are already familiar with. After that there is a numpy module as well. So we have covered numpy modules in the previous sessions. If you have any doubts you can go through it. Now after that you might find this part confusing if you're not familiar with numpy. Now let me just tell you what it does. It will create a numpy array that will have elements between 0 to 5 in the steps of point 1. Now similarly t2 will also be a numpy array that will have elements ranging from 0 to 5 and in the steps of point 0 2. Now after that the code is pretty much similar to the previous examples that we have seen. But there is one new concept that is called subplot. Now let me tell you what this subplot does. It helps us to plot multiple plots alright. So when we write subplot 2 1 1 this means that we have two plots Horizontally we have only one plot present and vertically we have two plots and in that vertical position this plot will be our first graph. Now you can notice that we have one more subplot that is 2, 1, 2. So, so vertically we have two plots, horizontally we have one and this is the second plot. So what I'll do, I'll open my PyCharm and I'll play around with it a bit so that you'll be able to understand it better. So now this is the code guys. First I'll go ahead and execute this and we'll see the result. So we have a graph something which is like this, right? We have two plots which are aligned vertically. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to just minimize this and I'm going to change the subplot value so that you'll be able to understand better how we are dealing with multiple plots. Now over here if I make this as two and this one as well as two. So let us see what we get. So we have got the same graph but it is aligned horizontally if you can notice. This is our another graph and this is our first graph. So you can notice the difference between both of these graphs, right? So this is why we use subplot. So we have certain values in the subplot, right? 2, 2 and 1. Now what this 2 means that we have two graphs available with us. After that, whether I'm aligning it horizontally or vertically. So if I'm doing that horizontally, horizontally I have two graphs. Then among those two graphs, this is my first graph. This, this is what it means. Now similarly when we have 2, 2, 2 here, this means that we have two graphs. Horizontally we have two graphs available and this is the second graph that is present. So similarly if I make a change here and I make this as 2, 1, 1 and this as 2, 1, 2. This means that horizontally we have only one graph and these both graphs are aligned vertically. So we have this was the first graph and this is our second graph. This is how it works. So this is what basically subplot is. How to make a game in Python? For the purpose of developing games in Python, we need the Pygame library, which is used to create games with the attractive graphics, animation and sounds, and also provides the same game experience across multiple platforms. And for this, 
we need a basic programming skill. Now we will see some of the key features of Pygame. First one, graphics, then events, sound and music, sprites, collision detection, and finally game loop. Today, in this session, we are developing a code for Snake Game, where we are dividing it into a four main parts. First one is a cube class, second one snake class, and then function, and finally main function. Now we will begin with a Pygame module installation. To install Pygame, just type pip install Pygame. Hit the enter button. Now it is showing requirement already satisfied, which means I have already installed Pygame module. For those who have not yet installed Pygame, it will get installed in this. Then to view a Pygame is properly installed or not, just type pip show Pygame. Hit the enter button. It will show you the version of Pygame and summary details as well. Here you can see name Pygame and version 2.5.2 and summary Python game development and also some other details. Now, for every game, at least we need three modules. So, first one is a Pygame window, second one event handling, and third one is main logic behind the game. Let's begin with the coding for Pygame window. Open your Visual Studio and take a new file. Let's begin with the coding. To import Pygame, just type it as import Pygame. And then to initialize pygame dot initialize and then now we will declare a variable for screen which defines width and height. So for that screen equals pygame dot display dot set mode with a 400 as width and 500 as a height. Just save this file. Snake game in Python. Okay. We are saving this file in the form of Python. Just click on save. Now, let's run the code. Yes. Can you see the Pygame window screen which blinks for a second and goes off? So, to keep the screen on, we will write code now. Let's declare boolean variable and set it to false. Then equals false. Basically, we have three loops in Python, but for, but for now we are using while loop. To initialize the while loop, we are writing while not done. Now we will use the for loop for event handling in the form of for event. In pygame dot event get method. This will iterate over a list of events that have occurred. And also, next, if we have a current event as a quit, so which is triggered by the user, if that person is clicked on close window, so it has to close the pygame window. So for that, if If event dot type equals pygame dot quit, then done true. This helps in exiting a main loop when a window is closed. And then pygame dot display dot flip. This line of a code helps you pygame window updating according to the code changes that you will make. Just save the code and run it once. Yeah. Now you are able to see Pygame window. Just will minimize this. As you all know that the snake game is one of the popular simple game that we were supposed to play in our childhood days. That too on keypad phones. Yeah, your assumption is right. Now we are going to develop a same game. This is how it looks when I execute the code. I can play the game in Pygame window now. Basically, we are dividing the whole code into four main parts. That is first one cube class, snake class, function and main function. 
We'll just remove this code and we'll begin with the snake game. Guys, if you want to develop this kind of a game, please don't watch. Take up your laptops and start practicing with me because just watching you can't get expertise in Python. So yeah, let's begin. First we will go through the cube class. In this class, we are going to declare a variable for background board, color and position as well. First we'll import all the modules which are needed. Import pygame. Then we'll import import math. Next import random. Then import tk enter as tk. And then from tk enter import message box. Now we'll begin with the cube class. Let's declare class cube. Then we'll declare rows and width equals 500. Okay. Now we will define one instance for cube. Let's initialize. Define initialize. Start direction x equals 1 direction so next self dot position will start and then self dot direction x equals 1 self dot direction y equals 0 and then self dot color equals the given color so here start is the initial position of a cube and next Direction X and direction Y are the default direction for the moment. And then color is the RGB color code for the cube. Now we will define the move method for the movement of snake in a cube's form. So we'll define move method first. Define move self in the form of direction X and direction Y. Self dot direction in the X axis equals direction in the x-axis itself same as this for direction y here the move method updates the cube's position based on a provided direction either it may be an x-axis or a y-axis which means direction towards x-axis and direction towards y-axis the two attributes are updated and the position is adjusted accordingly Next, we will define a draw method which is responsible for rendering the cube on game surface. So, for that, we will define a draw method. Define draw surface i is equals false. Then this equals self dot w, which means width, divided by self dot rows number of rows i comma j equals self dot position with a zero self dot position of one now we will design eyes on a cube where we can use this code snippet for a snake's head so if eyes then we are declaring center variable as center equals distance divided by 2 and then we are assigning radius value equals 3 and then circle middle and circle middle 2 are the shapes of eyes and then we are drawing the circles on the cube surface so this summarizes the functionality of cube class 
which represents the individual segment of a snake in the game. And the next step is creating a snake class for the snake. Class Snake Object. Here we defined a class with the name snake that inherits from the object class. And then initializing a class variable as a body in a list form and turns as a dictionary form. Now we will initialize a new instance of a snake class with a color and initial position. So define initializing self color and then position and then self dot color equals color and then self dot head equals cube position and then self dot body dot append self dot direction x axis equals zero and then self dot direction y axis equals one. So here for the snake head we are using a cube class you can see here we already defined the cube class with a direction in both x and y axis. Next we will write a code for movement of snake. For that define move method. So to move a snake based on the user input we will write a for loop with the event handling. For event in pygame dot event dot get and then we'll check for the quit event also. If event dot type equals pygame dot quit then it has to close the pygame window. Next keys equals pygame dot key dot get pressed method. So this line of a code will get the list of members which represents the state of all the keys and each element in the list is either 0 or 1. So to iterate through all the elements of the list we are writing here for loop for key in keys. Now we will see how arrow keys is used in the snake moment. So here you can see if keys pygame dot key left this line to check if the left arrow key is pressed or not. If so, then we'll write self dot direction x assigned to minus 1. So this will set the horizontal direction and indicating the movement to the left. Then self dot direction y equals 0. So this line indicates that we are setting a vertical direction to 0, which means we are also ensuring a no vertical movement here. And the next line self dot turns self dot h dot positions is assigned to self dot direction x axis and self dot direction y axis. This line indicates the turns dictionary with the current position of a snake's head and also the new directions. This is used to handle turning points in the snake's movement. So we are writing three other form of codes for other three directions with the same logic. Next. Now let's write a code to ensure that the snake remains within the grid boundaries. So this part of a code handles a scenario when a current cube doesn't encounters the turning point. It also ensures that the snake remains within a grid boundaries. Okay. So after that we'll write a else part and the else part is to check whether if a snake is moving a left and has reached or crossed the left boundary if that is true it wraps up the snakes to the rightmost column. So for that we are writing code as if c dot direction equals to negative and c dot position equals to positive or a lesser than zero, then it has to wrap up the rightmost or a leftmost depending upon the previous direction given. So I have written a same kind of a code for all other three directions. Okay, let's move forward. Suppose if you lost the game and want to restart the game on a point of time, we just have to reset all the stored values in it, right? So for this, 
we will write reset method. So here you can see define reset of self and position. After that, self dot head equals cube of position. Here it will create a new head for a snake at a specified position and then self dot body. This line to indicate or to reset the snake's body to an empty list. And then we have self dot body dot append of self dot head. This will add a newly created head to the snake's body list. And then we should also reset the turns which are stored in a previous game for that we have to write self dot turns of dictionary. This will reset the turns dictionary which is stores the turning points for the snake. And also it is important for handling the snake's movement direction. Now we are setting the initial direction of a snake move when the game begins. So we are assigning self dot direction x axis equals to 0 and y axis 2 equals to 1. Now we will write a code to increase the length of snake when snake consumes the food. For that we will define add cube method. Here we have defined add cube method and then tail equals self dot body of minus 1. This will retrieve the snake's last cube of the snake's body which represents the tail of snake. And then we have defined direction x axis and y axis equals tail dot direction x axis and tail dot direction y axis to retrieve the current direction of a tail's cube. Then we are checking the condition if the snake is moving right then adding new cube to the left of the tails. So for that we are checking the condition this and then we are adding tail. Following this I have written the similar code for all other three directions. Now we will write a draw method in a snake's class which is responsible for drawing the snake on the game surface. So for that. So here we have defined a draw method and then for i comma c in enumerate self dot body which indicates that to iterate over a each cube in a snake's body using enumerate where i is a index and c is a current cube and then if i equals 0 this will check if the current cube is a head of a snake or not and then it will execute the else part but here if i equals to 0. If that is satisfied, this will call a draw method of a cube class to draw a head cube on a game surface and also passing a true value as an argument to indicate that eyes should be drawn in the cube. Then if the current cube is not a head, then it will go for else part. And here also it will call the draw method of a cube class to draw a body cubes. Next we will write a draw grid function which is responsible for drawing a grid on game surface. So for that define draw grid with the width and rows and surface as a parameter. Then we have written size between equals w divided by rows which means this will Calculate the size of each grid square by dividing the width of the game surface by the number of rows. And then we assigned x equals 0 and y equals 0 to initialize the starting coordinates for drawing the grid. And to iterate through the each row, we need for loop. So we have written for L in range of rows. Then we have to update the x and y coordinates for next horizontal and vertical lines in the grid. For that we have written x equals x plus size between and y equals y plus size between. After that we will draw vertical and horizontal line using draw dot line dot method. Next we have to write a code for redraw window. Basically redraw window function draws the snake and food on the surface and also adds a grid clarity and then also shows the updated cubes. So for that first we have to define the redraw window and passing a parameter with the surface. Then next global rows width yes snack or food we can say 
here we declared the variable rows width yes which means snake and snack as a global variables and then we have surface dot fill with the values which fills the entire surface with a green color and the numbers 0 128 and 0 represents the rgb value for green color next yes dot draw we are passing a surface as a parameter so this calls a method to draw on a snake to draw it on a surface again and then we have snag dot draw and passing the surface as a parameter this calls a method to draw on the food which means snags to draw it on a surface next we have draw grid and passing the parameter with the width rows and surface so here the grid is likely used for better visualization in a game and finally we have pygame.display.update this line of a code represents to update a display to show all the changes made on the surface and this is necessary for the player to see the updated state of the game now we have to write a code to generate food randomly so for that we are defining here random snack and passing a parameters with the rows and items then to get a body position of a snake, we are declaring a position as a variable equals item dot body. And then, to start an infinite loop to keep generating a random positions, for that we have written while true. And then, we should also generate a random coordinates for both x and y coordinates. For that, we have written a x equals and y equals random dot rand range of rows. Then, we have to check for the overlap. So, we are checking a condition if length of least filter lambda and the following code. This will help in checking if a generated position xy overlaps with the any part of the snack. So, we are using here filter. So, using a filter and lambda to create a list of positions that match the generated coordinates. And then we are going to continue this. So, here we have written continue. To just check if there is an overlap and continue is a next iteration to generate a new position or else we have to break and then finally it will return a valid position of x and y coordinate lastly we have to define message box this function is responsible for displaying a message box using tk inter message box module here we have written root equals tk dot tk module so, which means this is necessary for creating a TK inter based GUI elements. And the next line will indicate that uh, this will set the root window to be always on top of other windows and also ensures that the message box will be visible if there are any other windows are open also. Then we have window.withdraw. So, this withdraws the root window and this is done to prevent the actual root window from being displayed. Following this, we have message box dot show information. So this is to display an information message box using a show information method from a TK inter message box module. And here we are passing subject and content as a parameter for the title and content of message box. Next, we have written a try block to attempt to close the root window. And also we have written accept and pass block. This is used to handle the case where if window is already closed and finally the main functionality of code so we have already written a main function this function initializes the game related variables create game objects and runs the main game loop which also handles the user input update the game state and also check for the collisions and if collision occurs it displays a message box and reset the game so here we have written global width rows yes and snack. This is nothing but a we declared a variables as width rows yes and snake as a global variables. As we all know that global variables accessible throughout the program. And then we have assigned a values for width and rows as 520. And then we have created a variable win to display the dimensions as win equals pi game dot display dot set mode width width. Here we have declared a yes variable to display or to assign the snake's color and starting position of the snake. Next we have written 
snack equals cube rand and snack of rose snake and color of with the yellow color values with this we have created a cube of a snack with the yellow color at a random position that is not occupied by the snake then we have flag equals true to control the main game loop and then what about time so to control the time frame rate of a game we are writing a code as clock equals spy game dot time dot clock module and then we have written while flag this starts a continuous loop that runs as long as the flag is true and we will add a short delay time to control the speed of a game loop next yes dot move which calls a move method of a snake and also handles user input and update the snake's position then we have written a if condition to check if the snake's head is at the same position as a snack and if that is a true it adds a new cube to the snake's body and making it longer then a snack is created at a random position ensuring that it does not overlap with a snake and has a yellow color of cube then we have written a for loop to iterate through the each segment of a snake's body and check if the position of a segment matches any position in the remaining body if that matches then it indicates a self collision and prints the score or displays a loss message then begin with the resetting the snake's position next exit the loop and then finally the game window is redrawn let's execute this code once yes you are able to see the pi game window and the snake is moving horizontally from left to right so we'll just play once Now, who is a Python developer? A Python developer is a software engineer who specializes in designing, building and maintaining software applications using Python. Developers will write, test and debug Python code for a variety of applications such as web development, data analysis, machine learning and automation. Now we will discuss the career opportunities for Python learners. First in the list we have web development and then data scientist machine learning engineering devops engineering and then finally full stack development next let us know the salary structure for python developers the average salary for python developer is 7.5 lakhs per annum in india whereas in usa the average salary for python developer is around 107000 dollars let us know what is python python is a high level general purpose programming language that is known for its ease of use readability and versatility python widely used in variety of fields which includes web development data analysis machine learning and automation let's begin with the python variables and python data types so what is a variable a variable is a memory location to store values it is just like a jar where you can store your favorite candies for example age is equals to 30 so here age is a variable name and we have placed a number 30 inside it moving on to the data types basically we have five kinds of data types so first one is a numeric type then boolean set dictionary and finally sequence type so in numeric type we again have a three types that is integer complex and float number and in sequence type we have a three types and they are string list and tuple let's see them in brief so first we have strings so a string is a sequence of characters and it is a most common data type for storing alpha values for example name is equals to wish so here name is a variable name and wish is a word that is stored in a variable 
Next we have integer. So these are the whole numbers that can be positive, negative or a zero and does not include decimal part or a fraction. For example, x is equals to 5. So here x is a variable name and we have assigned an integer value as a 5. After this, we will look at complex numbers. So it is a type of data type that can hold a complex number which is in the form of a plus b i. For example, z is equals to 2 plus 4 i. And then we have floating point. So floating point is a number with a decimal point or a fraction. For example, y is equals to 3.14. Here, y is a variable name and it holds the floating point number as 3.14. Following this, we have booleans. These are like yes or no statements and they can only be true or false. For example, is student equals true. Here, is student is a variable and it is set to true value because the person is a student. Moving forward, we have sets. Sets are a type of data structure that allows for storing multiple items in a single variable. For example, fruits is equals to apple, mango and orange. So here, these items store in a fruit set. And then we have tuples. It is a built-in data type that allows you to create sequences of values that are immutable, which means they can't be changed. For example, new tuple is equals to ABC24 and PQR. So here these are values stored in a new tuple that are immutable. Lists are like a containers that can hold a different types of data. But lists are mutable. This is the only difference between tuple and list. For example, new list is equals to apple, mango and orange. These are the items stored in a new list. And lastly, we have dictionaries. Dictionaries are like similar to a language dictionaries where the data are stored in the form of key value pairs. For example, new dictionary is equals to a name Tanu and age 20. So here, name, age are the keys and Tanu and 20 are values. Now, moving on to the control flow statements. Control flow is all about making decisions, repeating tasks and handling errors in your programs. So, let's explore how it works. Imagine you have a set of instructions and you want your program to make some decisions based on some conditions. So, that's where conditional statements comes in. So, let's see if statement. This is basically used to check only one condition. For example, x equals 10. If x is greater than 0, then it will print x is a positive. So in this example, we are checking x value is a positive or not. So if the given x value is satisfies, then it will print x is a positive. So after executing this code snippet, we will get the output as x is positive. And then next we have if else statement. This is used when we have other options for already given condition. For example, x equals 10. If x is greater than 0, then it has to print x is positive. Or else it has to print x is a not positive value. So as we know that obviously x is a greater than 0 value, which means 10. So after executing this code snippet, we will get the output as x is positive. And then we have else if statement. This statement is used when we have two or more conditions. For example, y equals 0 and the condition is y is greater than 0. If this condition is satisfied, then it will print as x is positive or else it will check for another condition that is given y equals 0. Then that condition is satisfied, then it will print y is 0 or else it will print the y is negative value. So after executing this code snippet, we will get the output as y is 0. So because we have already assigned y equals 0 in the beginning of code. So now let's talk about loops. Loops are like repeating buttons on music players. They help you to do the same things for multiple times. Let's see for for loop. For example, we have for i in range 5, print hello. So in this example, we use for loop to print hello for 5 times. So when we execute this code snippet, we will get as output hello, 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 hello for 5 times. Then next we have while loop. 
we can use the while loop statement to execute a series of statements as long as the condition is true. So let's see for the example so that you will understand easily. For example, count is equals to 0 and the condition while count is less than 5. Next print count and then count increment. So basically, while loop requires a relevant variable to be ready. So in this example, we have count indexing variable which is set to 0. So after executing this code snippet, we get the output as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's moving on to break statement. Sometimes you might want to change the flow of your code. So on that point of time, you can use break statement. So break is like an emergency stop button and continue is like a skipping to the next step. Let's see example for break statement. For i in range 10, and the condition if i equals 5 and then we have break statement following this we have print statement so in this example we have used loop condition if and break statement so here loop iterates from 0 to 10 and also checks the condition if that condition is not satisfied then it go on printing the values of i if that condition is satisfied then it will execute the break statement i hope you understand this one so after executing this code snippet, we will get the output as 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Now we will explore the exception and file handling. So first we will look into exceptional handling. So this manages and responds to errors that occurs during programming execution and also preventing unexpected issues like division by zero or invalid input. In exceptional handling, we can mainly use three main keywords. They are try, accept and finally. Let's see example for exceptional handling. Try, result equals to 10 division by 0, then accept 0 division error and then print statement. So in this example, try block contains the code that attempts to perform division operation. Next we have accept block. So this block is executed if an exception occurs in a try block statement. So after executing this code snippet, we will get the output as division by 0 is not allowed. Why? Because it catches a 0 division error exception while executing try block. Now we will see file handling. Basically we have two types. First one is a text file handling and then we have binary file handling. So here, Text file handling deals with the plain text files for reading and writing using some of the functions like open, read, write and close. And then binary file handling which manages a non-text file such as images or videos by using functions like open in binary mode which is rb for reading and wb for writing. And the next topic is modules and libraries. Think of a modules. They are like a specialized toolkits. When you import a module, you can gain access to a set of pre-built functions, variables and classes tailored for specific tasks. For example, math. A math module helps with the mathematical operations. And then we have random. A random module is used to generate a zero random numbers. Next we have OS. OS helps in operating system related tasks. Moving forward, we have date time. Date time module handles date and time operation in the system. And then we have system. The Python system module provides access to some variables used or maintained by interpreter, as well as the functions that interact significantly with the interpreter. Now, let's talk about libraries. Libraries is a grand collection of modules. If modules are a tools, libraries are like entire toolboxes. So here, each libraries are specialized for different tasks. Let's see them. So first in the list we have pandas. Pandas is basically used for data manipulation wizard. And with the pandas, it is very easy to handle the data sets. And then we have numpy. Numpy is a mathematically powerhouse for numerical operations which is used in Python. Moving forward, we have matplotlib. So this manages the visualization with the versatility. Next, we have Seaboard. 
So Seaborn adds his styles to data graphs. And finally, we have TensorFlow. TensorFlow is a powerful machine learning library. And also, TensorFlow smoothly drives the deep learning applications. Now, let's explore data structure and sorting techniques. So what do you mean by data structure? As we all know that, data structure are specialized formats for organizing, retrieving, processing and storing data in an efficient manner. So where all we can use data structure? We can use data structure in stacks, queues, heaps, arrays, linked list and also in trees. Next we will see for sorting techniques. A sorting algorithm is a method that categorizes a collection of items based on predefined criteria, enhancing the data accessibility and also visualization in the system. Some of the sorting techniques are bubble sort, selection sort, insertion sort, merge sort and then we have quick sort and finally heap sort. Let's see a few important topics. Learning these topics helps in campus placements and coding challenges as well. So first we have binary search. It is an algorithm used to find a position of a targeted value within a sorting list or array. And then next we have recursion. This is a programming technique that breaks down a problems into a smaller chunks or an instance we can say that results in concise solutions for self-similar substructures. And finally we have hash tables. A hash table is a data structure that stores and retrieves key value pairs in an efficient manner by mapping keys to arrays indices using a hash function. Now we we'll look on to the OOPS concept. OOPS concept is essential component of software development due to its several reasons such as classes, objects, inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation and abstraction. Next we will see about functional programming. So functional programming is a programming approach that utilizes pure function, immutability, functional concepts to solve problems such as lambda function and map reduce or filter operations. Moving forward, we will see regular expressions. These are essential in computer programming for pattern matching, text manipulation and defining search patterns. And this is used for various text processing tasks such as pattern matching, validation and text extraction. Let us know about decorators and generators. Decorators in Python are versatile tools that enables the modifications or enhancement of the behavior of functions or methods. Decorators are created using at the rate decorator keyword and can be applied to functions or methods. And then we have generators. Generators simplify iterator creations by using a yield keyword to produce a sequence of values once at a time instead of gathering all values simultaneously. Let us know about advanced libraries. So first we have tkinter. tkinter is a python based GUI library that specifies the creation of desktop applications with the graphic interfaces across various platforms. And then we have Kiwi. Kiwi is a renowned for its user-friendly and interactive interfaces, making it ideal for creating touch-based or gesture-based applications. Following this, we have WX Python. This library is widely utilized in a various desktop applications, such as utilities, business software, and scientific applications. Next, let's understand the frameworks. These frameworks are used for web application development. So first we have Django. This is a high level web framework that offers tools and libraries for building a robust web applications quickly. Focusing on reusability and following the model view controller architecture. Then we have Flask. This is a lightweight, flexible micro web framework which offers essential components for web application development. This will allow developers to customize their features based on their specific needs. Lastly, we have Tornado. This is a web framework 
and as an asynchronous networking library for developing high performance network applications. Let's move on to Git version control concept. Git version control tracks the changes in code and also allows for reverting to the previous versions and enable the multiple developers to work on same project. Git version offers us several advantages such as version control, collaboration, branching and then we have history also. Following this we also have annotations, distributed development and finally security. Additionally, Git ensures data integrity through hashing and authentication mechanisms. And the last topic is deployment process. To deploy a web application to a hosting service, you have to follow a few steps. So first you have prepare. Prepare your application by ensuring it is fully developed and tested. After this you have hosting service. Choose a hosting service that meets your project's requirement such as Azure, AWS, DigitalOcean or Netlify. Next we have hosting account. Set up a hosting account and get familiarized yourself with a control panel or a dashboard. Following this we have web server. Configure the web server and the database according to your tech stack and also install the necessary softwares and also set up the servers. Next we have prepare application. So in this step you have to prepare the application for deployment by updating configuration files and also ensuring the code base is ready for deployment. And then you have deploy code. So here you have to upload the application code and also assist to the hosting service. And then you have set up a domain. So in this step we have to set up a domain and DNS and also ensuring a proper SSL certificates for secure connections. And the next step is migrate. In this step we have to migrate developer data to a production database for consistency. Following this we have security as a next step. So we have to implement the security measures like firewalls, intrusion detection and also regular updates. And the next step is optimize web server. So we have to optimize web server settings, database queries and also assist delivery for faster page loading. Moving forward we have monitoring. So in this step we have to set up a monitoring tools and backup procedures to track a servers and application performance. Following this we have test application. In this step we have to test our application in a production space whether it is working as expected or not. And the next step is scale. In this step we have to scale our hosting resources if that is necessary. And the next step is maintain records. So we have to keep detailed records of your deployment steps and also configurations for future references. And the final step is updates. So in this step we follow continue to monitor and maintain your applications including updates, scaling and resolving issues. So finally the process may vary based on hosting services and the project requirement. So refer the documentations for platform specific instructions. Apart from these skills, if you want to become a Python developer, you must also know these skills. To excel in Python development, one must master web application technologies like HTML, CSS and JavaScript. So these technologies enable the creation of user interfaces, style web pages and add interactive elements to the applications. And other skills like critical thinking and problem solving are essential skills for any developers. As a Python developer, you will face a very complex challenges that needs a very creative solutions as well. So the ability to break down problems, analyze them and finding solutions is a skill that you will continuously learn. Next we have databases. It's a very important skill for Python developer, especially when you are working on projects that involves interacting with the relational databases. Lastly, we will discuss some projects using Python. So first one simple games like number guessing, rock paper scissor and tic tac toy game. You can also generate a chatbot system using natural language understanding. You can also create recommendation system for online learnings. And finally you can generate web application using machine learning.
first question is what are the common built in data types in python the common built in data types in python are numbers list tuple string set dictionary and boolean coming to numbers they include integers floating point numbers and complex number list and ordered sequence of items is called a list the elements of list may belong to different data types tuple it is also an ordered sequence of elements unlike list tuples are immutable which means they can't be changed string a sequence of characters is called a string they are declared within a single or double quotes set sets are a collection of unique items that are not in order dictionary a dictionary stores value in key and value pairs where each value can be accessed through its key the order of items is not important in case of dictionary boolean there are two boolean values true and false now moving to our next question what are the key features of python python is an interpreted language that means unlike languages like c and its variants python does not need to be compiled before it's run other interpreted languages include php and ruby python is dynamically typed which means that you don't need to state the types of variables when you declare them or anything like that python is well suited to object oriented programming in that it allows the definition of classes along with composition and inheritance python does not have access specifiers like c++ public private in python functions are first class objects this means that they can be assigned to variables returned from other functions and passed into functions classes are also first class objects in python writing code in python is fast but running it can be slow compared to other languages that are compiled luckily python lets you use some parts written in c to speed up things where it is really really important a great example of this is numpy a tool that works quickly because it handles its heavy math task outside of python python find use in many spheres web application automation scientific modeling big data applications and many many more it is also often used as a glue code to get other languages and components to play nice moving to a third question what are lambda functions in python lambda functions in python are small anonymous functions that can have any number of arguments but they can only have one expression think of them as tiny disposable functions that you create on the fly without giving them a name here is the basic syntax that you can see on the screen for example if you want a function that squares a number you can create a lambda functions like this you can use square 5 to get the output as 25 moving to our next question is python a compiled language or an interpreted language python works in two ways partly compiled and partly interpreted when we run our code python first compiles it creating something called byte code then the python virtual machine changes its byte code to work properly on our computer and its operating system moving to our fifth question what are python namespaces in python a namespace is like a label box where python keep track of names you give to the things you create like variables and functions there are four types built in namespace holds all the default stuff in python next is global namespace where things you create in the main part of the program go third enclosing namespace if you have functions inside other functions the inner functions can access the outer function stuff fourth one is local namespace inside a function python creates a separate box for its stuff think of namespaces as organized boxes where python stores your stuff based on where you create it it helps python keep track of everything you have made moving to our sixth question what are local variables and global variables in python moving to global variables variables declared outside a function or in a global space are called global variables these variables can be accessed by any function in the program for example you can check this code this code initializes a global variable x to 0 then uses a function increment to increase its value by 1 by employing the global keyword increment modifies the global x ensuring it affects the variable globally the program first print x as 0 then calls increment and then prints the updated value of x as 1 demonstrating how a global variable can be modified and accessed throughout a program coming to local variables any variable declared inside a function is known as local variable 
This variable is present in the local space and not in the global space. For example, you can check this code. In this example, the local count is a local variable defined within the show count function. Each time show count is called, local count is initialized to zero, incremented by one, and its value is printed. The local variable scope is limited to the function in which it is defined, so it gets reinitialized with each function call, demonstrating how local variables maintain their scope and are not preserved across function calls. Moving to seventh question, what is self in Python? Self represents an instance or object of a class. In Python, it is explicitly included as the first parameter, but in Java, it's optional. It serves to distinguish between a class methods and attributes from local variables. In the init method, self points to the newly created object, while in other methods, it points to the object that called the method. Moving to our next question, how are arguments passed? By value or by reference in Python? In Python, arguments are passed to functions by assignment, which is often described as pass by object reference or pass by sharing. This means that the function receives a reference to the actual object, not a copy of the object. If the object is mutable, changes made within the function can affect the original object. However, if the object is immutable, it cannot be changed within the function. Any attempt to modify it will result in the creation of a new object, leaving the original unchanged. Moving to our ninth question, what is a pass in Python? To pass, signifies executing no action or serving as a placeholder within a compound statement. It essentially indicates a blank space where no specific action is required or written. You can check this code. In this code, the do nothing function uses the pass statement as a placeholder, indicating that no action is taken when the function is called. The pass statement is useful in scenarios where a statement is syntactically required but you don't want any command or code to execute, effectively serving as a do-nothing operation. Moving to our 10th question. What is dynamically typed language? Dynamically typed languages are languages that do not require any predefined data type for any variable as it is interpreted at runtime by the machine itself. In these languages, interpreters assign the data type to a variable at runtime depending on its value. Moving to our 11th question. What is pepate? PEP stands for Python Enhancement Proposal. It is a set of rules that specify how to format Python code for maximum readability. Moving to our next question. What is Python Path? It is an environment variable that is used when a module is imported. Whenever a module is imported, Python Path is also looked up to check for the presence of the imported modules in the various directories. The interpreter uses it to determine which module to load. Moving to the next question. What are Python modules? Name some commonly used built-in modules in Python. Python modules are files containing the Python code. This code can either be a function class or variables. A Python module is a .py file containing executable code. Some of the commonly used built-in modules are OS, Sys, Math, Random, DateTime, and JSON. Moving to the next question. What is break and continue in Python? The break statement is used to exit the loop prematurely when a certain condition is met. The continue statement is used to skip the current iteration of the loop and continue with the next iteration. You can check this example. In the first loop, when i equals 3, the break statement is encountered and the loop exits. In the second loop, when i equals 2, the continue statement is encountered and the loop proceeds to the next iteration without executing the print statement for 2. Moving to the 15th question. Can we pass a function as an argument in Python? Yes, in Python, you can pass a function as an argument to another function. This is possible because functions in Python are first class objects, meaning they can be treated by any other object such as an integer, string, or list. You can assign them to variables, store them in data structures, and yes, pass them as arguments to other functions. Check this piece of code. In this example, shout and whisper are functions that are passed as arguments to the greet function. The greet function then calls the passed in function with a name argument, demonstrating how functions can be dynamically passed around and invoked within Python. Now, moving to our 16th question, what does hash symbol do in Python? Hash is used 
to comment on everything that comes after on the line. Hash symbol in Python is used to denote comments. For example, hash, this is a single line comment in Python. This line is not being executed when the Python runs the code. Moving to our 17th question. What is type conversion in Python? Type conversion refers to the conversion of one data type into another. Int converts any data type into integer type. Float converts any data type into float type. ORD converts characters into integers. Hex converts integers into hexadecimals. Oct converts integers into octal. Tuple, this function is used to convert to a tuple. Set, this function returns the type after converting to set. List, this function is used to convert any data type to a list type. Dict, any function is used to convert a tuple of order key value into a dictionary. str, it is used to convert integer into a string. Moving to the next question, what is dog string in Python? In Python, a dog string is a string literal that occurs as a first statement in a module function, class, or method definition. Its purpose is to provide documentation about the object such as its purpose, usage, parameters, return values, and other relevant information. Dog strings are typically enclosed in triple quotes and can span multiple lines. They serve as a form of inline documentation and are accessible throughout the object's doc attribute. Dog strings are essential for code readability, maintainability, and understanding as they help developers and users to understand how to use and interact with the code effectively. Moving to the 19th question, what is slicing in Python? Slicing is used to access parts of sequences like tuples and strings. The syntax of slicing you can see on the screen. It's start, end, step. This step can be omitted as well when we write start, end. This returns all the elements of the sequence from the start inclusive till the end minus one element. If the start or end element is negative i, it means that the ith element is from the end. The step indicates the jump or how many elements have to be skipped. Moving to the 20th question. What is pickling and unpickling? The pickle module accepts any Python object, converts it into a string representation and dumps it into a file by using the dump function. This process is called pickling. The process of retrieving original Python objects from the stored string representation is called unpickling. Now, let's move to the intermediate level questions. Explain inheritance in Python. Inheritance allows one class to gain all the members, say attributes and methods of another class. Inheritance provides code reusability and makes it easier to create and maintain an application. The class from which we are inheriting is called a superclass. And the class which is being inherited is called the subclass or child class or it is also known as a derived class. There are four different types of inheritance supported by Python. Single inheritance, multi-level inheritance, hierarchical inheritance, and multiple inheritance. When it comes to single inheritance, where a derived class acquires the member of a single superclass. Multi-level inheritance. A derived class C is inherited from base class B, which is derived from class A. Hierarchical inheritance. From one base class, you can inherit any number of child classes. Coming to multiple inheritance, a derived class is inherited from more than one base class. Does Python make use of access specifiers? Python does have mechanism for controlling access to attributes and methods of objects, but it does not have explicit access specifiers like some other programming languages such as Java or C++. In Python, attributes and methods can be accessed freely from outside the class definition unless you explicitly make them private. Conventionally, attributes or methods that start with a single underscore are considered to be protective, meaning they should be accessed only within the class or by subclass. Attribute or methods that start with double underscore are considered private and are name mangled, meaning the names are changed to include the class name, making them harder to access from outside the class. Discuss different ways of deleting an element from a list. There are two ways in which we can delete elements from the list. One is the remove function and one by using the pop function. Let's check the remove function first. The remove function deletes a mentioned element from the list. The pop function deletes the element mentioned at specific index from the list. How are classes created in Python? 
In Python, classes are created using the class keyword, followed by the class name and a colon. Inside the class, methods and attributes can be defined. The init method is a special method called a constructor used for initializing newly created objects. Here is a basic example. In this example, my class has two attributes, attribute 1 and attribute 2, and one method as my method. The self parameter is a reference to the current instance of the class and is used to access variables and methods associated with the current object. Moving to the next question. Write a program in Python to execute the bubble sort algorithm. Bubble sort is a straightforward sorting algorithm that repeatedly steps through the list, compares adjacent elements and swaps them if they are in wrong order. The pass through the list is repeated until the list is sorted. Although it is not the most efficient algorithm for the large data sets, it's a classic example for learning sorting algorithm. Let's take this example to understand bubble sort. We have a list of numbers. Here in iteration 1, first the sorting will compare 11 and 7. We can see that 11 is larger than 7, so a swapping of the positions are being done. Similarly, the bubble will move forward and it will compare 9 and 15. Since 9 is already smaller than 15, there will be no change. And similarly, the process will go on. After that, for the iteration 2, we have 11, 7, 9, 15, 23, 21, and 26. Again, the same process will continue. The number of iterations will take place until we have a fully sorted list. Over here, you can check the code for bubble sorting. The program first defines a bubble sort function that takes a list array as its parameter. It then uses two nested loops to traverse the list and compare each pair of adjacent elements. If a pair is in wrong order, either the first is greater than the second, the elements are swapped. This process repeats until the entire list is sorted. Finally, the program demonstrates using the bubble sort function with an example list of integers and print the sorted list. Write a code snippet to generate the square of every element in a list. If you want to generate the square of every element in a list, you can use list comprehension in Python, which is a concise way to create list. Here's the simple code snippet to achieve that. The code takes each number in the numbers list, squares it, and then the squared value are collected into a new list called squared number. When you run the code, it will give the output as 1, 4, 9, 16, and 25. Moving to the next question, write a program to produce the Fibonacci series in Python. The Fibonacci series is a sequence of numbers where each number is the sum of the two preceding ones, usually starting with 0 and 1. Here is the code and let's understand how it works. We first start with the first two Fibonacci numbers which are 0 and 1. Then in each iteration starting from the third term, we calculate the next Fibonacci number by adding the last two numbers in the series. We append the new calculated Fibonacci number to the list. We repeat this process until we have generated n terms in the Fibonacci series. Finally, the program takes user input for the number of terms and prints the Fibonacci series up to the number of terms. What is the difference between a shallow copy and a deep copy? The difference between shallow copy and deep copy is primarily about how they handle these nested objects. A shallow copy creates a new object but instead of copying the nested object, it just copies the references to them. This means that the original and the copy will share the same nested objects. Changes to the nested object in the copied object will affect the original object and vice versa. However, changes to the container object will not affect the other. You can create a shallow copy of an object by using the copy method. A deep copy creates a new object and recursively copies all the objects it contains. Unlike a shallow copy, the copy and the original do not share any nested objects. Changes made to any level of the copied object will not affect the original object and vice versa. You can create a deep copy of an object using the copy module's deep copy function. Write a program in Python to check if a sequence is a palindrome. A palindrome is a sequence of characters which reads the same backward as forward. Examples of palindrome include words like radar or level or numbers like 1, 2, 3, 2, 1, or sequences of characters that form the same sequence in reverse. To determine if a sequence is a palindrome in Python, we can write a function that compares the sequence to its reverse. If the sequence matches its reverse, then it's a palindrome. 
This program defines a function is palindrome that takes a sequence as input and returns true if the sequence is a palindrome and false otherwise. It works by first converting the sequence into a list to ensure the reverse operation works uniformly across different types of sequences like strings and tuples. Then it compares the original list with its reverse version to determine if the sequence is a palindrome. Moving to our next question. How is multithreading achieved in Python? Multithreading allows different part of program to run simultaneously, making the program faster and more responsive. Multithreading in Python is achieved using the threading module, which provides a way to create and manage threads. Threads are smaller units of execution that runs concurrently within the process. Python's threading module allows you to create multiple threads, each performing different tasks simultaneously. Here is a simple example demonstrating the usage of multithreading in Python. In this example, we create a subclass mythread of threading.thread and override its run method with the code we want to thread to execute. We create two instances of mythread, start them and wait for them to complete using the join method. Meanwhile, the main thread continues to execute. This program will output the message from both the threads concurrently. How is memory managed in Python? Python utilizes a private heap space to store all objects, with the Python memory manager overseeing different aspects of this heap including sharing, caching, segmentation and allocation. Control over the heap remains solely within the Python interpreter, leaving users with no direct access or influence over its operation. Whenever Python exits, why isn't all the memory deallocated? Python does deallocate most memory upon process exit. But there are scenarios where memory may not be immediately reclaimed due to the factors such as garbage collection overhead, external resource management and memory leaks. However, from the perspective of the operating system, all memory and resources allocated by the Python process are eventually reclaimed when the process exits. Now, if you want to know more about garbage collection overhead, external resource management and memory leaks, then you can refer a Python programming certification course, the link to which is in the description box below. Which is faster? Python list or NumPy arrays and why? NumPy arrays are faster than Python list for numerical operations. NumPy, an open source library designed for array manipulation in Python, furnishes efficient functions for numerical computations on arrays. The swiftness of NumPy arises from its implementation in C, which facilitates quick executions compared to Python list. Python list being implemented in Python and interpreted language lack the speed advantage of NumPy arrays operations, which is executed in a compiled language. What is the process of compilation and linking in Python? In Python, compilation and linking process are somewhat abstracted from the developer due to the nature of the language being interpreted rather than compiled. However, there are still compilations and linking processes that occur behind the scenes when working with Python modules, especially those containing C extensions or when used external libraries. Coming to compilation, for pure Python code, there is no separate compilation step. Python code is compiled to bytecode by the Python interpreter when it is executed. However, when using Python modules containing C extensions, there is a compilation step involved. These C extensions need to be compiled into machine code that can be executed by the computer's processor. Compilation of C extensions is typically handled using a compiler such as GCC on Unix-like systems or MSVC on Windows. Moving on to linking. After the compilation of C extensions, the resulting object files need to be linked together to form executable files or shared libraries. During the linking process, references between different object files are resolved and necessary libraries are linked to the final executable or library. Linking is handled by the linker, such as ID on Unix-like systems and link.exe on Windows. How to add new column to Pandas data frame? Adding new column to Pandas data frame is being demonstrated in the following code. The code import the pandas library to create a data frame from the dictionary that maps first and second to the panda series with specified indices, resulting in different lengths and nn for missing values. It then adds a third column to df using a new series with values 10, 20, 30 indexed by a, b, c. The attempt to add a fourth column aims to the sum of the first and the anonymous reference into third which would sum values from the first and third columns. The code imports the pandas library and creates a data frame from the dictionary data info that maps the first and second to pandas series with specified indices, 
resulting in different lengths and NaN for missing values. It then adds a third column to DF using a new series with values 10, 20, 30, indexed by ABC. The attempt to add a fourth column aims to the sum of the first and an anonymously referent in fourth third, which would sum values from the first and third columns. The code concludes by printing DF after each column addition, demonstrating how to dynamically expand a data frame. Now, let's finally move to the advanced level interview questions. And here it comes the first question from advanced level. Write a code to sort an array in NumPy by the n-1th column. You can sort a NumPy array by the n-1th column using the numpy.arg sort function to obtain the indices that would sort the array along the specified axis. Here is how you can do it. The column will output the original array and the sorted array based on the n-1th column. Firstly, it selects the last column of the array. Then, it returns the indices that would sort the last column of the array. ARR sorted indices uses the sorted indices to rearrange the rows of an array based on the sorting from the n-1th column. How do you compute the Euclidean distance between two series? To compute the Euclidean distance between two series in Python, you can use the skypy.spatial.distance module and here is how you can do it. In this code, we import numpy as np and the Euclidean function from the scipy.spatial.distance. We define two sample series, series 1 and series 2 as numpy arrays. We use the Euclidean function to compute the Euclidean distance between series 1 and series 2. Finally, we print the computed Euclidean distance between the two series. How do you get the items not common to both series A and series B? To get the items that are not common in both pandas series A and B, you can use the pandas.series.isn method combined with boolean indexing. This method allows you to filter out the items present in one series but not in other. You can then concatenate the unique elements from both series to get the full list of items that are not common to both. Here is how you can do it. The script performs the following step. Firstly, it uses a.isnb to find elements in A that are not in B and vice versa for b dot is in a. It then concatenates the result not in b and not in a into a single series containing all unique items not common to both original series. Finally, it prints out the concatenated series containing the items that are not common to both a and b. The result will be a series containing all the items that are unique to each series, effectively showing the items not common to both a and b. What is Flask and explain its benefits? Flask is a micro web framework written in Python. It is classified as micro because it is lightweight and requires minimal setup to get a simple application up and running. But it is also extensible enough to support complex applications as well. Flask provides the tools, libraries and technologies necessary to build a web application. This framework allows you to build web applications rapidly with minimum lines of code. It is a modular and flexible design making it adaptable for developers to tailor the applications with the required components. Coming to the benefits, firstly it comes simplicity. Flask, straightforward and easy to understand syntax makes it accessible for beginners. The framework is easy to set up and get started with, which is ideal for small projects or when learning web development basics. Then it comes to flexibility. Unlike more comprehensive framework that dictates specific ways to achieve tasks, Flask is unopinated about how the things should be done. This flexibility allows developers to use the components they prefer and structure the application in the way that works best for them. The third one is lightweight. Flask does not automatically include tools and libraries that your project may not need, making it very lightweight and efficient. Its simplicity and lack of overhead make it a performant for many types of objects. Then it comes to extensibility. While Flask is minimalistic out of the box, it can be easily extended with a wide variety of extensions available for tasks such as validation, user authentication, database integration and more. This means you can start simple and add more functionality as needed. Lastly, it comes to the robust ecosystem. Despite its simplicity, Flask is supported by a large and active community. There are numerous extensions and packages available that can help to add functionality to Flask applications quickly. Is Django better than Flask. Django and Flask both serve to translate URLs or web addresses inputted into browser into Python functions. Flask offers a more user-friendly experience than Django, but it requires you to define more details yourself, as it provides less out-of-box functionality. On the other hand, 
Django automates many aspects of web development, reducing the need for manual configuration. Django comes with pre-existing code that users need to understand, while Flask gives users the flexibility to write their own code, potentially making it simpler to learn. Each framework excels technically and comes up with its unique strengths and weaknesses. What is the use of sessions in Django framework? In Django framework, sessions are used to persist information across user requests, enabling the server to remember data about a user's activity and preferences. The mechanism is crucial for functionalities like user authentication, where sessions keep users logged in as they navigate different parts of the web application. Sessions also store user preferences or shopping cart contents, enhancing the user experience without compromising security, as the data is stored server-side. Django simplifies session management by providing a secure and customizable system that can use various backend to store session data, making it a powerful tool for developers to maintain the state and user-specific data efficiently. Write a one-liner that will count the numbers of capital letters in a file. Your code should work even if the file is too big to fit in the memory. So first, let us check how normally the code would look like. In this code, we open the file file.txt in read mode. We iterate through each line in the file using a for loop. For each line, we iterate through each character using another for loop. We check if each character is uppercase using the isUpper method. If a character is uppercase, we increment the count variable by 1. Finally, we print the total count of capital letters in the file. Now, the equivalent one-liner. This one-liner does the same thing as a previous code, but is written in a condensed form using list comprehension and the sum function. It iterates over each line and the character in the file, checks if the character is uppercase and sums up the count for the uppercase. Discuss Django architecture. Django follows a model view template architecture which organizes web applications into three main layers, model, view, and template. The model layer represents the application's data structure and interacts with the database using Django's object relational mapping, which is also called as ORM. Model defines the data schema, including fields, relationships, and behavior, allowing developers to work with database records as Python objects. The view layer handles the application's business logic and user interaction. Views receive HTTP requests, process data from the model layer, and generate HTTP responses. They encapsulate application logic, handling tasks such as data retrieval, processing, and rendering. Views interact with the model layer to retrieve or modify data and use templates to render dynamic HTML content for the user. The template layer manages the presentation of the data to the user. Templates are HTML files with embedded template tags and filters that generate dynamic content based on the data passed from the viewer layer. Django's template engine supports template inheritance, reusable templates, and powerful template tags for processing data and rendering HTML output. List out the inheritance styles in Django. In Django, there are three main ways models can inherit from each other. The first one is abstract-based classes, the second one is multi-table inheritance, and the third one is proxy models. Coming to abstract-based classes, think of abstract-based classes as templates for other models. They don't create their own tables in the database. Instead, they're like blueprints that other models can use. You mark a model as abstract by setting a special attribute to true in the model's meta class. Coming to multi-table inheritance, multi-table inheritance is when you create a new model that is based on the existing one, and each new model gets its own table in the database. Django makes separate tables for each new model and these tables are linked together. This type of inheritance lets you add more features to an existing model without changing it directly. To use multi-table inheritance, you just make a new model class that is based on the existing one. Coming to proxy models, proxy models are like shadows of existing models. They have the same fields and methods, but you can change how they work in Python without affecting the database. They don't create new tables, they just act as alternative views of the original data. Proxy models are handy for adding extra functionality or organizing code without changing the original database structure. You can create a proxy model by setting a special attribute to true in the model's meta class.
These different ways of inheritance gives you flexibility in how you organize your models and customize their behavior in Django. Each one has its own purpose and advantages, depending on what you're trying to do with your models. Create a program to add two integers greater than zero without using the plus operator. You can add two integers without using the plus operator by using bitwise operations. Here is a Python program to add two positive integers without using the plus operator. This program defines a function add without plus that takes two integers a and b as input and returns their sum without using the plus operator. It uses bitwise operations such as and, zor and left shift to perform addition bit by bit. The program prompts the user to enter two positive integers and then displays their sum. How to save an image locally using Python whose URL address I already know. To save an image from website using Python, you need to know the web addresses of the image. With Python, you can use a library called request to download the image from the internet. Then you can store it on your computer and here is how you can do it. We use the request library to fetch the image from the web addresses you provide. If the image is successfully downloaded, that is status code 200, it gets saved to your computer with the name you choose. If there is any problem with the download or saving process, the program will let you know. You are required to scrap data from IMDb top 250 movie pages. It should only have fields, movie name, EO and rating. To gather information from IMDb's top 250 movie page, you will need Python and some tools like request and beautiful soup and here is how you do it. We import the necessary libraries request for getting web data and beautiful soap for sorting through HTML. We define a function scrape IMDb top 250 to fetch IMDb's top 250 movie pages. Pick out the movie names, years and ratings and return them as a list of dictionaries. Inside the function, we use request to get the IMDb page and beautiful soap to handle the HTML content. We loop through the table rows on the page, extracting movie details from the appropriate cells. We remove any extra spaces and formatting from the extracted data and store it in the dictionaries. Finally, we call the function to get the data and print out the movie titles, years and ratings. How to send an email in Python language? Sending an email in Python can be done using the built-in SMPT lib library for SMTP which is simple mail transfer protocol and email library for composing and formatting email messages. Here is a basic example how to send an email in Python. Firstly, we imported SMTP lib and relevant classes from email.my module. Set up the sender's email addresses, receiver email address and email password. Then we created a MIME multipart object to compose the email message. Set the sender, receiver and subject of the email. We created the body of the email messages and attached it to the MIME multipart object. Then we connect it to the SMTP server. Log in to the sender's email using SMTP authentication. Then we send the email using send mail method of SMTP server object. Then it handle exceptions and close the connection to the SMTP server using the quit method. Create a program to convert dates from year, month, day to day, month, year. You can achieve this conversion using the date time module in the Python. Here's a program to convert dates from the format year, month, day to day, month, year. We define a function convert date that takes a date string in year, month, day format as input. Inside the function, we use date time, strp time to pass the input string into a date time object specifying the input format. Then we use strf time to format the date time object into a string with the desired format. We handle the case where the input string is not in the correct format by using try except block. Finally, we test the function by taking user input for a date string and printing the converted date. How you can get the Google cache age of any URL or web page? To find out how old a web page is in Google cache using Python, you can send a special request to Google cache server. And here's a simple way to do it. We create a function called get Google cache age to find out the age of a web page in Google Cache. We send a special request to Google Cache URL for the web page we are interested in. We analyze the response from Google to extract the age of the cached web page. If everything goes well, we return the cache age, otherwise we show an error message. 
Finally, we set the function by asking up for a web page URL and printing out the catch age information. With this, we have come to the end of this session. I hope you have enjoyed the video and if you did, make sure to hit the like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and keep learning. I hope you have enjoyed listening to this video. Please be kind enough to like it and you can comment any of your doubts and queries and we will reply them at the earliest. Do look out for more videos in our playlist and subscribe to Edureka channel to learn more. Happy learning!